Well, hello, everybody, and welcome to Neuroclin 2022, Dealing with Dementia Conference, hosted by Durham University Psychology Department. My name is Stephen Polder. I'm an assistant professor in the Department of Psychology here at Durham, and I, alongside Professor Colin Lever and Dr. Stephen Evans, have organized this exciting event. We are delighted you've chosen to join us today to listen to this fantastic lineup of world-leading speakers. Um, we'd hoped that the event would be in person. Now, our vision was to bring academics and clinical workers and members of the public um, together to encourage conversation and collaboration around this theme of tackling dementia. I guess the silver lining of being restricted to virtual channels is that we're able to host speakers from further afield. And indeed, we've got our American speakers coming on, on later in the day. I'd also like to take this opportunity to thank the wonderful speakers who have agreed to present their work at NeuroClin and Elaine Stanton, our award-winning technical manager, who's ensuring that the virtual aspects of the conference run smoothly. Lastly, I'd like to thank you all for giving up your time today. I know that many of you clinical workers and scientists joining us have worked tirelessly throughout this very tough couple of years. So on behalf of NeuroClin and Durham Psychology Department, thank you all for your efforts. Just a couple of housekeeping notes. Um, if you'd like to ask questions, we'll try to answer some of them. You can either put your um, question in the question and answer um, box at the bottom, or you can put your hand up at the end of the talk and we'll try to give you permission to talk and allow you to ask the question yourself. It's up to you how you do it. Um, and with that, I'll hand over to the co-organizer of the event, Professor Colin Lever. Colin? Um, thanks, Steve. Um, delighted to welcome you all to uh, NeuroClin. Um, it was an, originally started off in Durham by Dr. Stephen Evans and myself. Um, Stephen Evans, then at South Tees, um, near Middlesbrough, is now a consultant neuropsychologist at York Teaching Hospital NHS Foundation Trust. Unfortunately, he can't uh, be with us today. As you can imagine, he's quite a busy person right now. Um, so our aim and hope was to bring together clinicians across the range uh, of the NHS, um, academics and lay people, um, in order to uh, look at um, uh, conditions affecting uh, memory, broadly speaking. And I should have mentioned that that includes um, epilepsy as well. And I'm pleased to say we have quite a few uh, lay people in the audience this year. So we had a sense that these groups of people don't come together all that often, um, and it's useful to try to get conversations going together. It's not always easy to get clinicians involved. And of course, that has become a lot harder in the time of COVID, um, certainly in the UK. Obviously, COVID has restrict, severely restricted physical meetings and certainly killed off the ability to plan for them in the long term. But we felt we shouldn't postpone NeuroClin any longer. And so we're delighted to present NeuroClin 2022 today. Naturally, we hope not to have to wait too long to have face-to-face -face meetings in the future. Of course, as Stephen's already alluded to, one benefit of having NeuroClin online is that we're able to get speakers from Europe and America, and we're really pleased to have several speakers from um, Europe and America today. You'll notice that the American speakers give their talks later in the afternoon, um, and we decided to let them off attending at three o'clock in the morning. We know that only masochists who like to see their national team slaughtered by Australians do that. So we'd like to thank our amazing speakers for taking time out of their schedules to give these talks today. You, the audience, for being here. Elaine Stanton, our wonderful technician, award-winning technician for helping to um, do the technical aspects. Um, when I say we, I should just say that with a tiny bit of steering for me, it's actually Steve, uh, Dr. Steve Poulter, who's put together this amazing program, and I'd like to thank him for that. Dennis Chan is a Principal Research Fellow um, at the UCL Institute of Cognitive Neuroscience, as well as consultant neurologist who runs a cognitive disorders clinic um, in Mid-Sussex, which has a special focus on patients with mild cognitive impairment. And he also looks at the, more recently, at the emerging phenomenon of uh, cognitive COVID. Dr. Chan has pioneered the application of novel spatial tests to demonstrate brain dysfunction in pre-dementia Alzheimer's disease. Um, and um, I believe he's gonna uh, be demonstrating one of those 
tasks today, looking at path integration. With Neil Burgess, um, also at the Institute of Cognitive Neuroscience, his work has showed that a virtual reality test of navigation is more sensitive and specific for early AD than currently used gold standard cognitive tests. And that's a wonderful paper that's published in Brain um, in 2019. Um, and um, he's funded by Alzheimer's Research UK, the Wellcome Trust, the National Institute for Health Research. Um, and I might say he carries, uh, he, he shares with, with me the, uh, the fact that we were both PhD students of um, John O'Keefe, um, with whom Dennis now collaborates. So it's a tremendous pleasure uh, and honor to introduce uh, Dennis, who is one of the first of our three keynote um, speakers. So first of all, I just want to say thank you so much to Stephen and Colin for putting this together and inviting me. It's a shame we can't meet in person in Durham, but hopefully we can do so uh, in, in the next few years. So my brief today is to talk a little bit about uh, the new approaches to diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease. And what I want to do is I want to set, first of all, set the context of why we need to do this. And then I want to go into a little bit more depth about different ways in which we can uh, address this challenge. So I'm aware that there's a, there's a mixture of people within this audience. I shall try to, to um, keep the, the discussion sort of balanced, both for uh, lay people and also more, uh, more specialized individuals. But uh, let's see how we do. I, I think in terms of scene setting, um, again, this will be familiar to many people, but the issue, the, the challenge that we have really in the context of AD, which I'll call for short, is the fact that we know that the dementia that we uh, the stage of dementia that we see in our memory clinics really kind of represents the end pathological stage of the disease. And that really puts us behind that proverbial curve when it comes to treating. And even when people turn up with this so-called mild cognitive impairment, uh, when they have memory problems, but they don't yet have dementia, we even know that pathologically there's quite a lot of neurodegeneration. So the whole focus, focus over the last uh, few years in the field of AD research has been, how do we diagnose AD preclinically? So we know that the pathology is there, but people themselves are not affected, hence the term preclinical. They don't have any symptoms. And that, of course, is a great challenge because the whole medical model in the world for all diseases kind of depends on people presenting with symptoms. And here we are saying, well, we're going to go for the pre-symptomatic phase, i.e. people don't know they have a problem. It's kind of under their bonnet. And if we're going to do that, then we, in a way what we're doing is we're challenging the whole, um, the whole process by which we undertake a work in medical practice. We're going for the left-hand panel, people who are ostensibly well, but may have a preclinical AD unbeknownst to them versus our traditional medical model, which is people have a symptom, they turn up with their symptoms, they then get seen by the likes of me or other physicians. But like I said, that doesn't work by definition for a preclinical diagnosis. So having said that kind of challenge, then we have to look necessarily at the tools we use and ask whether or not they're fit for purpose. So this is what we do in clinical practice. Again, if we are dependent on people presenting with symptoms, then it means by, by necessity, we are reactive. We, we're, we're waiting for something to go wrong, and then we're getting involved in making a diagnosis. But of course, by extension, a preclinical diagnosis has then got to be proactive. And I use this very simple car analogy because this is what this, in a way, this is the, sim, the similar philosophy we have to apply to medical practice. The idea of early sensing to pick up a problem before that problem becomes manifest as a full-blown breakdown or, or symptom or disease state. This then brings us to the question of what we do right now in clinical practice. And I use the word legacy deliberately as a kind of challenge, and it's meant to be provocative because I, for me, it, uh, the whole, this whole issue of preclinical diagnosis, early diagnosis, means that we have to look afresh at the ways we do business now. Many people in this, call, in this call will be familiar with the mini mental state examination and perhaps the Anbrooks examination. These are absolutely bog standard uh, pen and paper tasks that are used universally in memory clinics. So it's, uh, certainly the Anbrooks on the right hand side is absolutely uh, what we use in, in, in NHS memory clinics in the year 2022. And beyond behind them and uh, with them, there's a whole raft of additional neuropsychological tests that have been around for literally decades. But if we look at what these tests are and actually look at their history, we do have to raise a question about what's going on here. So on the top left panel here, we have something known as the trail making test. It's something that's considered widely to be kind of sensitive to early Alzheimer's disease. It's variously considered a test of attention, executive function, and cognitive speed. And as I said, it is widely considered in 2022 uh, to be one of the better cognitive tests for diagnosing early AD. 
The trial making test was designed in 1944. It was designed to look at the IQ of GIs when they're coming from America to fight in the Second World War. And if we think what 1944 looked like, this is the world of 1944. Now, I apologize, I should update the following slide. They shouldn't show 2021 anymore, it's now 2022, but this is our world. And what we have, what the, and the, I think the challenge we have to ask ourselves is what is the equivalent cognitive test that we can use given 2021 and 2022 knowledge of the world and knowledge of neuroscience and brain behavior relationships? So there is a big issue here about the fact that we're using outdated legacy tests that have been floating around for the better part of 75 years, um, but we're still using in clinical practice now, even though there's been a whole generation, if not generations, of cognitive neuroscience that have really pushed our understanding of the brain and brain dysfunction way beyond what was understood, of course, 75 years ago. So that's the first thing. The second thing I want to talk to is a slightly, slightly um, one set removed from a clinical practice, but terribly important for drug discovery and translational research, is then this issue about how we actually even get around to finding drugs for Alzheimer's disease. And if we, if we take it as a face value, that one of the reasons why we uh, really want to diagnose Alzheimer's early is that one day we'd like treatments. Well, we then have to look at the way in which these treatments are actually designed. And many people on this call will be familiar with the fact that, for better or worse, and that's a separate conversation, um, the standard model of, dr of drug discovery is that a compound is found, there's a drug discovery, and it's tested in preclinical animals, first of all, mouse mod animal models of disease, and then after safety and efficacy, it then goes on to human clinical trials. But if we look at what happens in the field of Alzheimer's disease now for clinical trials, we have this huge discrepancy and this huge gap in, in terms of um, our, our working practice. So we have a Morris water maze. Again, many in, this people, many in this room will be familiar with what this is, the idea that a, a mouse require, um, has a, a neural system for spatial navigation. It, this is a, a classic test of spatial memory in which a mouse tries to find a hidden platform to get out of cold, milky water because mice don't like being in cold, milky water. And for many decades, it's considered a gold standard test of hippocampal function, spatial memory, and as such, used widely in clinical trials to look for new anti-Alzheimer drugs, given that Alzheimer's disease affects the hippocampus. So far, so good. Problem is, of course, when it comes to clinical trials, we don't exactly throw human beings into pools of cold, milky water. What we do instead, we give them things like verbal memory tests. But we have a problem here because, of course, we're not comparing like with like. We've got um, navigation in cold pools of water for spatial memory on the one hand, and we have verbal memory on the, on the other hand. My point being, the outcome measures that we're using in these really expensive, multi-billion dollar, very, very important Alzheimer trials is using different outcomes to assess treatment effect in the animal models and the human cohorts. They're not comparing like with like, and that's immediately an issue for understanding how we actually bring new drugs to market. We have an issue of comparison here. So there's a very important translational point about looking at what we do cognitively in humans and thinking how do we then relate that back to the basic science and, 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 and work in, um, in earlier disease models in animals. So that's, another, that's, a, that's a corollary issue, but a second reason why we need to rethink our business. Okay, so having said that as the, as the scene, I now want to turn to possible solutions. And I think one of the way I see this in a very simplistic way is that we have this triangular issue. We want to detect disease early. We know those diseases are related to changes in the brain, and we really want to figure out how we're going to pick those up, given that people don't have any symptoms yet. And there's no, I don't, there's no dispute, really, that what's really changed in the last few decades in the world is that we have not only this emergence of huge amounts of knowledge of brain function via neuroscience, but also we live in a world of increasing technology, the so-called technolo technological revolution, maybe as impactful as the industrial revolution. And I think for me, we, we can then look at that, the, the, the world we live in and, and, and consider, could we then bring these worlds of neuro, these, these new worlds of neuroscience and technology, could we bring those to bear to uh, ask us to um, solve this problem of early detection and find those disease-related changes? So with that in mind, what I want to do now is I want to switch towards one of those and others in neuroscience. And uh, I think my, my, my point here is that if we know a little bit about how these diseases affect the brain and what parts of the brain are affected, can we, un can we utilize the neuroscientific basis of our knowledge of what these brain regions do to develop better tasks? And here's an example of the kind of work that, as Colin mentioned earlier, my colleagues and I have been working on for quite a long time now. And this goes back to Alzheimer's disease. And I'm using Alzheimer's here as the biggest commonest cause of dementia. I can, if time permits at the end, I can talk about other dementias, but we're going to focus on AD. 
So if we look at the pathology of AD and look at neurofibrillary tangles in particular, one of the key pathological hallmarks of AD, we know and we've known for many, many years that the first area within the brain to show neurodegeneration is the entorhinal cortex and subsequently the hippocampus within this entorhinal cortex hippocampal circuit. So what we have here in these beginnings of the stage there's this early involvement in the entorhinal cortex. Then we see the pathology progressing, spreading probably transsynaptically into uh, related brain regions, and then finally into the entire neocortex. So we kind of know we have we've got. So we have this in. We have this understanding of this very first uh, effect on entorhinal cortex and hippocampus. Okay. We now know, courtesy of um, the work of Colin, actually, among several others, of seminal work showing that actually the cells within this entorhinal hippocampal circuit have spatially modulated firing activity, and they work in different ways. There's some that encode play cells, uh, some that include uh, that, that map the environment as the animal traverses it, known as grid cells, uh, boundary cells, as worked by Colin himself a few years ago, and head direction cells that fire when the animal is pointing in a different direction. So my point being, this entorhinal hippocampal circuit affected early in Alzheimer's disease is chock full of different cells that have different spatial characteristics and ultimately together underpin a spatial representation that allows animals and humans to move around the environment, which is obviously fundamental for survival. So this then sets us a challenge, which is can we utilize this beautiful cellular knowledge of this region of the brain that's vulnerable to early AD? Can we use that spatial information to develop different tasks that speak to what the cells do and speak to the function of, of, of these brain regions? And with that in mind, what we then set ourselves to do was to develop a test of navigation um, based around the function of the entorhinal cortex. And there's a lot of work around how the entorhinal cortex controls path integration. I think there's a couple of speakers later on, Nikolai Axmacher, Gillian uh, Cochran, who are going to talk about this, so I'm not going to uh, spike their guns. I won't talk about it too much. Um, but we, we, we have a fairly reasonable understanding that entorhinal uh, cortex cells, particularly grid cells perhaps, underpin uh, navigation. And in particular, this thing known as path integration, which is a bit like sort of dead reckoning. So we then asked whether or not we could then test the entorhinal cortex. Um, function in this way and use VR. Um, it would be lovely to test real world navigation, but it's not really very practical for me to throw someone in the middle of Cambridge and get them to wander around. That doesn't make for a good experimental setting. But VR with all the capabilities of immersive VR to, to generate simulated environments can allow us to do that. So here's the task in short that we applied to, to the question of early day Alzheimer's detection. So here's a little cartoon showing what this is. And it's a very simple task and I'll show you a video in a minute. And what that means is a person in the VR, uh, in the VR world, wearing a VR headset, walks towards a, a, a location, which is a, an inverted cone numbered one. Uh, she or he then walks towards another location. They're walking in the virtual world as well as walking in the real world. And they go to number two, then they go to number three. And then when they get to number three, they're simply asked, go back to where you thought one was. So this is a really basic test of path integration that we feel uh, there's a lot of evidence kind of speaks quite well to what the entorhinal cortex does. And then from that, we have a couple of a few behavioral measures. We can look at how far off linearly, Euclidianly, uh, using Euclidean distance, how far off their estimate was. Can they actually go back to where one was or do they just get it wrong? And we can look at their angular error. We can look at the path that they take. So we have all these um, behavioral outcomes from this task. We can then uh, stress the system further. We have a pretty good idea how the entorhinal cortex and, and hippocampus um, drives our, um, our navigation, and it's lar it, to a large extent, it's dependent on boundaries. So when people are walking back from three to one, we kind of threw in a few conditions. Either we just left the, environment, the virtual environment exactly as it was, no environmental change, or we took away the boundaries. So there was no boundary information to, to guide their movement from three to one, they have to figure, figure it out themselves. And that we think is particularly difficult for the entorhinal cortex because that's what the, because the grid cells, et cetera, rely on the boundaries. Or we take away the surface detail so they don't have any optic flow. So we can muck about with, their, with the, with the uh, behavioral paradigm to, 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 to tease apart possibly uh, different performances. Okay, so what we then found, and, and I, I should say that this was work was done with uh, people shown on the top right here. So Neil Burgess, that's uh, the... Institute of Cognitive Neuroscience with me and Andrea Castagnaro, who was Neil's PhD student at the time, who wrote all the code for this rather sophisticated paradigm. So this is what the test looks like. Here is one of our participants with her permission showing the, uh, the first generation VR headset. They look a lot nicer now, by the way, uh, but that was our first generation attempt. And she walks around in a, in, in a real room at the, at the same time she walks around in a virtual environment. And this is what it looks like. 
So what you see in front of you now is what the participant will see. You can see this there's this simulated environment with a few uh, boundaries that are projected to infinity, so you can't use them as local landmarks. She then walks physically uh, in the room and also in the, in the virtual environment to one. She then walks over to where two is. And then as, as she and then she looks around and she says, look, here we are. Hey, Presto, here's another one. Here's number three. And you walk over to number three. And then once she gets there, she gets a sign in her tent and saying, now you go back to where you think one was. When you get there, you then press the trigger and you tell us. So that's the simple, that, that's the behavioral paradigm. So what we then did, we then this with the help of my, uh, at the time, PhD student, David Howard, top right here, we then tested it in people with mild cognitive impairment. And we compared with uh, age, gender matched, uh, education matched healthy controls. And what we found was when we looked at our primary um, outcome measure, that, that absolute Euclidean distance error, what we found was that as a group level, there's a huge difference between the MCI patients and the controls, and they just made a large error. So they weren't getting it right. That's fine. That kind of makes sense. But what you will notice here is look at the variance in their response. There's a huge range. Some of the MCI people are doing as well as controls and arms is way off. And this actually has huge clinical relevance because when we talk about MCI, which is a widely used clinical definition, all MCI means is you have a memory problem, you don't do well on a memory test, but you're not dement you don't have dementia yet. But MCI is heterogeneous, and there are many, many reasons why people have MCI. Sometimes it's Alzheimer's disease, sometimes they don't. So MCI doesn't denote early AD. It simply says there's a memory problem, which may or may not be due to early AD. So what we then did after this, we took it one step further. We did um, what we call biomarker testing. This is when we do lumbar punctures in our patients and we look for amyloid and tau evidence of an underlying Alzheimer's disease. Point being that if, if you have MCI and you have a positive lumbar puncture result, it means you probably have Alzheimer's disease. Whereas if you have MCI and you don't have positive lumbar puncture biomarkers, you probably don't have Alzheimer's disease causing your memory problems of maybe something else, could be anxiety, normal aging, et cetera, but not Alzheimer's. And so when we then split this MCI group this, um, into MCI positive and negative, those with and without Alzheimer's disease, we see this dramatic difference. Those who have MCI, although they have MCI, when they, they, they do fine, and actually they're not far off the controls, but those who have MCI and they have Alzheimer's disease causing their MCI, they are totally different to the other MCI group, and there's nearly 100% group separation. Please note that they all turn up to my clinic with mild cognitive impairment. Clinically, ostensibly, they look exactly the same. But some of them have got Alzheimer's, some of them don't. So this test is differentiating hugely, very effectively between those with and without early AD. So it looks like it's kind of bearing up our hypothesis that this is a good test for early AD. And that's fine. But actually, if we're going to show, if we or anyone else in the world is going to say, hey, we've got a better test for Alzheimer's, we have to show it up against what's already out there. Nobody's interested about a better test for Alzheimer's. Go online, there'll be a 1,000 internet hits every day about better tests. So what we did as part of the study is we then compared against a battery of gold standard, what Colin would call best in class cognitive tests. These are the kind of tests that neuropsychologically we think are good for Alzheimer's. So there's that trail making test I talked about earlier. There's this free and cute selective reminding test. It's a verbal memory test, widely considered to be sensitive to early AD. We have another episodic memory test, the ray figure recall. We have the Adamus cognitive examination I alluded to earlier. And we even have something called the Four Mountains test, which is a test for spatial memory. I don't have time to talk about this now, but it's a it's a it's a an app-based uh, spatial memory test depending on hippocampus. So we plated up our test against all of these to look at the classification accuracy. How well did our VR do compared with all these other tests in terms of differentiating MCI positive with Alzheimer's versus MCI negative without? And what you can see here, if we look at the area under the curve, is it very, very uh, much is better in terms of more sensitive and specific when compared with all these other gold standards, this basket of the gold standard tests. So in summary, what we're showing here is that when we test the hypothesis that a VR um, test of path integration is sensitive and specific for, for early Alzheimer's disease, when the people have MCI, not only do we show that to be the case, but we also show with these data that it's probably better than anything else out there. All right. But... What I talked about earlier is I talked about preclinical AD. And what we've done with that previous work is we've proven the concept that it's great for MCI. What we really want to do, of course, is then we want to take it further before people have any symptoms. 
So the next tranche of work I'm going to show you is that on the so-called PREVENT study, which is led by Craig Ritchie in Edinburgh. Um, but this particular work was uh, led by um, my current PhD student, Coco Newton, who's based in Cambridge. And what she did, she studied about 100 people who are aged 40 to 60. And what the PREVENT study looks to do is to look at middle-aged people without any symptoms and work out what, what are the behavioral, what are the cognitive uh, what are the molecular changes in these people that might put them at risk of getting dementia earlier? So in other words, this is an at-risk group. They're, they're at risk simply by dint of their age, being 40 to 60. Some of them will have, be, have greater risk due to things like APOE4 or family history, and some of them will have lesser risk. But ultimately, we need to know what these well middle-aged people look like because they are. it's going to be in that cohort that we're going to find some changes that are going to predict whether or not some of these people go on to get dementia in future years or even decades. And so what we did, we want to ask the question, is it that if you're middle-aged and you have no symptoms, you're between 40 and 60, that if you actually have got an increased risk of AD, um, then you will do our hypothesis is that we may pick up a change on our navigation task. So COCO applied that path integration task, exactly as I showed you earlier. We then compared with the uh, standard test battery that's being run anywhere as part of the prevent cohort, and we also ran it against our four mountains test I alluded to earlier. And she also did some incredibly detailed imaging. I don't have these data. Frustratingly, they're going to be available later this week. So it's a shame this conference is one week too early. She's done a lot of 70 MRI in terms of structural imaging and functional imaging. A lot of these people have had amyloid PET, and this year they're also going to have tau PET. So this is a cohort that's going to be very, very heavily worked on. So um, forgive the uh, detailed slide. I just wanted to show you what these people look like. So these are people categorized in terms of family history, making them a high risk or uh, or not, depending on positive or negative. And what we have here is a few other tests, including um, these memory tests that are part of the standard prevent battery. And what I want to bring your attention to is this. First of all, when it comes to the path integration test, PIT, then when you compare positive and negative at face value, there's actually no change. Look at the p-values. We found a significant change in terms of Four Mountains test, the hippocampal test. When we then applied a... Um, a spatial orientation test that we think probes medial parietal function, then they were almost but not quite significant. So trending towards significance. Everything else, no change. So, okay, that's interesting. Surprise, well, we looked at that, thought, okay, there's no, there's no navigation change on our enterinal cortex test. Bit surprising, uh, but let's have a look further. So when we then uh, looked at the data further, we then started to look back at the data in terms of how people did if they had different return conditions. Remember what I said earlier about how could make, we could make life harder for them by taking away the boundaries or take away their distal cues. And what we find is their error, not surprisingly, the error goes up if you have no optic flow and their error really goes up when they have no distal cues. So we think what this means is that actually these people, um, they, it, it does speak to the fact that the enterorhinal cortex, it requires boundary information to help us navigate around an environment. And that applies both for low, uh, distance error and also angular distance error. But what we then found, which is I think most interesting, is that when we then looked at the low and high risk on the basis of family history, whereas on the basic test there was no difference, and whereas if we take away the optic flow, which is more sort of parietal dependent, there was no difference, those with and without a family history of dementia, therefore at low or higher risk, um, when, we, when we took away their boundaries, there's a huge difference in their performance. So it looks like in summary from these emerging data, and this is all work to be, that's being written up, it looks like if you have a positive family history of Alzheimer's disease and you are at greater risk, then maybe what we're seeing with this is your rental rhinal cortex is begin to beginning to struggle a little bit because when we take away the boundary cues, your behavioral performance on a navigation task begins to break down by comparison with those who don't have a family history, who are at lesser risk. So this is very interesting for us because, again, at face value, it kind of looks like it speaks to a very, very, very early change in enterinal function in this at-risk group. And just to be clear about this, these are people who are 40 to 60. They are, on average, 25 years younger than their parents were when their parents had dementia. So this is, not, this is way, way, way earlier in, in the disease process. They are simply at risk. They do not have symptoms. They do not have MCI. What we then found when we looked at these data further, and I'm sorry I don't have this slide to show you this, it's rather hard to put this together, is when we analyzed why they were performing uh, more poorly, it looks like the error, this, this um, location error was driven 
by an angular overestimation. That when people were going back to to uh, their start point, they were if they if you they were at risk, they seem they seem like they were routinely overestimating their angle. So they're doing an undershoot, and it seems that this angular overestimation in their heads about where they are is driving this performance. And this is really neat because around the same time that Coke was presenting this data to us. Um, Neil Burgess and his team were modeling all the MCI data I showed earlier to see what was driving the error in MCI patients. It turns out from their very early analyses, and again, they're not really yet to, um, for, for more detailed presentation, but it turns out that they, the MCI patients too are doing an angular overestimation. So what seems to be happening in these people is that they're not getting the path integration right, and, and, and what's going wrong is a, it's an angular estimation. And as this was all breaking through, this spoke very well to what we think is going on at the cellular level. So Colin mentioned earlier that he and I both had the great privilege of being PhD students for John O'Keefe, top right. And what John's been looking at for some while now, having shown the existence of play cells, is he's been asking the question, well, what is it that makes play cells know where they are? And what's the underlying, um, what's the underlying process? And, the day, and to, use, to answer this question, he's developed this new paradigm known as the honeycomb maze. This is what it looks like. I'm not sure I have time to, sorry, it's rather noisy. I'm not sure I have time to talk through all this, but essentially it breaks down an environment into, into different hexagons. So you can, you can vary it and look at the angle of movement of an animal as it goes from the start to the end. And what he, his emerging work, which is currently under review, uh, bottom right, what his emerging work seems to suggest that what the animals are doing, what the play cells are doing, is they're engaging in vector computation to know where they know where they go. So I'll stop that. So what that means is we have these, we have in short, there's evidence that a VR navigation shows a problem in MCI and it's, it's good for picking up MCI due to AD. We've shown that in people who are at risk, many, many years before they're expected to have problems, and decades before they expect to have dementia, then on a base test of uh, path integration, they do okay, but when you look at when you take away their boundaries and stress out the entorhinal cortex, they don't do so well. And the underlying basis for that not doing so well looks like an angular overestimation, and the modeling and IMCI work also bears that out. All this is coming out at the same time as we have, as we have the cellular work in animals, suggesting that vector computation is what drive what, what is one of, is one of the underbending processes for how we navigate. So this is all beginning to create a kind of theme about what may be going on at the cellular level when people have uh, early Alzheimer's disease and, all, and also in terms of the basic, basic mathematics of how someone has a navigation problem, which I kind of find interesting. It's nice to have this linkage across the fields and disciplines. So that's all, um, all emerging information from our, um, from our studies. So having talked about the human work and having shown how, how this um, seems to be bearing out our hypothesis, I just want to go back to that issue I said earlier about this translation, translational problem. I talked about Morris Water Mazes of verbal memory. One of the great beauties about doing VR is that mice can do VR too. And this allows us then to bridge the gaps between human research and animal research. Um, so here we have, as you've seen earlier, this is the human VR. This is a cartoon, a video of mouse VR. When you have a mouse with, the, uh, with the, the headset is constrained and what you're seeing in front of you the, is, is the uh, simulated image that the mouse sees in front of it as it navigates around trying to find its goal uh, and get a reward. One of the beauties about doing this kind of mouse VR work is that at the same time, one can undertake two photon imaging to look at the activity within the hippocampus. Here we have CA1 cells while an animal is undertaking a task. So in short, what we have here is we have the capacity in theory and the work is led by my colleague in Cambridge, Yulia Krippich, um, we have the capacity to image cells in these regions that we're interested in while the animal is performing a behavioral task of VR navigation, which is analogous to the VR task of navigation that we then apply to our human beings who are at risk of AD. So we're bridging the worlds here. And what we're hoping and our, our aspiration, our vision is to link up these worlds of translational research and clinical research in AD, which for so long and arguably too long simply have been world apart, but actually with these new methodologies and driven by the scientific knowledge of enterinal hippocampal function and spatial processing, we think we can actually, as I say, we can straddle that gap. Okay. So that, I apologize for sort of running through that, but that there's a fair amount of information there, but that was the example I wish to present about how we can use neuroscience uh, to, to identify early disease. Now I just want to switch and, and, and close that chapter and open another one, and I want to talk about technology. And to set the scene, then this is going to come as no surprise to everyone, but technology is pretty much ubiquitous. Even in um, lower middle income uh, uh, countries, 
then the uptake of smart devices is around 75% in the adult population. It comes to no surprise that that's well over 95% in high-income countries. So this is the world we all live in right now. And the question then begs, uh, begs itself, can we use this ubiquity of technology to, for health purposes? And this is a very, very big field. And you can imagine all the big beasts in tech here on the right-hand side, they're all getting into this space. A lot of health monitoring, not quite made the jump into disease monitoring, but certainly health monitoring. Um, and to this end, there's a very large um, consortium known as EDEN, uh, stands for Early Detection of Neurodegenerative Disease, funded primarily by Alzheimer's Research UK and also Bill Gates via his Gates Ventures. And the aim of EDEN is to identify uh, where is to detect, develop new um, devices, methods for detecting early degenerative disease, not just Alzheimer's, but also other dementias like vascular dementia, Lewy body dementia, Parkinson's dementia, using wearables and uh, latest generation technology. And when we look at what that means, what we have, well, we, we have this plethora of different uh, sensing method, uh, modalities that, that exist on all these things that are already there. We have smartphones, of course, uh, smart watches, but there's also a bunch of other smart devices, maybe not ubiquitous, but in theory, these are all technologies that we can carry around with us. And on the left-hand panel, you can see here, these are already the kind of sensors that, that these devices have. So in other words, there's a whole load of possible uh, sensing processes that could, possibly, could, could be used to detect early disease. And the aim of Eden, therefore, is to look at, look at the world we live in and say, what can we take from this kind of landscape of technologies and devices and wearables, and what can we pick out from that that might help us detect early disease? Um, and when we look at that, what we find is there's a bunch of measures that we want to probe further, not just the cognition, but actually we're going to go beyond the kind of cognitive processing and look at things like that we don't traditionally do in a memory clinic. Look at gross motor function, like walking fine motor, our, our, our interaction with smart devices or our use of hands, eye movements, autonomic heart rates, uh, blood pressure, sleep, speech, language, behavioral, um, all these measures that are way beyond what we do in clinic, but actually we can probe these using the, the, the current generation of wearables. And this is how we begin to try to address this question, how do we detect and get, get a device? We have to identify these measures that we think are have signal in early stage disease. Here is the pie chart showing the kind of different diseases causing dementia. We then have to say, okay, if we want to measure something, because that's what the science tells us, is there actually anything out there that can measure it? Is the hardware ready? Is the software ready? Has it been, has it been written? Uh, if we have, then is that something that can be scaled up? No point doing some, using some technology that costs $10,000 can be used in 20 people. This is a population level problem. We have to have devices and methods that can be scaled up for population, population level implementation. And finally, if we're going to capture data from all these different disparate potential wearables, do we actually have all the data platforms to curate all these data, collect them, store them, and analyze them in due course? So this is roughly the process by which we in Eden want to get to the point of having digital-based measures for early detection. In terms of how we do that and the, and the way we then go into that device selection, well, we can do two things. We have a kind of bottom-up theory-driven, we know about, say, spatial processing and, and, and Alzheimer's, we know about sleep that's affected early in Alzheimer's and, um, and in Lewy body dementia. We're kind of fairly reasonably have, a good, have some idea about the molecular pathology. So we can use our theory of the pathology and the neuroscience to identify measures that we think are of interest. But we could also go the other way, which is top down, which is simply saying, look, there's a bunch of stuff that we do. We kind of, everyone carries these smartphones and their talks and their, their phones and, their, and their microphones and our, and our smartwatches and smartphones. Maybe we collect data and let's take, to accumulate all this data and then see what comes out of it. So a data-driven approach. And actually these worlds, although they are complementary, they don't have to be ex mutually exclusive. And what we're gonna do in Eden is actually have the best of both worlds. We're gonna have our bottom-up theory-driven as well as our top-down data-driven. And in terms of the kind of measures we do with it, again, we're gonna combine the best of both worlds. We're gonna do some active cognitive testing, but this time uh, smartphone-based cognitive tests uh, in some ways, and, and in some places analogous to what we do already, uh, on pen and paper, but just use on devices. We're also going to use passive sensing because passive sensing is really handy. In a way, one could argue that the best thing for population level sensing is you don't want anyone to do anything. You don't, you know, the more you ask people to do things, the less likely you get people to engage and comply. What you really want to do ideally is get them to do nothing. So if people sleep, you want to measure their sleep. If people walk, you want to measure their walking. Or if they talk, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So using a bunch of passive sensing modalities to complement our active testing, again, we feel might give us that, that best diagnostic mix, and again, the best of both worlds. And once we have all those data from all these disparate approaches, 
And then we have to validate these biomarkers. It's all very well saying we're going to do it, but do they actually map up against what the disease look like? We have to have a bunch of measures of intrinsic validity. Are these measures, uh, is there construct validity? Are there, is there ecological validity? Do these measures actually reflect what goes on in real life? And how do then they how then do they play it up against current biomarkers of disease? Do they really measure the diseases we think they measure, or do they not? And so we can measure those against the, the kind of standard uh, approaches we the tests that we do now, be it brain imaging, be it molecular scanning, or uh, like I said earlier with our patients, our CSF testing. So when we identify our measures, they are going to have to go through processes of biomarker validation. And then, having gone through all that, the next bit of Eden is then about the machine learning. We're going to have a huge data set, and we need to we can utilize here the strength of machine learning to dig out more information. So this isn't the kind of traditional few variables do a bit of logistic regression or multivariate regression. We can actually use machine learning. This is exactly what it's there for. You take a high-frequency, multi-dimensional data set, you give them, you give these data to the machines and get them to extract out different features um, that were not that, that are not easily seen using traditional measures. And what that gives us in the end, what we hope, is a kind of fingerprint of disease when we can pick up in a, at an individual level the kind of changes that are going on in person to person, which is relevant to them because it's showing changes to their own behaviors over time. And that's really the aspiration of applying machine learning to these large complex data sets. So that's the theory of Eden. We also need to be mindful that um, Eden might tell us a bit more about diseases that we don't really know. And the reason why I've stuck up this quite famous quote from Donald Rumsfeld uh, about known unknowns is in a way, I think this is what machine learning and what the Eden process will tell us. Um, we know there are things about these conditions uh, that we know. So we know that Alzheimer's affects memory. These are known knowns. But there are also known unknowns about these conditions that we kind of know are affected, but we've never really been able to measure. So sleep being a great example. Um, we have a pretty good understanding that sleep's affected, but we've never been able to probe this at, um, at scale what we can do with our devices. And finally, beyond that, there's going to be some phenotype in these diseases that we don't even know about, unknown unknowns. We're, when we apply this level of probing and sensing to, to populations, what the machines are going to dig out are a bunch of features. They're going to extract features that we don't even know about that, are, that represent the phenotype, the phenotype of the disease. And I think this is hugely exciting. So it's going to, to me, it's going to explode our kind of traditional, traditional understanding of Lewy body dementia or vascular dementia and Alzheimer's disease beyond how we normally test for it the kind of known knowns, into this new world when actually we identify all these new features via machine learning and AI that say this is what the expanded phenotype of disease is. And we simply don't know what those are. And that's very exciting to think about this unknown unknown. So having said all that, we also need to be mindful that this new approach comes with an awful, comes freighted with an awful lot of cautionary notes. And top among those is that of privacy and trust. We know that uh, digital collection of data is a very, very sensitive topic. It is something that is got, that that, that have, has huge ethical ramifications, and we need to we need to be highly sensitive to the fact that we maintain people's privacy and we don't um, we don't somehow uh, leak out uh, personally sensitive information. We know it's very, very easy to do. To do there's been a whole lot of papers about actually how anonymous location or anonymous data is not so anonymous after all, and a big part of the, the Eden challenge is knowing how to maintain that data security um, that allows people to engage with this process rather than being turned off by it. This is this is work in progress. It's very hard. I simply mention this just so people are aware that this is the big challenge of this kind of digital sensing approach. Okay. So in summary, and I think I've got a few minutes left, what I want to start off, what I want to finish on is this top line uh, statement, which I don't think is, 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 is too controversial, that detecting preclinical AD is a very is a top health priority issue. In order to address this issue, I think we have new um, approaches and uh, methods can be that can be based on neuroscience and technology, and these can overcome the various limitations that are um, embedded within our legacy tests. And finally, if we go down this line of digital diagnostics, given the ubiquity of technolo these technologies in our pop general population, then actually we have a potential to apply our early, early disease detection algorithms at a population level and way beyond what we traditionally do within our little cohorts that we do research trials or clinical trials, uh, but actually scaled up to all different cultures and all different demographics and all different uh, at, at a population level. So that's, our, that's my summary. I hope that makes some sort of sense. Um, what I wanted to finish on is just an acknowledgement to the people who I've had great pleasure to work with, 
both in the University of Cambridge and also my very long-standing colleagues at UCL. And finally, a, a nod to the various numbers of uh, various people working with me on Eden and on the right-hand panel here are some of the leads within the Eden initiative. Wow, brilliant. Thanks, Dennis. That was fascinating. Okay, so we should probably uh, introduce the next speaker, who's um, Professor Nikolai Axmacher, um, who's a professor of neuropsychology at the Ruhr University of Bochum. Um, he investigates the neural mechanisms of memory and spatial navigation, in particular in Alzheimer's disease and um, PTSD. Um, he, this is continuing, if you like, this talk, uh, a, the early diagnosis theme, which we sort of began today with Dennis Chan's talk on path integration. Um, Nikolai received uh, uh, one of those rather large, wonderful ESRC, e, sorry, ERC consolidated grants a couple of years ago, um, and had a lovely paper uh, in science looking at um, fMRI uh, markers of grid cells and um, suggesting that they are uh, impaired in um, uh, Alzheimer's disease um, predictors. So over to you, Nikolai. Thanks for the uh, very nice uh, introduction uh, and the kind words and for uh, uh, to the organizers for inviting me to the presentation. I think it's really beautifully put together. So there's uh, much of like uh, connections between the uh, different talks. Um, so uh, what I would like to talk to you to you about today is um, like some studies uh, suggesting that um, an impairment of grid representations and uh, path integration um, can be observed in genetic risk carriers uh, of Alzheimer's disease. And this uh, indeed um, very nicely dovetails with both um, the preceding talk and then also what uh, Dennis Chen um, has talked about this morning. So I think I don't need to spend much time on, on this slide here. Um, so um, Alzheimer's disease is developing very slowly across many decades. Um, and um, since uh, when um, Alzheimer becomes um, symptomatic and fully develops, it's probably too late to uh, start uh, treating it. Um, therefore, two key goals in Alzheimer research are the development of biomarkers and to um, understand early disease stages and stages at risk. And APOE4 is um, the most um, relevant um, risk factor for sporadic Alzheimer's disease is particularly important here. I think I don't need uh, also to um, lose many words here. Um, so as we've already heard, the adrenal cortex is among the first regions uh, to be affected by uh, tau pathology and AD neurodegeneration. And there's some evidence that there's uh, early neuropathology, um, uh, in particular in APOE4 carriers, um, that is even more um, pronounced as compared to the neuropathology in uh, non-carriers. Mm. As uh, we've also uh, already heard, uh, grid cells uh, can be found in the medial internal cortex, are um, an important building block of spatial navigation, and they are characterized by a particular pattern uh, of activity that has been um, characterized by, or that has been um, described by six preferred directions. So um, when um, a participant moves in one of these um, six um, preferred uh, directions, um, then the activity of grid cells would be higher as compared to um, when the participant moves um, in the directions in between. Um, also, uh, even though the scaling um, is very variable across grid cells uh, and is more narrow in posterior uh, as compared to anterior uh, medial and trinal cortex, um, the preferred directions seem to be significantly clustered across um, all grid cells. And as a result of this, um, one may argue um, that there could be a network level marker of grid cell activity that can be found by fMRI when you uh, use a spatial navigation uh, paradigm in which participants move in um, different directions. And this has been indeed shown by um, Tristan Döller um, in the group of Neil Burgess um, in 2010. So in the first study, which I would like to uh, briefly mention, um, we investigated whether grid representations in fMRI are uh, indeed altered in Alzheimer's disease uh, risk carriers. 
So we conducted um, a spatial um, navigation, a virtual reality experiment in the MRI scanner. Participants had to first learn the location of different objects in a virtual arena. And um, then afterwards use the different cues in the arena. So both the boundary and these distal um, 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 cues here in order to remember the location of the object and to move to these locations in the majority of the task. So in each retrieval uh, trial, they saw one of the objects, so for example, this back here, um, and then they needed to go to the uh, corresponding location and drop, drop the object, after which they would receive a feedback uh, about their performance and see the correct location um, of the object. So throughout the task, they could learn better and better where the objects were located, and we could also extract a drop error um, as, a, as an inverse uh, measure of spatial navigation performance. So while the participants were doing this task in the MRI scanner, we um, uh, measured uh, grid-like representations in entorhinal cortex. In this study here, we did not distinguish between medial and lateral entorhinal cortex. And indeed, we found that there was a, um, a very um, substantial and highly significant reduction of the grid representations in APOE4 carriers um, as compared to controls. And notably, this was seen in a, a really young student cohort. So the participants were on average only 22 years old. So these effects occurred decades before um, some of these um, um, participants may, may have developed sporadic Alzheimer's disease. Mm. We also found that um, the strength of the grid uh, representations in a given person were related to memory performance, but uh, overall, as a group, the risk group did not perform worse um, than the control group. And this was because um, they uh, apparently used some um, compensatory um, uh, um, mechanism um, because we found that those participants who showed reduced grid representations activated the hippocampus to a higher degree as compared to those participants who had uh, pronounced grid representations. So there's an inverse relationship between the recruitment of the entorhinal cortex grid uh, uh, cell system in this area, in this task, and the recruitment of the hippocampus. And um, we also found that this was reflected uh, on a behavioral level because the risk carriers navigated more peripherally, more closely to the boundary um, in the uh, spatial environment. And we believe that this is a uh, this was because of an attempt to um, stabilize their grid representations and to use alternative hippocampus-dependent uh, navigational systems, which require these boundaries. Um, and interestingly, well, uh, from what we've heard in the last talk, I think one, one may speculate that this uh, increase in hippocampal uh, activity may in the short run help the participant participants to maintain their performance. But in the long run, it may um, result in um, in a more, um, it may actually uh, exert some pathological effects and may result in a spread of tau pathology. Although this is of course highly spe speculative because we haven't done any tau pet in, um, in relation to this task um, so far. This is um, one of our ongoing studies. Mm. So uh, in, a, in, in two follow-up studies, which I would like to uh, show you next, uh, we investigated the electrophysiological basis of these growth representations in, in humans because these findings were all um, obtained using fMRI, which is, of course, a very indirect surrogate marker of um, electrophysiology -physio in the entorhinal cortex. So what we did was to record from um, human epilepsy patients who were implanted with intracranial EG electrodes to identify their seizure onset zone. And while they were being implanted with electrodes in typically hippocampus and uh, entorhinal uh, areas, they conducted the same spatial navigation task that was um, also conducted by the um, healthy participant in the MRI scanner before. And uh, we tested uh, several uh, hypotheses on the possible electrophysiological basis of grid representations. First, we argued whether um, they may rely on theta oscillations, which are um, the predominant hippocampal oscillation during exploration um, seen in rodents. Alternatively, we looked for slow oscillations in the delta frequency range, which have been proposed as a, a human correlate of rodent uh, theta activity. And finally, we also looked at broadband gamma activity as a measure of overall neural activity. 
However, when um, the epilepsy patients did the same task again, we found that there were um, clear grid representations only in the theta frequency range between four and eight hertz, but not in, at, at any other frequency. And we found that these uh, grid representations were more pronounced at the boundary, at the border of the uh, spatial environment as compared to the center, again, suggesting that um, the uh, boundaries uh, may be used to stabilize um, um, the uh, grid representations here. At the same time, another group uh, from uh, Josh Jacobs at Columbia University did a slightly different uh, spatial navigation experiment in patients with antirhinal um, cortex electrode but found um, almost exactly the same results, namely that there were clear grid representations uh, in the theta frequency band between five and eight hertz, but not at any other frequency. And importantly, in particular, not at gamma or um, low theta or, or delta frequency. Here's a, another follow-up study uh, in which we um, uh, also analyzed other areas of the brain. In particular, we were interested to see whether we could also find uh, grid-like representations um, in theta oscillations in the uh, ventromedial prefrontal cortex, where this uh, type of um, activity or representation has been shown in human fMRI studies. Um, and we indeed found that there were also grid representations in the ventromedial prefrontal cortex at a slightly higher frequency at six to nine hertz. We found that these um, representations were coherent, um, so um, synchronized with the um, entrinal cortex uh, theta oscillations. But interestingly, it was not that the entrinal cortex um, grid representations drove and induced the ventromedial prefrontal cortex um, grid representations, but actually we found that the effect was in the other was in the other direction, so that um, the um, theta oscillations in ventromedial prefrontal cortex um, transferred the information to the entrinal cortex. And finally, we found that um, uh, trials with a stronger um, coherence between ventromedial prefrontal cortex and entrinal cortex predicted uh, were associated with better navigation performance. So this suggests that a more extended uh, network of um, theta oscillation-based grid representations was relevant for uh, performing this task here. And uh, I would be very, very curious to see whether there's any evidence for um, actual grid cell activity at the single cell level in, um, in rodents. So if um, I think this is, this is still a, an important missing piece um, that uh, would importantly um, complement uh, or actually provide a, a causal mechanistic basis or a cellular mechanistic basis for these findings uh, in, in humans. So um, it is still a bit unclear uh, how the uh, different levels of brain organization are related. So what I showed you uh, today is um, how grid representations in network oscillations at the theta, uh, at theta frequency are related to fMRI grid representations. The link to single cell grid uh, activity is still uh, an open question and um, should be uh, tested in, in further uh, studies. So in the second part of my talk, um, I would like to um, show you some data on the specific navigational mechanism that is uh, supported by grid cells. And this, uh, as I mentioned, uh, fits very nicely to what we heard already uh, in uh, Dennis Chen's presentation this morning. So um, navigation in the real world may in fact rely on various different navigational strategies. Um, on the one hand, there uh, may be uh, processes of path integration, where actually you keep track of, um, of the, um, the distance and the direction in which you navigate. And this is a strategy that in principle at least can be uh, conducted without any um, uh, allocentric um, spatial cues. Um, other strategies involve allocentric navigation. So uh, navigation that is oriented at uh, allocentric landmarks landmark-based navigation, and so on. And putatively, only some of these strategies require grid cells, whereas others rely on um, other type of um, spatially specific cells um, in areas like the retrosplenial cortex or the hippocampus. And this may actually explain why several previous studies, so including our own, did not find overall performance deficits in, in APOE4 carriers because um, many spatial navigation tasks can not only be um, conducted 
based on the enteronal cortex system, but also based on um, alternative system. So um, one goal would be to, to identify um, a specific navigation task that can only be um, conducted relying on the enteronal cortex. Mm. So the goals of um, our follow-up study here was to unmask possible behavioral deficits in APOE4 carriers when they can only rely on path integration. Also to clarify the relevance of grid representations in entrinal cortex for path integration and to track the neurobehavioral markers of compensatory strategies. So the paradigm that we use for that um, is one that we call the Apple game. So where participants started from um, a starting location every trial, which was marked by a basket, and afterwards navigated to a number of distractor locations until uh, which were um, marked by, by trees until they found a tree that contained an apple. And once they saw this, their task was to bring this apple back to the basket. So in other words, to remember um, their original starting location. And this is very similar to, to the study, um, the path integration study that, that Dennis Chen mentioned this morning um, in the paper by um, Howard, um, I believe in Brain um, 2018. Importantly here, we again had um, three different versions of the task. In the most difficult version, the pure path integration task, the participants could only rely on the visual flow, um, uh, like uh, consisting of the, uh, the grassy um, uh, floor here. Um, and whereas in some other conditions, they could in addition uh, use information from a circular boundary or from a um, proximal landmark in the virtual arena. And the study was uh, conducted in a, a larger scale um, multi-center European consortium with um, centers in uh, various different countries um, who all contributed data both from, uh, a, from APOE4 uh, genotype participants across various different uh, ages. So the participants were between 18 and 75 years old. Overall, um, we had 67 APOE4 carriers uh, and 202 uh, controls, which are the homozygous APOE4, APOE3 carriers. In addition, we conducted a complementary fMRI study with the same paradigm in 35 participants who, however, were not genotyped for APOE. So this fMRI um, group here just served to um, identify um, the, uh, the neural basis. Five minutes. Um, sorry? Five minutes. Thank you the neural basis of the um, uh, navigation in this paradigm. Okay, there's uh, just two more slides here. Um, first, uh, indeed, we found that the uh, APOE4 carriers were sig uh, signif significantly and selectively impaired only in the path integration condition, but not in any of the other conditions. And uh, we, in the fMRI sample, we could identify grid representations selectively in the posterior medial entrinal cortex, not in the lateral entrinal cortex. And interestingly, we found that the strength of grid-like representations predicted performance selectively in the pure path integration uh, subtask, but not in the other subtask, suggesting that performance in these other subtask also relied on um, additional uh, brain mechanisms. We also found that the landmark information allows, allowed the risk carriers to compensate for the deficits. Um, so the risk carriers deteriorated more when goals were remote from the landmark. So in those trials where the, the basket, the goal was very far away from the landmark, all participants were doing a bit worse than if the basket was close to the landmark, but this effect was more pronounced in the risk carriers, suggesting that the landmark was more important for them. We also found that they moved closer to the landmark than the control group. And um, this uh, landmark condition relied on uh, various different areas, including the uh, retrospinal cortex. So this suggests that um, a relatively modular view uh, of uh, spatial navigation uh, strategies and systems that in many navigational tasks may uh, act together to uh, optimize overall performance. But if one of these systems fails, this may be compensated by um, recruitment of an alternative system. So that's it. Um, thanks for your attention. If you're interested in that uh, line of research and are still looking for a PhD and, or a postdoc position, um, please let me know. Uh, 
Um, so we're delighted to have um, Gillian Coughlin um, to give our next talk. Um, yeah. And um, so she completed her PhD um, looking at um, preclinical Alzheimer's disease um, at the Norwich Medical School under supervision of Professor, uh, Professor Michael Hornberger. Um, she held a visiting position at the University of Cambridge then for another year and um, following a postdoc at the Rotman uh, Research Institute in Toronto with um, Morris Moscovich and Cheryl Grady. Um, Gillian moved to the Harvard Aging Brain Study at the Mass uh, General Hospital, uh, working with Dr. Rachel Buckley on biological and cognitive markers of preclinical um, AD. Um, Gillian has published her work on a, in a range of um, excellent journals, including PNAS, and uh, has done a wonderful review, which I give to all my students in Nature Reviews Neurology, looking at um, how spatial cognition might be a sort of underused marker. Uh, and a market for the future in diagnosing early stage Alzheimer's. So um, I will pass on to you, Julian. Uh, uh, thank you, Professor Lever, for that wonderful introduction. Um, I guess everyone can see my slides okay. Um, so I'll begin. Um, so I'm currently a postdoctoral research fellow at Massachusetts General Hospital, uh, but much of the work I'm going to present on today actually began uh, during my doctoral research at Norwich Medical uh, School, which is located in the University of East Anglia. And so today I'm going to discuss uh, the clinical application of path integration uh, to uh, to, al to preclinical Alzheimer's disease, and I'm going to touch on other disorders also. Um, so this is a light micrograph from the cortex of an Alzheimer's disease patient, Alzheimer's disease patient, which um, depicts the neuropathology of Alzheimer's disease. Um, so here we have the uh, reddish staining. This uh, represents an amyloid beta plaque, um, and the dark staining. These are uh, tau tangles. Um, so we know that. Uh, tau is a better predictor of Alzheimer's disease than A-beta. And the reason for that is that A-beta is actually seen in many cognitively normal, normal older adults who never go on to develop Alzheimer's disease. Um, so when we look at tauopathy then in preclinical Alzheimer's disease, uh, what we know is that tau actually starts in the locus corellis um, and then it uh, projects up into um, subfields of the entorhinal cortex um, this was discussed earlier this morning. Um, and then it also can move into hippocampal regions of the brain in the preclinical stage of Alzheimer's disease. Now this can also cause functional changes in other regions of the brain, uh, mainly in the parietal cortex. And so what does all this have to do with path integration then? Um, so what we know is that there are spatial cell groups located in the, re in the medial temporal lobe that are very important for how we path integrate. Um, and so this figure down here in the bottom represents this pretty well with color coding. So um, in the entorhinal cortex, we have grid cells, grid cells and speed cells. Uh, in the hippocampus, we have place cells and border cells. This is the home to the cognitive map. Uh, which is important for spatial mem memory and allocentric processing. Um, and then we have head direction cells in the parietal regions of the brain. Um, and it really is these grid cells, speed cells, and head direction cells that underpin, underpin our path integration ability. So the working hypothesis is, is that we if we have um, neuropathology in the medial temporal lobe in preclinical Alzheimer's disease, this may affect the functioning of spatial cells, and we might be able to capture this using path integration assessments. Um, so how do we assess path integration in the lab and, and what is path integration? So if I was to sum this up in one sentence, I would say that path integration is our ability to self-localize refer in reference to our starting point using movement cues. Uh, so this triangle completion task from 1993 is a nice example of that. So participants are basically asked to walk on an L-shaped path. And then at the end of that path, the participants are asked to point back in the direction of their starting point. Um, another option is to walk back in the direction of their starting point. Um, and they actually complete this task while blindfolded, so reducing optic flow. So these participants are only um, engaging the vestibular system and proceptive feedback during this path integration task. Um, now, since 1993, there's, of course, the emergence of many wonderful digital and gamified versions of this, um, and all of them differ slightly 
um, in the queues that they kind of use in order to path integrate. So some include optic flow, others uh, don't include uh, proprioceptive feedback, et cetera. Um, and so the task that I'm going to focus primarily on today is the um, supermarket task, C, the C Hero Quest game, um, and the vestibular rotation task. So starting with the supermarket task. So this task was originally developed um, to distinguish Alzheimer's disease patients from uh, patients with other forms of dementia. Um, and so the participant or patient is basically presented with an iPad device and they watch a video. Um, and so they watch this uh, supermarket trolley move throughout the environment. And so the trolley can take left and right turns as it uh, moves throughout different aisles in the supermarket. And then it stops moving at, at C here, for example, in, at which time the participant is ask, asked what way is their starting point or what way is the entrance. And so the entrance is always the starting point. Um, and then the participant can either say, well, the entrance is back right, back left, or front right, or front left. Um, so after giving this kind of path integration response, they're presented with a map of the supermarket environment, um, and they're asked to mark on that map where they were when they stopped moving. So this is tapping in more to the allocentric spatial memory component. And so what we see here is um, data in Alzheimer's disease patients to suggest, um, and other dementias, to suggest that the supermarket uh, test is sensitive and specific to Alzheimer's disease. Um, but it's that path integration component of the task that really seems to be specific to, to AD. So if we look at performance here, we see that Alzheimer's disease patients are particularly reduced and um, their performance on the task excuse me, um, but behavioral variant frontotemporal dementia, semantic dementia, semantic dementia and healthy controls all perform uh, relatively well um, on this path integration measure. So of course, the main interest is in preclinical Alzheimer's disease. So we know that the newer pathology of Alzheimer's disease begins up to 20 years before someone gets a clinical diagnosis of MCI or clinical dementia. Um, and so what we want to do then is we want to be able to capture neuropathology um, far before someone gets um, a diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease or a full-blown Alzheimer's disease, it's also referred to. And so what we were interested in doing here is looking to see if CSF measures of phosphorylated tau and CSF measures of amyloid beta 42 predict performance on the supermarket task. And so we were particularly interested in that path integration component of the supermarket task. Um, in order to do this, uh, we uh, leveraged the European Prevention of Alzheimer's Disease Consortium data set, which is a wonderful data set um, with data on over 1,700 or 600 people, a mean age of 68, all of which are cognitively normal. Um, and they have structural MRI, they have CSF measures of neurotoxic protein, and they also have um, spatial assessments. And this is Brennan here, a wonderful uh, research assistant who helped tremend tremendously with this work. Um, and so what we did then is we're interested in the association between PTAU and supermarket performance, as well as the association between A beta 42 and supermarket performance. We took a mixed model approach to doing this, adjusting for age, sex, and repeated exposure to the trial. Um, and what we saw then is that um, phosphorylated tau um, so higher levels of phosphorylated tau were associated with um, poorer performance on the supermarket task. This is consistent across males and females. Um, and then we also saw that higher levels of A beta 42 in the CSF are associated with higher levels of supermarket performance. Um, and so just to unpack this a little bit, we know that CSF A beta 42 is a proxy measure for amyloid in the brain. But if we have higher levels of A beta 42 in the CSF, it means we have lower levels of A beta in the brain. And the reason for that is that um, the brain engages in the clearance process. So trying to clear out amyloid and that gets deposited in the CSF. So if we have higher levels of A beta 42, we have lower levels in the brain and that seems to predict better supermarket performance.
Okay, so um, because we used global measures of phosphorylated tau um, and A beta 42, we weren't really able to capture the spatial component of these biomarkers like you can with PET imaging, for example. So what we did is we looked at the structural integrity of the medial temporal lobe, um, looking specifically at the entorhinal cortex and the hippocampus. Um, and the reason we did that is we know that tau is likely to be in these regions in, in preclinical Alzheimer's disease. And when tau is present, it causes um, neurodegeneration or atrophy of the regions it's located in. Um, so what we then did is we looked at the association between task performance and enterhinal volume. So we see that lower enterhinal volume and lower hippocampal volume is associated with uh, poorer performance on our task here. Um, and so in order to link that with our CSF proteins, what we did is a mediation analysis. So we looked to see if the volumes of the enterhinal cortex and the volumes of the hippocampus were actually mediating this relationship, excuse me, between phosphorylated tau and the supermarket task. And we found that was the case. Um, so what could be happening here is that phosphorylated tau is having um, effect on the structural integrity of medial temporal lobe regions, even pre in preclinical disease. And this what could be leading to kind of the phenotype of preclinical disease, which seems to be path integration deficits. Um, so another important thing to kind of discuss here is uh, test retest reliability. So if we're going to use spatial tasks or path integration tasks more specifically um, in clinical trials, we need to be able to establish the retest reliability of these tests. Um, so we did a study on this where we just looked at different spatial tasks. So the supermarket, see here request and four mountains. And we found that the interclass coefficient, which is um, a measure of uh, retest reliability was the highest actually on the supermarket task, but mainly that path integration component. So it demonstrated um, moderate to high retest reliability. However, this is just based on one study. So more research really is needed into retest reliability of these tasks before they're used in the clinical context. So moving away from biomarkers, um, there has been a lot of work on spatial navigation and APOE4 genotype, really wonderful work. Um, and the reason um, scientists have kind of decided to focus on the APOE4 carriers is this is the greatest genetic risk factor for Alzheimer's disease. So if we have one copy of the E4 allele, um, which is a variant of the apolipoprotein gene, um, we're at a uh, three to four fourfold increased risk of Alzheimer's disease. If we have two copies of that E4 allo, we're at a 12-fold increased risk of Alzheimer's disease. And unfortunately, these homozygote E4 carriers, um, among them up to 91%, may actually go on to develop Alzheimer's disease within their lifetime. Um, now, the, the way the APOE4 gene affects um, the brain and leads to this kind of vulnerability is multifold, um, but one of the, the mechanisms is that it reduces the ability of the brain to clear amyloid. And so we looked at um, basically performance of APOE4 carriers and non-carrier controls in the See Here Request game. So I'm gonna just play this video so that people get um, uh, familiar with the game and many people here might have seen this already. Um, but basically we're, we were interested in the spatial trajectory that APOE4 carriers and non-carriers take in the game. And so what we were able to see here is that APOE4 carriers generally travel a further distance in the Sea Hero Quest game. Um, and they also show this tendency to kind of navigate slightly more towards the borders of the virtual environment, as you can see here in, the, in these two examples. Um, now, this kind of phenotype has yet to be replicated in individuals with preclinical neuropathology. So we can't say at this point if uh, what we're seeing in APOE4 carriers um, is specific to preclinical Alzheimer's disease. However, this uh, pattern does follow previous work showing that um, reduced uh, preference to navigate in the center of the environment is linked to reduced grid cells in the enterhinal cortex, which we know is affected by insipid Alzheimer's disease. Um, now, this should be remedied uh, soon. So the deep and frequent phenotyping study has um, uh, biomarker data um, and has see here request data, and we should be able to see if we can replicate this kind of pattern or this navigational pattern in people with um, confirmed biomarkers of A-beta and phosphorylated tau. 
Okay, so um, this is a pretty well-established or well-accepted model of um, the biomarkers of Alzheimer's disease. Um, and so this just shows the accumulation of amyloid beta and tau, and this shows the diagnosis of MCI. And so this diagnosis of MCI, as we said, is about um, one decade after the accumulation starts of A beta and, uh, and tau. And so this accumulation of the biomarkers seems to be associated with a decline in path integration ability. Um, and I think this kind of discussion around cognitive tasks and diagnostics for preclinical Alzheimer's disease is going to be particularly important as we see the inclusion of plasma biomarkers for Alzheimer's disease. Um, and there has been a discussion on this by the International Working Group last year, where they basically, they basically talk about the limitations of a pure kind of biological definition of Alzheimer's disease um, and recommend that we include uh, cognitive markers into the definition of, um, of preclinical disease. Okay, so having discussed then how path integration may be important to early diagnosis um, of insipid Alzheimer's disease, I want to talk about some of the mechanisms by which um, this deficit might be appearing. Um, so, so far the field has primary... Sorry, quick note. Um, so I think Vicky is just signing out. Um, so sorry, so I'll continue. So um, uh, we're going to talk about the vestibular contribution to path integration. Um, and so the reason we, we wanted to look at this basically is so far the field has focused on trying to look at grid cell representations in the enterorhinal cortex and how this might be affecting path integration. Um, but another way to look at this would be look at vestibular um, signals and how the vestibular signal might be changing in preclinical disease and leading to path integration deficits. Um, and so what we wanted to do then um, is basically um, look at how these vestibular organs might be sending uh, signals to the spatial navigation system in the brain. Um, so we know um, that a lot of this has been studied a lot in rodents, but basically the vestibular system uh, sends signals about angular direction and acceleration via corto cortical thalamic uh, pathways. Um, so this signal reaches head direction cells in the retrospinal cortex and anterior thalamic nuclei, and also to grid cells and speed cells in the enterinal cortex. And so the working hypothesis then is that if tauopathy is appearing uh, around you know, the brainstem and the uh, enterinal cortex, then vestibular systems, uh, excuse me, the vestibular signals um, might be affected and therefore have a knock-on effect on um, kind of spatial processing of path integration. Okay, so we developed a task then to um, measure vestibular function in atogenetic risk Alzheimer's disease. Um, so we call this the vestibular rotation task. Um, and basically participants are asked to sit here on, uh, on this seat. Um, and this is their reference point. So they're allowed to visually encode this reference point. Um, and then they're given um, a blindfold or goggles, um, and they're also given earplugs to block out external auditory and visual information. And they're also asked to keep their feet raised so they don't get any kind of clues from, from uh, touching the ground. And so what happens here is um, the tester is in purple here and the, um, the tester rotates the individual in this example, 180 degrees. Um, and then the participant is asked to point back with the iPad device in the, in the uh, direction of the reference point. So if they were completely correct, they would point back with the device um, to the 180 degrees. So here to the reference point, um, but they could also point say uh, at a 90 degree angle back, um, which would mean that the amount of end error, so the distance between their response and the reference point is actually 90 degrees. And so we take this as a proxy for path integration in this task. So end error is basically how we look at path integration. But the really crucial aspect of this is how participants move the iPad. So as they're giving their response, um, there is sensors in the iPad that are recording cardinal directions, rate of velocity and rotational angle. 
Um, and so when we look at that sensor data, what we're able to do is um, use feature selection to drive features that we think um, tap into vestibular function. So we, we were able to um, collaborate with computer scientists on this. So this is uh, William Plum, who's currently um, a PhD student in Imperial College London. And what we were able to do then is identify six vestibular features from the sensor data. So we have total angular displacement, tilt, acceleration, jerk, hesitation, and end error. So end error is the non-motion parameter, just the distance between the response and the reference point. Uh, the other features are, are, are the motion features. Um, okay, and so, uh, because this is very high dimensional data, we took a computational approach to um, trying to classify APOE4 carriers from non-carriers. Um, and we did this using uh, three different competing algorithms. Um, and the best performing algorithms are here represented in the graph. So the blue line basically represents models that include vestibular features and end errors, so that path integration proxy. The red line represents features that include just the, or represent just vestibular features, um, excluding end error. And so what we wanted to do is see how well the models could basically classify the APOE genes just based on these, these features from the sensor task. And so with path integration and vestibular features, we see a class or a precision of roughly 70, 4%. Um, and without end error, we see um, a classification of around 72%. So this was uh, quite interesting for us because what it was showing is that excluding path integration feature and just looking at the vestibular features, we were able to get a pretty high classification accuracy for at genetic risk Alzheimer's disease. Um, and then this is kind of suggesting that there might already be vestibular changes happening in these at-risk carriers who are mean age of 63, but cognitively normal. I think this is actually very important because we know that you know, the vestibular system or vestibular dysfunction in midlife is very treatable. So this could be an important kind of avenue of research in, in preventative medicine around Alzheimer's disease. Are you, uh, um, are you winding up anyway? Okay, great. Yeah. Uh, so just to summarize, so path integration performance predicts global phosphorylated tau and A-beta-42 burden. Digital technology allows us to collect large-scale phenotypic data on path integration, which will be required for large-scale clinical trials and observational studies. There is evidence of moderate to high retest reliability, although more research is needed. Um, I didn't go into detail on this, but basically there is a main effect of sex on most spatial parameters, including path integration with men outperforming women and sex specific norms may need to be considered in clinical settings. And then the final thing is that the vestibular system may underlie the phenotypic presentation of path integration deficits in at risk Alzheimer's disease. And just before I close up, um, there is a kind of, um, I guess, discussion around the clinical application of path integration in other memory-related memory disorders. And I can't go through that today. And we've already kind of looked at, you know, prodromal Alzheimer's disease and maybe preclinical Alzheimer's disease. But there's data coming out of Michael Hornberger's lab, for example, showing that um, the head direction system um, might actually be affected in vascular cognitive impairment due to white matter hyperintensities hyper along the superior longitudinal fasciculus. Um, and these kind of head direction changes might be underlying path integration deficits in vascular cognitive impairment. And then also in medial temporal epilepsy, we seem to see neuronal changes in the enterhinal hippocampal circuitry that are very similar to the neuronal changes that we actually see in preclinical Alzheimer's disease. Um, and there's also, you know, path integration deficits seen in these medial temporal uh, low patients in the early stages of disease, at least. So understanding neuronal changes in preclinical uh, AD and medial temporal ep epilepsy may tell us about the biodirectional bio association between epilepsy and dementia. Okay. Um, and with that, I'd just like to say thank you uh, to my wonderful PhD mentor, Michael Hornberger, and my current postdoctoral mentor, um, who I do uh, biomarker work with, Dr. Rachel Buckley. Our next speaker is Dr. Riona McCardle. She's a research fellow at Newcastle University funded by NIHR. Um, 
So amongst other things, Rihanna has been working to identify psychosocial influences on physical activity and independence following dementia diagnosis. But I think a bread and butter across the last few years has been looking at gait analysis, and she's really sharpened this technique in the lab and has moved with the times and is now looking how she can use digital wearable technology to inform diagnostics um, and care of dementia. And can we tease out kind of what type of dementia you have based on the way you um, walk, for example. And I think that's what she's going to talk about. So Riona, could you share your um, slides, please? And welcome. Thank you very much. Uh, let's just see if I can share this. Can you all see that okay? Yeah, yes, great. Perfect. All right. Thank you very much, Stephen and Colin, for asking me here to speak today. Um, so today I'm just going to tell you a little bit about my work, which is looking at assessing digital mobility outcomes in people with dementia and also the ways that we can use this to improve dementia diagnosis and care. So as Stephen said, the first part of my talk will be, be around my PhD work, looking at how we can use gait analysis derived from digital technology to help us differentiate different types of dementia. And then the second half of my talk will be probing a little bit into how I'm now using these digital mobility outcomes to examine how we can improve dementia care. So first of all, what is digital mobility? Well, digital mobility refers to the quantification of our movement as assessed by technologies, which include wearable or ambient sensors. So this just includes aspects of mobility, such as our gait or our physical activity. And we can measure this both in the lab and the clinic, but also continuously out in the real world. Mobility is a really important clinical feature for us to measure because it can tell us a lot of information about a person's risk of developing certain health conditions, such as Parkinson's disease, it can support the way that we diagnose those health conditions. It can monitor disease progression and identify cognitive impairment or your risk of having a fall. And it can also provide information on how well interventions are working, either pharmacological or non-pharmacological interventions. So my real initial area of interest in digital mobility was its application in differentiating different dementia disease subtypes in order to support clinical decision-making for differential diagnosis. The subtypes I'm going to focus on today are the most common neurodegenerative types of dementia, which includes Alzheimer's disease, which is a memory-led subtype encompassing about 60% of all people with dementia, and dementia with Lewy bodies, which is characterized by motor and neuropsychiatric symptoms, and which accounts for roughly 15% of cases. You'll also hear me talking a little bit about Parkinson's disease dementia as well, which is the dementia version of Parkinson's and looks very similar to dementia with Lewy bodies in a lot of cases. But really, I'm very interested in if I can differentiate dementia with Lewy bodies and Alzheimer's. The reason for this is that there's a lot of regional variation in diagnosis, under detection and misdiagnosis of Alzheimer's and dementia with Lewy bodies. And this affects the way that we care for people and the way that we treat people. Misdiagnosis can occur because they look very similar in early stages, so their cognitive presentation looks quite similar. And it's particularly problematic for dementia with Lewy bodies, where they only account for 4.6% of people that are actually diagnosed in clinic. But when we look at their brain pathology after they die, we can see that they account for about 15% of cases. And additionally, it's said that about roughly 50% of people with dementia with Lewy bodies initially receive a diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease, and this affects the way that we treat them. So my initial research in the GATE lab using a gold standard mobility analysis showed that people with dementia with Lewy bodies have unique signatures of gait impairments compared to Alzheimer's. And that showed approximately 70% accuracy for differentiating subtypes, so moderate to good accuracy for differentiating subtypes. However, if we measure gait in a fully kitted out gait lab with mobility sensors and motion capture analysis, that's quite an expensive process and it requires an awful lot of space and resources to carry out. So you're not going to see that in your average memory clinic or in your GP's clinic. So this really brought me into the world of digital mobility markers. I wanted to see if there was an inexpensive way that we could use wearable technology to provide similar findings to that that I found in a gait lab. This involves placing a small wearable sensor, which it has an accelerometer inside it, on participants' lower backs and asking them to carry out a simple walking task. 
And from that sensor, you get back an acceleration signal from which we can derive different mobility outcomes. And the ones I'm going to talk about today are spatiotemporal gait characteristics. These gait characteristics relate to aspects of pace. So, for example, how fast or slow you're walking, how long are your steps? I also look at a domain called rhythm, which refers to the timing of your walking. So how long does it take for you to make a step? I look at variability of gait, which tells us about how different steps are as you're walking. So do you vary in your step length per step or do you change your step times as you're walking? And I also look at asymmetry of gait, which is how different your left and your right foot steps are in aspects of timing or in step length. So the analysis I'm going to talk about included 104 participants, which was broken down into 29 controls, so older adults without any cognitive impairment, 32 people with Alzheimer's, 28 people with dementia with Lewy bodies, and 14 people with Parkinson's disease dementia. And all of these dementia subtypes were in the kind of mild stages of disease. For the purposes of this talk, I'm just going to use the controls as a reference point, and I'm really going to focus on those differences between the dementia disease subtypes as we could derive using the wearable technology. So just to explain my results plot here a little bit, the black circle in the middle is the control group and I've given them all a zero score. And I've used Z scores to illustrate the differences between dementia disease subtypes and controls. So the red line is Alzheimer's disease, blue line is dementia with Lewy bodies and the green line is Parkinson's disease dementia. And what I found here was that people with dementia with Lewy bodies have a more variable step velocity in comparison to Alzheimer's. And that shows modest accuracy for differentiating dementia subtypes as determined by rock curve analysis. I could also see that the Parkinson's disease dementia group were more variable for their step and swing times, so their timing of gait, and for their step velocity in comparison to Alzheimer's with good accuracy values. So this told me that it is feasible and potentially useful to use wearable technology in a lab or clinical setting to assess gait in dementia disease subtypes. And that from this, we could see discrete digital mobility outcomes that could differentiate those dementia disease subtypes and might be a supportive marker for differential diagnosis. So the next thing really to consider here was the context in which we measured digital mobility. So it shows that measuring mobility in a lab or a clinic is inexpensive using this wearable technology, but it's not a natural setting for a person to walk in. And that means that we're normally seeing a person's best performance rather than what they actually do in their everyday lives. One of the benefits of using digital technology to measure mobility is that the devices aren't constrained to clinical settings and we can measure holistic pictures of mobility in the real world, which allows us to get a better picture of a person's true function. And real world assessments like this also support healthcare equity for underserved populations. So it can access people who live in remote or rural areas who might not have access to transport or may have disabilities and struggle to get into the clinic. Protocols have been developed to enable the continuous monitoring of mobility in the real world. And so I wanted to know if assessing gait in real world settings like this might be a simple and unobtrusive way to detect these unique signatures of mobility that could differentiate dementia disease subtypes. So again, I just placed a small body worn monitor on my participants, but this time I asked them to wear it continuously for seven days. And again, I could derive those different characteristics of spatiotemporal gait that I said I was interested in. So this time I found that Parkinson's disease dementia was significantly more asymmetric than Alzheimer's and dementia with Lewy bodies. And I also found that they were more variable in their gait in comparison to Alzheimer's. But there was no differences between Alzheimer's and dementia with Lewy bodies in this analysis, which was quite disappointing because that's what I was looking for. Compared to controls, we could also see that people with dementia with Lewy bodies and Parkinson's had shorter steps, they were more variable, more asymmetric, and they walked slower in comparison to controls. But the real world gait didn't appear useful for discriminating Alzheimer's from normal aging. So previously we found digital mobility outcomes in the lab differed between dementia disease subtypes, but in the real world, we weren't finding any differences between Alzheimer's and dementia with Lewy bodies. So why is that happening? Well, it might be a question of how differing strategies and environments affect gait. So for example, in a lab setting, participants might be attending to the gait task very intensely, and that might improve their performance in comparison to their real world gait. In comparison, all participants might be performing better in a lab than in a real world. So that's showing us those differences between performance capacity and true function. 
Additionally, when a person is walking in the lab, it's a very controlled environment and we can better understand how these gait impairments might be disease specific. When they're out in the real world, they'd be walking in any different kind of context. And we don't know where that is because the wearables don't record that data. So that makes it really hard for us to understand what the data is telling us. But we can drive a little bit of information about the context of walking by thinking about how long or short the walking bouts people are taking. So, for example, we can see in the top part of this um, the top row of this slide that most of the time that you're walking, you spend it in under 10 second bouts or 10 to 30 second walking bouts. And these different walking bouts can give us different information about the context or activity a person is walking in. So, for example, shorter walking bouts are normally performed in constrained settings, like moving around the home, while longer walking bouts, such as the over 60 second walking bouts that we can see in the bottom right hand corner, are more likely to be out in your community, moving around, doing your shopping. And the research has shown that the context and activity, as represented by this bout length, does influence the way that we're walking, and therefore it's a really important consideration. And what we're seeing in this bottom right-hand corner is that people with the Parkinson's disease dementia actually take much less walking in these longer walking bouts, and that might be changing the way that we are taking the data into account. So I wanted to have a quick look at this. Um, and I found that in these very short walking bouts, you can see the red line, which is Alzheimer's disease, looks quite distinct from the blue line, which is the dementia with Lewy bodies. And so what we were finding was we were finding differences in digital mobility outcomes in very short walking bouts. We found that people with dementia with Lewy bodies took much shorter steps and they were much more symmetric in those step lengths in comparison to Alzheimer's. When we start to look at longer walking bouts, though, we saw that the red line and the blue line look much more similar. So the Alzheimer's and dementia with Lewy bodies have a more similar pattern of gait in these walking bouts, while the Parkinson's disease dementia group look quite distinct. So from those findings, we can see that the context in which a person is walking does impact their pattern of gait impairment. And that's affecting how we interpret this data. And that's something that we need to take into account and try to better understand. That doesn't mean that continuously monitoring digital mobility outcomes won't be useful for dementia diagnosis, but it highlights challenges that we need to address. So for example, we have validated all of these digital mobility algorithms in lab-based settings, and they don't account for changing contexts and changing environments. So instead, we need to start validating them in real world settings and understanding how we can build algorithms that take into account these changing um, and dynamic environments that people are moving in. And there is ongoing work that is trying to validate these digital mobility outcomes, and hopefully this will help us understand how we use it as a clinical tool for dementia diagnosis. So if we do improve diagnosis, we need to make sure that people with dementia are receiving optimal care across all stages of the condition. And digital mobility outcomes might be able to help us map some of these changes in people's function as their cognition and care needs change. And that might give us kind of warnings or red flags that tell us that we need to alter their care or the treatment to suit people's immediate needs. And it might also allow us to develop interventions that we can use to use digital mobility outcomes to examine how efficient or effective they are. One way that we consider the use of digital mobility monitoring in dementia care is to think about how we assess habitual physical activity. Now, this just refers to the movements that people engage in every day. So, for example, if they're walking around their home or in their community. And habitual physical activity is an incredibly important thing to maintain as we grow older and develop conditions like dementia, because it's associated with better health, better well-being and functional independence. So the work that I'm going to present now is just an example. It's just a snapshot of all the work that there is out there in this kind of area. But it's just what I've been working on myself. So we can measure many different types of habitual physical activity characteristics using digital mobility tools. My work really focuses on things like the volume that a person moves. So, for example, how many steps per day are you taking? How many minutes do you spend walking? I'm also interested in aspects of the pattern of a person's walking. So how long are your walking bouts when you're moving around the environment? And do you take more short walking bouts in comparison to long walking bouts? That's something that we call the alpha score. I'm also interested in how variable your walking activity is. So are you changing the kind of activity that you're doing across the day? Or are you pretty much doing the same kind of walking every single day? 
I looked at this in the same group of people with dementia that I described before. So from the, my PhD study, the Gate Dem study, using the exact same method of the seven day assessment with that wearable sensor. And from that, probably unsurprisingly, we found that people with dementia have lower volumes and variability of activity. And they spend most of the time in very short walking bouts. And that's particularly pronounced in people with dementia at Lewy bodies. Importantly, we found that these low volumes of physical activity were associated with lower functional independence. So that highlights the potential that digital mobility outcomes may be monitoring clinically relevant information for dementia care. With this connection in mind, I wanted to support physical activity interventions in the aging population by identifying how we're measuring digital mobility outcomes and making recommendations for the best practice of using digital mobility in aged care. So from the results of a systematic review, I made four key recommendations for monitoring digital mobility in aged care. And I'm also trying to now follow this up with community dwellers in dementia to make sure that it's applicable across the board of care and cognition. So the first thing that I would say is choose the right physical activity tool. This digital mobility tool should be validated against gold standard measures, and it should also employ outcomes that are comparable to other studies. So, for example, it should be using the same algorithm or it should be at least using the same reference values for what it defines as physical activity. Secondly, choose the right digital mobility outcomes in the population that you're looking at. So an aged care population, people who are in care homes or nursing homes, are not moving around an awful lot, which means any activity that they do should be recorded. So I would recommend things like looking at total physical activity or total steps per day, rather than trying to look at moderate to vigorous physical activity, which they rarely engage in. Thirdly, make sure that you're using low cutoff thresholds and applying that to your signal or to your algorithms in order to define what physical activity is. What this means is that certain digital mobility tools would detect physical activity as anything over three seconds of movement. Other physical activity tools define it as anything over 60 seconds of movement. And as you can imagine, you're losing 90% of your data if you're going for those longer physical activity bites rather than the shorter ones. And finally, make sure that you're putting representative populations into your sample. So within this um, systematic review, I found that the majority of studies were excluding people with cognitive impairment, despite the fact that they could encompass 70% of the people that live in aged care. So this isn't really representative to what's happening within aged care homes. And so we need to be doing better with this and trying to understand how people with cognitive impairment in aged care are moving or not moving within those environments. So given the importance of staying mobile, I was also interested to know if digital mobility monitoring could have the potential to be considered important for dementia care in the community. And to explore this further, I carried out a series of participatory workshops and interviews with people with dementia, their carers, and people who worked in dementia care. So those interviews highlighted that staying mobile is important to support people with dementia to remain independent and to promote well-being. And contributors associated the loss of activity with loss of independence and lack of purpose for people with dementia. Contributors also emphasized the importance of having a positive psychosocial well-being to support staying active, while anxiety and depression were considered barriers to activity for people with dementia. A really important and common theme that came up was carer's psychosocial well-being. So the carer had to be feeling well in order to make sure that people with dementia were active and mobile as our key facilitators to helping them do this. And contributors also stress the importance of better understanding physical activity in people with dementia, including how guidelines and advice for physical activity following diagnosis should be implemented. And we should also understand how we can best support physical activity in people with dementia. So finally, after these workshops and interviews, I became very interested in using digital mobility monitoring to gain objective information on changes in physical activity following diagnosis of dementia and to find out how psychosocial experiences of people with dementia and their carers might impact physical activity. And digital mobility outcomes come in really handy here because they're a measure of behavioral change. And then I can explore why is that behavior changing? So in collaboration with the Icicle Gate study, I initially looked at this in a slightly different population in people with Parkinson's disease, which is a similar neurodegenerative condition to people with dementia. 
This involved 64 people with Parkinson's and 40 of these people had carers. So I got them to do the same method as before, wear a wearable sensor for seven days continuously out in their real world environment. And from that, I measured their volume, pattern and variability of physical activity. So these participants had um, with Parkinson's and their carers also answered a number of psychosocial questionnaires for me to understand what was happening with them. So from this, I found that lower social support, poorer self-care and greater care strain were all associated with physical activity. The lower a person's social support was, the more likely they were going to be spending most of their time in short walking bouts after 18 months. And this might be because the less social support you're having, the less you're likely to be going out of the house or engaging in social activities that make you engage in physical activity. We also found that this lower care self-care and greater care strain was actually associated with having a higher volume of physical activity in people with Parkinson's disease. And this highlights the role of a carer's psychosocial well-being and how this might be impacted while keeping a person with Parkinson's physically active. So it might be that carers are actually spending most of their time trying to help the person with Parkinson's maintain their everyday activities or maintain their function. And they're doing this at the expense of their own self-care and they're creating greater strain for themselves. That's not necessarily great in the long run because it's more likely to have a bigger impact on the person with Parkinson's as the disease progresses. And so what these findings do is they highlight the importance of considering both carers and the person with the condition when we're thinking about physical activity interventions and trying to keep people physically active after diagnosis. So I'm going to follow up on this work in Parkinson's by looking at it in people with dementia as part of my fellowship, which has just started with the NIHR. And this will be identifying modifiable psychosocial outcomes to maintain physical activity and promote independence in people with dementia. And that um, work is going to be up and coming and will hopefully be used to develop a post-diagnostic support program to promote independence and well-being for people with dementia. So just finally, just want to have some acknowledgements here to all of my collaborators, my PhD supervisors and all of the different groups that I've worked in, my funders and, of course, all of the participants who've supported this work so far. Um, I'm happy to answer any questions, but you can also send me an email or uh, tweet me. Thank you very much. Our second keynote speaker, um, Professor Karen Duff. It's a great honour for me to introduce Karen. She's currently Centre Director at the UK Dementia Research Institute at UCL. Um, she was educated at the University of East Anglia and completed a PhD at Queen's College, Cambridge. At Cambridge, she was a student in the department of Sydney Brenner, who was a Nobel Prize winner. And then after a postdoc in London, she went over to the US where she finally became Professor of Pathology and Cell Biology at Columbia University. Um, Professor Karen Duff is an expert on mechanisms driving Alzheimer's disease and frontotemporal tau, but the insights from her work extend to be um, other neurodegenerative diseases. And for her work, she's awarded the, the Tamkin Prize in 2006, and more recently, um, the British Neuroscience Association Award for Outstanding Contribution to Neuroscience in 2020. Um, and to quote the um, BNA's little blurb they've done on her, her work on tau pathobiology is highly influential and has contributed to a paradigm shift in opinion on the importance of tau in AD disease pathogenesis, resulting in a focus on tau-based diagnostics and therapeutics that are now in clinical trials. So Karen, can you take the floor, please? Thank you. So can you um, see me and hear me? Yes. Great. Okay. Uh, thanks very much, Stephen, for uh, inviting me to give this talk. Um, it's an audience I haven't met before, so um, thank you very much for that. Um, <clears throat> uh -huh. Slide advance. Not getting my slides to advance. Okay, oops, they're just slow maybe. Okay, so um, I'm going to be talking mainly about tau pathology um, really as it occurs uh, in Alzheimer's disease and frontal temporal lobe dementias. And uh, just to orientate you with the, what we know about the pathologies of Alzheimer's disease, uh, we have the amyloid plaques, um, which are, which are uh, extracellular clumps of uh, protein mainly composed of the A-beta uh, peptide. Um, and we have the neurofibrillary tangles, which are intracellular, uh, accumulations of tau uh, protein in an abnormal conformation. 
Uh, in addition to these two pathologies, we have uh, in about 25 to 40% of cases, accumulation of alpha-synuclein and TDP43 also, uh, but these tend to occur in, in fairly localized areas. And the whole uh, 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 pathology of Alzheimer's disease is accompanied by an inflammatory and immune response, uh, which is really uh, showing itself to have more and more importance, uh, including perhaps as a, as a, a, a pathogenic me mechanism, uh, and here we have, you know, activated astrocytes, microglia, complement, et cetera. And the net result is that we see an, a loss of synapses uh, with abnormal neurites uh, distributed and degeneration of neurons, cognitive loss, uh, and ultimately death. So the uh, pathology of Alzheimer's disease uh, is very interesting. And this is something that I have really focused on uh, for, for the last couple of years. And I'm talking about the amyloid plaques and the tau tangles. And when you look at neuropathology studies, you can see the distribution of these two pathologies using antibodies or stains. And the two pathologies have quite different distributions. Uh, on the top, you see a cartoon showing the distribution of the amyloid plaques as the disease worsens from the prodromal stage through to the late stage. And on the bottom, you can see a cartoon of where the uh, tau tangles uh, are, are known to occur. And you can see that the distribution is quite different. However, it actually seems to be the reciprocal. So in the earlier stages, amyloid is fairly well distributed and quite uh, dense. However, tau tangles are very localized uh, and very uh, uh, discrete uh, areas are affected. But as the disease worsens, the amyloid worsens and the tau worsens uh, and more and more areas become impacted. And you can see this on a, on a proper uh, neuropath um, uh, series, uh, which, which follows the BRAC staging of neurofibrillary pathology, which tells you the worsening uh, stages of Alzheimer's disease. So we were interested in this um, distribution change that occurs, uh, especially with tau. Uh, and this is part of the BRAC staging, is the distribution and severity of tau pathology really gives you the BRAC staging for Alzheimer's disease. And we were very interested in this observation made by uh, Charles Duckett um, that tau pathology can be limited uh, in the brain if there's been a lesion that perhaps could separate different areas of the brain. And this, is, this study has not really been very well discussed, uh, and I think it's very important and should be looked at further. So in this study, he took a, a patient who had had a, a glioma, which had separated, severed part of the uh, cortex uh, early on in the, uh, at, the, at a stage of the patient's life. And as the patients went on to develop Alzheimer's disease, he saw that the amyloid uh, was distributed uh, in the part of the brain that had been separated from the rest of the cortex, but the tau pathology had not. It had remained uh, in the area which had, had remained connected to the rest of the cortex and not separated. And this suggested to him that perhaps the tau pathology was actually spreading from one area to another through some physical mechanism, not so much that it just was different areas of the brain were vulnerable to tau pathology at different stages of, of the disease for some other reason, but actually that there was physical spread of tau pathology along circuits. And this has been embodied um, and expanded on by, by studies by uh, Brack and Tradici. And here is their uh, staging, pro staging of, of a tauopathy and AD brain, and that the neuroanatomy, the connections between the areas that were impacted between different stages as the disease progressed, suggested that they were linked anatomically and that they were linked by transsynaptic um, connections where tau could be tau pathology, tauopathy could be initiated in one area and spread across transsynaptic connections into dist distal areas which were neuroanatomically connected. Now, this was a really revolutionary idea uh, and something that we picked up on uh, with our mouse modeling, as I'll show in a minute. So I just wanted to cover one minute of tau biology. Um, tau is a microtubule uh, binding protein, which is localized in the axons in the normal conditions. For some reason, and it could be because there are mutations in the tau protein uh, or elevated A beta uh, as a result of Alzheimer's disease uh, starting, for some reason, the tau loses its connections with the microtubules and uh, aggregates uh, in, in the cytoplasm, forming these neurofibrillary tangles. And this is accompanied with um, increased phosphorylation, conformational change, uh, in, over uh, impaired clearance mechanisms, and the tau can't be removed and it leads to the cell death of the neuron. 
Now, tau pathology is not only seen in Alzheimer's disease, it's seen in F frontal temporal lobe dementias. And there are two examples here, PSP and PICS disease. And very interestingly, the distribution is different between these diseases. And you know, it, it's really very interesting that you have tau is one protein, but it can have different distributions in, in, in the human brain, giving rise to different clinical uh, uh, dementias. Uh, it's also represented with different pathologies. Um, you've got neuronal inclusions of tau in uh, Alzheimer's disease and, disease and, and most of the, the uh, frontal temporal lobe dementias. And you've also got glial distributions uh, in, in the frontal temporal lobe dementia. You see different isoforms of tau. So at the molecular level, it's now also showing diversity. You have different isoforms of tau, some of which cause uh, the disease. For example, increase in the four repeat uh, type of tau isoforms leads to CBD and um, AGD, whereas the three repeat leads to PICS disease. And very interestingly, even at the molecular level, um, cryo-EM has shown that the, the tau pathology takes different conformations. This is the tau pathology forming these different folds seen in the different diseases. So there's a great deal of diversity coming off this single molecule tau. Now this conformational change is thought to underlie a property which is called the prion-like uh, templating uh, properties of tau pathology. And this is very reminiscent of the uh, conformational changes seen in, in prion diseases. And it's thought to result from a templating mechanism where normal tau forms a different conformation and can pass that on uh, in, in a, <clears throat> in a um, corrupting mechanism uh, to normal prote tau proteins and on through different cells and, and through the brain. And that this spreading of um, the, the corrupted templates uh, incites this chain reaction, which leads to the spread of the tau pathology uh, through the brain. It's not clear what is toxic in terms of tau, whether it's the, the monomeric or the small oligomeric forms, uh, but it seems to be probably not related to the larger aggregates, although they are toxic in their own right. Uh, however, the smaller aggregates and seeds have toxicity themselves. Now, one interesting property was shown. If you take the tau, tau brain tissue from these different diseases and put them into a mouse model that has a little bit of incipient tau pathology, you can actually replicate very closely the pathology from which uh, uh, the, from, of the brains from which the tau is derived. So this templating and, and uh, incitement of tau pathology sort of breeds true uh, depending on the disease uh, from which it was derived. Now we were very interested in modeling this. And to do this, we created a, a tau transgenic mouse, um, which had predominant expression of the tau protein, a human tau protein in the entorhinal cortex. Um, and this was uh, uh, achieved through the use of the neuropsin promoter. And this was actually a TET inducible uh, mouse model, um, which would develop the full pathology of tau, uh, tau pathology. Here you see it, um, tau in the axons, accumulating in the uh, somat uh, somatodendritic compartments, becoming more dense fibrils, positive by EM and uh, dyes such as thioflavin S. So in this mouse model, we could uh, here in brown is the human tau um, expression. This is a horizontal section through our mouse model. And you see a lot of tau accumulating in the medium and lateral entorhinal cortex, uh, which is where the transgene is mainly expressed. You also see accumulation in the perforant path, the axon terminals coming off the in the perforant path, uh, terminating there in the middle molecular layer of the dentate gyrus. And this looks fairly normal. The distribution of tau is in the axons. You're starting to see a little bit of tau accumulating in the somatodendritic compartment. But the situation is really quite different when the mice have aged. Uh, you start to see accumulation in the, um, in the uh, uh, cell bodies uh, of the entorhinal cortex, especially layers two and three, especially the medial uh, entorhinal cortex. You start to see accumulation uh, out in other areas of the brain, the extra hippocampal areas through the cortex, and I'll show that in a bit more detail. But you start to see it, uh, accumulation now in cell bodies that were negative um, in the younger uh, mice, and they don't express avert levels of human tau. This is the granule cell layer of the um, uh, dentate gyrus, CA1 layer of the hippocampus, and as I mentioned, the extra hippocampal areas. So there is now a distribution of tau that did not, it has progressed, um, and it looks like it's moved into cell types that were not previously impacted. 
And this, especially the accumulation of CA1 neurons, looks very reminiscent of human AD tauropathy. Um, this was an iDisco uh, um, experiment that we did where we um, could clear the brain and with using labeled tau, we could show its distribution. And I'm not sure this will play, unfortunately. This is a movie um, and I'm afraid it well, usually it rotates, but you can see the tau in the white dots spread throughout the brain and accumulating layers we weren't, we didn't know were affected such as the amygdala. Uh, sorry about this, it should, it looks much better when it, it uh, plays as a, a, move, a movie. But we saw that the tau that was originally expressed here in the entron cortex would spread uh, through the brain, looking very reminiscent of the progression of tau pathology that you see in human AD. Now, going back to this circuit, um, the entorhinal cortex uh, and hippocampal circuit, the hippocampal formation, um, one of the things that's interesting here is that the cells uh, that originate in the entorhinal cortex um, synapse uh, through um, their terminals onto uh, the dendrites um, that come from the dentate gyrus granule cell there. So there's one a monosynaptic layer there in this area here, the middle layer of the uh, molecular, middle molecular layer of the dentate gyrus. And we were curious uh, whether that could tell us a, a bit about the mechanism by which tau is spreading through the brain. And here's what you see in the young mice. You see the accumulation in the terminals of the middle molecular layer, depletion in the older mice in that layer, and accumulation now in the granule cell layer. And this really could only occur because there would be transfer of tau from the axon terminals into the dendrites um, from coming from this cell. It had to occur by transynaptic spread as there was really no expression of, of human tau in these neurons. Um, it was the only way it could be explained. This was really radical. Um, we didn't know that tau could leave neurons. Uh, it was not meant to be an extracellular protein in any way. It's meant to be bound to microtubules. So this was really quite a remarkable finding. And it has opened up a whole new biology, uh, understanding of the biology of tau and therapeutic opportunities, because now it's possible to capture it potentially as it's in the extracellular space. You can see by these EM um, studies, immuno-EM from the mice, uh, this is taken from that middle molecular layer. You can see human tau uh, clearly in the postsynaptic compartment. Um, in this layer. Uh, here it's crossing the synaptic cleft. And here in the presynaptic compartment, it seems to be accumulating on the outside of synaptic vesicles. And this is, uh, has been proposed uh, to be uh, mediated through syna uh, synaptogyrin 3, which is thought to tether tau to synaptic vesicles. And potentially it can drag the tau uh, across the synaptic cleft uh, if it's bound to the outside of the synaptic vesicles, we're not sure uh, other mechanisms that might be in play here. But very interesting biology of tau uh, as a synaptic vesicle binder and also as a trans uh, synaptic um, uh, protein. Now tau pathology is very interesting. It tends to, it, it really only accumulates in excited neurons. And this has been known for a long time from the work of uh, uh, many, many labs. And the first area affected in human AD, as I mentioned, is in the entorhinal cortex and specifically in layer two and three of the entorhinal cortex with it spreading, but still st staying uh, um, associated with it, um, excited neurons. Um, in uh, uh, neurons throughout the brain as it spreads through the brain. Now, this uh, association with excited neurons um, has been shown at many levels, but we showed in this study uh, using immunohistochemistry that it truly co-localizes with markers of excited neurons. Um, previously, it had been shown by its location, the morphology of the neuron, the neurotransmitters associated. But this study actually uh, has got to the, got at the molecular basis um, of um, a tau pathologies uh, accumulating in excited neurons and sparing uh, inhibitory neurons. Why that is, uh, we don't know. What is it about excited neurons that makes them vulnerable, selectively vulnerable to the accumulation of tau? Uh, we don't know. We're interested in all these parts of uh, excited neuron biology, and I'd be delighted to hear people's thoughts on this. Um, this really is a mystery, very important. Um, but some of these uh, uh, processes is are being looked at further, uh, uh, particularly um, exocytosis uh, and uh, proteostasis differences between excited inhibitory neurons. 
The neurons are lost uh, as the tau pathology accumulates. It's the, the excited neurons, especially in the entron cortex, are lost. The studies from human brains by um, Isla uh, Gomez and Brad Hyman's lab, and here in our mouse model, uh, we could see that entron cortex um, neurons uh, were lost. Uh, we could see, and I'm sorry, this has got fuzzy uh, with the from the for, for converting from the PDF, but we could see that they were particularly um, the excited neurons were lost. Uh, co-localizing the excitation neurons and tau or the inhibitory neurons and tau, we could see a selective loss of excitation neurons uh, in the entorhinal cortex. Now, this loss also goes with um, uh, atrophy through the brain. We used an MRI study using TBM, uh, looking at TBM-related uh, tension-based um, morphology-related atrophy in our mouse model by MRI looking through the hippocampal formation. And this red area indicates um, uh, the areas showing atrophy. And you can see as the mice age from 14 months up to 30 months, uh, that region of atrophy spreads from the EC uh, into the hippocampus, hippocampus. And you can see one of the things I really like about this is you can see quite well the morphology of the hippocampal formation, uh, even by MRI. And we're very excited because this has translation uh, to human MRI studies. Um, so we, we think this is a good way of looking um, longitudinally and with non-invasively um, at the mice um, uh, to, to look at what happens as this tau pathology spreads, does it correlate with atrophy and other dysfunction? And when we overlaid the, the um, atrophy measures by MRI with the pathology we generated on that um, uh, IDISCO uh, uh, measure, you could see that the morphology, uh, the, the atrophy really follows where the pathology is stronger with it spreading alongside uh, the tau pathology. Now, we've heard about the entrant cortex and its, its role in spatial navigation uh, from Dennis. And we're very interested in this uh, as a measure in these mice because of the strong association of tau pathology uh, in our mouse model, which of course represents uh, the tau pathology seen in human AD. And the involvement, of course, in those areas in the entron cortex and hippocampus and, and uh, parietal cortex involved in a spatial navigation, spatial memory. And as Dennis was uh, talking about, um, you know, spatial disorientation is a feature of early Alzheimer's disease. So we're very curious whether our mouse models show this, uh, this um, uh, disor disorientation or dysfunction of the entorhinal cortex uh, due to the tau pathology accumulating there. To get at this, we used um, grid cell electro we looked at grid cell electrophysiology. Uh, the grid cells are located right there in the entorhinal cortex where um, the pathology develops, the medial entorhinal cortex especially affected in our mouse model and, and in human AD. And we used in vivo electrophysiology. Uh, where we allowed the mouse, we uh, in, implanted um, a headset, the tetrodes, allowed the mouse to explore, um, oh, sorry, the movies aren't playing, um, allowed the, um, uh, uh, recorded um, every time uh, uh, the, a neuron uh, uh, fired uh, whilst the mouse was navigating in this box, and in this way, built up the uh, classic uh, um, equil equilateral triangles uh, that form the grid, uh, the grid field. And record, we recorded in two ages of mice, uh, mice at 30 months of age, oops, mice at 30 months of age, and mice at 14 months of age. The 14 month old mice had very little pathology. Uh, the 30 month old mice had much more pathology. And when we looked at grid field, grid cell activity maps, um, we were able to see that the grid score uh, and the frequency uh, distribution was reduced in the 30-month-old mice, uh, which correlated with the increase in the pathology there. In addition to the um, grid, grid field uh, dis destabilization and disruption, uh, we also performed um, uh, some, some uh, behavioral analysis, uh, which was related to uh, spatial navigation. Here we show the uh, water maze and the mice <coughs> at 30 months, <coughs> excuse me, <clears throat> but not 14 months were, were uh, considerably um, dysfunctional in the, in the Morris water maze. Uh, and also they were dysfunctional in the T maze, uh, which is really a, a better test of spatial navigation. And you could see that they made less alternating <clears throat> uh, turns um, in the older mice compared to the younger mice. So we think this, is as a this goes along with this destabilization of the grid fields, 
and disruption of the of, of the hippocampal formation in these mice where the tau pathology is clearly developing, excited neurons are being lost, atro- you know, the, the, the areas are atrophying either through cell loss or loss of uh, parenchyma, uh, clearly correlating with spatial navigation deficits. And I put this slide in, uh, here's Dennis's work. Uh, we're very interested in looking at whether the mice will uh, be a good model for uh, the type of uh, spatial navigation test that Dennis is looking at. And here is a mouse performing virtual reality. This, this was done, this study is performed by my collaborator at Columbia University, um, Abid uh, Hosseini, who performed all the in vivo electrophysiology. He's also looking at uh, virtual reality tests and here I'm mentioning uh, Julia Krupik, uh, who I am working with up in Cambridge, and John O'Keefe at UCL to really try and make the mouse model and the human human models um, uh, match, so that we have a nice uh, uh, ability to translate what Dennis is seeing in the human studies to the mouse and be able to tease it apart as we can with the transgenic models. So I wanted to spend a little bit of time now talking about mechanisms. Um, this uh, this this represents. So one the question we have is uh, how does tau that's originally expressed and and generated in the entral cortex in cell A of the entral cortex how does it end up in cell B in the granule uh, cell layer uh, having crossed the synapse how does it get there what 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 promotes it to do that and how can we stop it more importantly so that we can prevent the, the spread of the pathology through the brain. And there's a couple of mechanisms uh, represented here. The most uh, popular ones currently uh, involve, um, here you see the synapse coming from the antiviral cortex cell, synapse in the middle molecular layer, and the dentate gyrus um, uh, granule cell dendrite uh, represented on this side. So the most, um, one of the most likely ways is that tau is just released from a degenerating uh, synapse. We know that uh, cell degeneration and synaptic degeneration is, it commonly occurs early on in Alzheimer's disease. Um, so it could just be free tau released, which could then be picked up by the receiving neuron here um, through a number of mechanisms. The tau could penetrate through the um, membrane. It could be invaginated uh, through um, uh, endocytotic uh, mechanisms, it could bind to receptors and be internalized. And once it internalizes, it's released from any uh, vesicle it would be uh, uh, encapsulated in. It has to find the tau, uh, the nape of the tau in this neuron and corrupt it through this prion-like templating mechanism. And then that can be passed on from neuron to neuron. Another mechanism is this mechanism um, seen here, which is where some kind of vesicle is involved. Um, and this uh, could be uh, um, one of a range of extracellular vesicles which have been identified, um, such as the exosomes, ectosomes, microvesicles, et cetera, which have different origins, but they can encapsulate the tau and transfer it to the, re- to the recipient neuron. And we're very interested in this mechanism. Uh, and we have data uh, which we're generating, which shows that we can actually identify little seeds, these proteopathic seeds of tau in these vesicles, uh, which can be transferred across um, the, um, the synapse. Now, one of the things we're interested in is whether the, the firing of neurons, if they're located in this synapse, especially if they're tethered to the synaptic vesicles or in these extracellular vesicles, Um, whether the firing of the neuron will actually exacerbate the tau pathology spread. And to do that, we've done a number of experiments which came from the first set in vitro, which uh, followed on from reports from uh, Diane Hanger's lab and Dave Holtzman's lab that neuronal activity uh, induced by picotoxin uh, could release tau either in the media of cells or here in in, in the extracellular space of mice And we took this a bit further and we co-cultured neurons, one expressing tau, one not expressing tau. And we were able to show the tau moving from uh, being released from one cell and taken up by another through these confocal uh, experiments. And when you added picrotoxin, you could quite clearly see that the tau uh, was not only released more readily by one neuron, but taken up by the next neuron. So clearly an increase in activity will release, uh, cause a greater uh, tau uptake. We wanted to look at this in vivo, and to do this, we turned to optogenetic approach, 
where um, light uh, uh, evokes action potentials. Um, uh, laser light induces uh, the firing of this optogene, this channel of adopsin, which we put into the mouse brain. And here is the setup. You put a headset with the laser light. Uh, you put recording electrodes into the mouse brain. Uh, and one side gets stimulated and one side is not stimulated. And we put these into a mouse that had some incipient tauopathy so that we could see whether we could exacerbate the pathology uh, by, by stimulating uh, the optogene with the laser light. And here you can see the firing that occurred in those uh, mouse brains uh, in, in uh, response to this um, uh, to, to, uh, 30 hertz stimulation four times a day uh, of two seconds each. And this was done for 21 days. Here's the uh, tau pathology. This is the stimulated side. You could see clearly that the tau pathology was exacerbated on the, on the stimulated side, uh, but not on the non-stimulated side. Now, we were curious whether we could do the reverse, because of course, you, it, th therapeutically, we'd like to make tau pathology um, uh, less, you know, we'd like to modulate it and attenuate tau pathology. So we turned to a chemogenetic approach. Uh, we did find the optogenetic suppression didn't work very well. So we turned to a chemogenetic approach using um, dreads, uh, suppressing dreads. Um, this was not so easy to do in the mice, but we did get uh, enough data to show that uh, when you did this suppression in the end, uh, this, um, uh, the, um, exacerbation, uh, the exacerbating dread in the entrial cortex, you could increase the tau pathology in the side that had the dread um, uh, added. Here's the stimulated side with the dread. Uh, here's the non-stimulated side showing less uh, pathology. So this was a stimulating dread. Sorry, I may have said uh, suppressing dread. This is stimulating dread, um, uh, which was <clears throat> induced through uh, the administration of clos uh, clozapine. <clears throat> Again, <clears throat> this one was long term. This was six weeks uh, uh, administering uh, clozapine uh, several times uh, a day. Um, <clears throat> over uh, a couple of weeks. Now, one of the things that I mentioned is we want to decrease this. And so to do that, we um, have used this chemogenetic attenuation of the, um, of the dread. And this paper was recently published and it shows that you can, if you do this in a tau mouse, you can reduce the tau pathology by suppressing uh, firing. And when we do it in a mouse with both amyloid and tau, we can suppress uh, but the pathologies, both amyloid pathology and tau pathology. So this sort of sets us up to think that perhaps neuromodulation therapeutic approaches might be impactful. And it also suggests to us that a mechanism by which tau pathology is uh, spreading could be through some firing related um, uh, release of the tau, uh, either vesiculated or attached to synaptic vesicles potentially, or just to um, some synaptic toxic effect, which releases more tau in some way. So the converse of the um, uh, decrease, uh, of, the, of the chemogenetic decrease approach is, uh, is actually no, I'll say that again. So one of the observations related to amyloid has been that actually amyloid or A beta can exacerbate firing in its own right. And there are several, several studies that have been done, lots of studies now showing that, that even in uh, humans, as well as in the mouse models or in, in, in other models, if, if you add excess A beta, you will get excess firing uh, of neurons. And this creates a hyper excitable state. And so one of the things we've been thinking about, um, and this is, I'm just gonna wrap up on this, uh, one of the things we've been thinking about is that perhaps uh, the way that you um, lead off with amyloid accumulation in the earliest stage of the disease and then start to trigger tau pathology um, uh, spread through the brain is through hyperexcitability induced by A-beta. Perhaps the A-beta accumulating in the brain early, early in the stage of the disease, before neurodegeneration, before uh, cognitive impairment, perhaps that sets off a hyperexcitable circuit and as we've seen, that hyperexcitability could lead to tau pathology uh, being exacerb exacerbated and leading a, as a trigger then to trigger its uh, release from um, neurons um, in the entorhinal cortex, which could then spread through the brain. <laughs> and it's interesting to note that the entorhinal cortex actually is an area which has, un which has tau pathology building up probably as a result of age. It seems to be vulnerable to tau pathology building up there. Um, and 
but it might be that the A beta uh, that's that's part of the Alzheimer's disease actually triggers that age-related, quite normal and non-impactful accumulation of tau into the pathological state. And it's of interest that the distribution of tau pathology uh, as seen in Alzheimer's disease, where it's in the entorhinal cortex and the hippocampal formation, is different to the distribution of tau pathology you see in the frontal temporal lobe dementias, where there's no A beta, where it is distributed in a different, different orientation. And so an idea here is perhaps those entorhinal cortex neurons are vulnerable to a beta-induced hyperexcitability and it's really fairly regionally um, uh, uh, vulnerable. Uh, and so the combination of high, having a beta increase for whatever reason triggers that particular distribution and spread and pro progression of the pathology that you see in Alzheimer's disease and not in the non-amyloid uh, uh, tauopathy such as FTD. So that's just a little something to think about. Um, we've been trying to work on this and trying to work out how to do it. The chemogenetic approach was one, but unfortunately, when you reduce A beta with chemogenetics, you also reduce tau, so you can't actually do cause and effect. Um, it's difficult because it impacts both pathologies. But this is, an, I think, this is quite an interesting idea, which might explain why tau pathology is different in AD uh, to FTD. And just to summarize, um, I've, I've sort of been talking about how tau is um, uh, spreads to the brain along anatomical connections, transferring between uh, the neurons uh, transsynaptically, but it also seems to transfer transneuronally. I didn't discuss that. And I also didn't discuss the uh, uh, potential for tau to go from one neuron to another via glia. We don't see glia um, tauopathy in AD, but we do see glial tauopathy in FTD. Um, and so we don't know what the role of glia is in uh, tau pathology and tau spread. We think it transfers in, by potentially a number of mechanisms, possibly as free tau from degenerating neurons, but also uh, through vesicles. We're very interested in these extracellular vesicles, probably the microvesicles rather than the exosomes. Uh, we have data showing that the microvesicles the larger vesicles, extracellular vesicles, seem to be carrying these tau seeds. Uh, but this vesicular uh, um, tauopathy is tau is very interesting as a mechanism of spread. Um, we think that the uh, autophagy and ubiquitin proteasome systems are very important to, in, in keeping the tau pathology at bay. Uh, we know that autophagy and these systems uh, are attenuated with age, normal aging. Um, and that this could sort of lead to a perfect storm whereby recipient neurons just cannot deal with these incoming seeds. They're battling against the, the accumulation of this, this, uh, these aggregated proteins and that you know, eventually they are overcome. And this opens up the idea that these are potential therapeutic targets to pro pr promote uh, you know, the brain's uh, resistance um, to being overwhelmed by, by seeds uh, through autophagy or proteasome. Uh, upregulation, and I have an active project uh, working on that. If anyone's interested in that, um, you know, this idea that it passes through this extracellular phase is, is interesting for therapeutics. Um, it Im implies that uh, therapeutics such as immunotherapy could have their mode of action uh, by grabbing the tau as it's passing from one neuron to another. Um, immunotherapy is immun uh, antibodies are not not really thought to enter cells very well. So it's probably not having an intracellular effect. It may well now be that it's actually grabbing tau and preventing it from transferring uh, in the extracellular space. However, <clears throat> and these therapeutics are in clinical trials at the moment uh, for tau. However, we've got to be careful because there is substantial amounts of these tau seeds in the vesicles. And of course they would escape uh, the immunotherapy approaches. So I think we've got to be careful and think of ways of grabbing extracellular vesicles uh, and other, other forms of tau that's spreading between neurons if we really want to stop the propagation uh, of tau pathology. And lastly, this neuromodulation therapeutics, <clears throat> deep brain stimulation, there's other uh, neuromodulation therapeutics now. Um, uh, I know near Grossman at uh, Imperial has an interesting one uh, that's um, uh, um, non-invasive, um, and these may be an effective therapeutic, therapeutic approach. However, of course, these are stimulation approaches. And as we show, as I showed you in the optogenetic studies and the chemogenetic studies, stimulation can increase pathology. So I think we're going to have to be careful how we approach neuromodulation 
uh, as a therapeutic approach. It may we need to do a lot more work looking at the frequency of the oscillations that are, are induced in these types of therapeutics to see whether we can get the um, the, the 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 good effect and not uh, have the bad effect of, of actually increasing or exacerbating pathology. Um, so those are just a few things to think about uh, going forwards. And I just want to thank my lab. I now have quite an established lab. I moved over in 2019, just in time for the pandemic, but my lab is now reasonably well established at uh, UCL uh, with Steph Fowler taking the lead on, on a lot of the um, tau spread studies uh, and uh, Abed Husiani and Gus um, uh, Rod Rodriguez at Columbia taking the lead on the Endeavour Lecture Physiology Studies. And I have a battery of collaborators, including uh, Dennis Chan now, um, and Julia Krupik and John O'Keefe uh, in, in the UK. So thank you very much. So it's a real pleasure to introduce Kay Igarishi. Um, Kay grew up in Greater Tokyo, obtained his PhD in the Kenzaki Mori Lab at University of Tokyo. Then he had the great privilege to move to Trondheim and work under the tutelage of Edvard and Maybrit Moser, who um, were awarded the Nobel Prize in 2014 for their discovery of grid cells. I'm sure it was great for Kay to be part of that lab at that time. Um, more recently and excitingly, as is is, um, recent, I think, as October 2021, Kay's lab, with Kay, head of that lab, published a nature paper, which he's going to talk about today. So it's a great privilege to introduce Kay and his findings. Thanks, thanks Steve, and thanks, Colin, for, for inviting me. Can you see the, the slide here? Yes. Yep. Okay. Uh, yeah, I was in the Mosul lab, but, but uh, um, interestingly, or unfortunately, I, I didn't work in in on on the grid cell at that time. But now now we are working on that. Um, but 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 here's my motivation for for Alzheimer's disease. Uh, my my grandmother was, was uh, had 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 that disease uh, for a long time. Uh, so she started uh, around 80. And at that time, she started her symptom with, with forgetting where she put her purse. It's so 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 she she put her purse randomly, and then she forgot that, and then started to tell people, you know, you you because because she couldn't find where she put she, she thinks she put put that purse, so she started to say, hey, you you stole my purse. So saying that to to you know family members and that was devastating, but but she you know at that time or, or right now we we don't know we don't have you know have any treatment uh, so far, so so she gradually lost her memory. Uh, so so here here is 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 her uh, when she was ninety. She she didn't recognize me or or you know her own. Uh, daughter, which is my mother, and then she 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 diseased uh, several years ago. But you know, we are memory researchers, and we couldn't do anything. So so that was my kind of a little bit of regret. So so that was uh, a motivation for me to start something for that. Um, you know, we we know we knew this uh, from twenty years ago. This is what I learned uh, when I was in graduate school. You know, there is a gene protein tau a beta, uh, and then that that is clean the cell in in the memory system, and then then that 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 leads to the uh, the you know um, memory impairment. But uh, you know, according to this concept, you know, there is a there is a um, you know immunotherapy agent uh, tested for a long time, but, but it's, it's, not, it's not successful so far. Um, and then, you know, what, what is wrong with our understanding? But we know that the, uh, you know, um, behavior is made of neuron activity. That's, that's what we've been known so far. You know, there's a level of, 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 the, of the brain system, gene protein, neuroglia, brain circuit. Uh, and 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 this specific circuit is 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 forming neuron activity, and then that is that is forming the behavior. That's what we already know. So so we thought that the uh, you know uh, we not we want to know the what is what is there for the impairments. Uh, what is what is the impairment of the brain circuit uh, that is that is directly causing the the memory uh, deficit in Alzheimer's disease. So, so we want to understand the brain circuit and the neuron activity 
that, that directly causes memory impairment in Alzheimer's disease. Uh, and then if you understand this, we may be able to use this knowledge to prevent the, the progression of the Alzheimer's disease. That, that's our hope, that's my hope. Uh, and interestingly, this, this portion is, is uh, not well understood so far uh, compared to the gene protein you know, cells clear. Uh, so, so there is a, uh, some, some you know, um, study needed. So instead of recording from human patients, you know, we, we can really stop the electrode uh, to, to record the uh, uh, um, spiking activity. We use uh, animal models to, to record action potentials. And then we, we test it, them in special um, memory because we know that the, uh, uh, the uh, um, internal cortex and hippocampus is, is involved in spatial memory. And, and we, we have accumulated this, this knowledge uh, very much for spatial memory, uh, especially in, in rodent models. And, and we also know that the uh, internal cortex is, is the most vulnerable area in the, uh, Alzheimer's, um, in the Alzheimer's disease, especially in the early phase of the Alzheimer's disease. Uh, so uh, this is the, the knowledge from healthy brain uh, study um, in rodents. Uh, there is a grid cell and there's a place cell. Uh, grid cell is in the uh, internal cortex, especially in the media part. And, and place cells are there in the uh, hippocampus, especially uh, CS3CO1 region. And, and, and we, we know that the, uh, the medial internal cortex is, is for, uh, feed forwarding the spatial information to CO1. And then, and then, and this, this information is, is making, up, making up the, uh, the, the activity of place cells there. Okay. Um, so, so we want to test that activity in, in animal model. And for that purpose, we chose uh, APP knocking mice. Uh, this is a relatively new model made by uh, Takami Seido in Japan. Um, um, so compared to the conventional transgenic mouse model, uh, uh, it, has, it has mutated APP gene in, in an endogenous locus of APP in, in, in mouse, mouse APP gene locus there. Uh, so, so we, we call it uh, local feed potential activity and an action potentials in, in APP knocking mice. Here's the, uh, the, what, what we already knew that time uh, when we started the APP uh, knocking mice study. So, so APP knocking mice here uh, have uh, a, uh, a beta accumulation at already at three months old. This is hippocampus, this is medial internal cortex. And you know, even in the internal cortex, there's, there's a little bit more. And then, and then the accumulation goes higher in 12 months old age of age here. So a beta deposition is like this. You know, it starts from, from three months old and then it accumulates already at 12 months old. And, and as I said, we are focusing on spatial memory loss because you know, uh, we, uh, my, my grandma had had that. And I, we already know that the, uh, the uh, almost 60% of patients have spatial memory loss uh, and, and the wandering symptom. So, so our overall hypothesis that the internal hippocampus spatial uh, memory activity should be affected there. We first tested the animal with the uh, uh, special uh, test memory test. So for that purpose, we used a, a, a um, contextual discrimination task. So there, there are two environments, A and B. Uh, there, there are some some difference in 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 the, in the color and the shape of these environments. So a healthy animal can can uh, distinguish to the, these two environments, but but AD animal they can they can really distinguish. So that's the, the basic concept. So so here, uh, APVM knocking mice cannot discriminate, whereas a wild type animal can discriminate to environments at 12 months old. But three months old, the young, in, at the younger age, uh, both uh, AD and, and, and healthy animal can, can discriminate. So, so uh, the, the spatial uh, memory impairment happens somewhere between three, three to five and, and 12 months old, somewhere around here, okay? Um, so we want to use, uh, test uh, the, what is happening around this young age and then 12 months of, of age. So our strategy is, is very straightforward. We want to test the, the brain circuit activity found, already found in, in healthy brain. And then we test that in, 
in a BB Nokia mice. We started from 12 months old. So we first tested, you know, uh, place activity. Uh, as I said, uh, if you put the animal uh, in in this uh, uh, type of environment, you, you're going to get the place activity. So here's the place activity in, in healthy animal and APP knocking mice at 12 months of age. Uh, we do see place activity in these animal, although the, uh, the, the, the shape of the, the place cell is a little bit dull, meaning that the, uh, the, 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 the specificity of the, the spatial coding is a little bit uh, weaker, but, but they do have place cells. So their place cells are overall fine. But we focus on this type of activity of place cells, uh, the, the, the activity called remapping. Um, so here's the explanation for remapping. Suppose you have two environments, A and B. Uh, suppose you have two rooms. So, so you, you put the animal first in room A and then, then in room B here. Okay, uh, and then you have multiple uh, place cells or you're recording from multiple pyramidal cells in the hippocampus. So here's one, one cell in room A. This is another cell in room B, right? so room A. Uh, uh, third cell, fourth cell, and so on. So you have a multi multitude of, of cells here for room A. And then if you move the animal into the next room, um, this cell stop firing. This cell start to fire in a different position. This cell start to fire here. This cell start to fire here. So that's the idea of the remapping. So when you move the animal to the, to the, the different room, a uh, whole set of uh, activity, whole set of place cells fire in a different position. That's the idea of the remapping. So this was found in Kubiel Miller uh, back in the old days. But, but interestingly, uh, so, and then people think in our field, in a healthy brain, we think we, we've been thinking that, that this, is, this is the activity to discriminate distinct environments because because for room a we have we have a set of these cells and this is like a, like a key code uh, of one two five eight for example and then for room b uh, we uh, this is like a key code seven three six four something like that um, so 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 we think that that these these activities are the key code for distinct environments and and we want to test that this activity because it is this, uh, this remapping activity haven't been tested uh, yet in AD mouse model. So we test that. Uh, so for that purpose, we use the, the linear track. Uh, uh, in, in linear track, this is healthy animal, uh, this cell fire here, and then in room B, uh, this a fire here, here, and then it go back to here for room A. So this is, there's a remapping. Nice remapping here. This cell fire here in room A, stop firing or a little bit fire here, and then go back to here. So another remapping, right? So so uh, uh, most of the place cell uh, show really nice remapping uh, in in healthy animals, but in APV knockin mice, in wild up, uh, in in AD mice, they do not remap very well. Uh, so so here's a firing for room A in room B. It fires in a really you know, overlapping manner. So you can't really discriminate between them. And then it, it was like that also, uh, again, in B, and then it goes back here. In, in another, for, for another, uh, this is another cell, this cell fire here for room A, this, uh, and, and here for room B, a little bit, room B, room A. This cell fire all in the same position. So cell cannot really discriminate to environments. So that's what we saw in APP Nokimus. So these data suggest that the disruptive remapping may cause spatial memory impairment because your, your uh, place cell cannot really tell which environment you're in, in when, when you get AD. So uh, that's what we saw for place cells. And we wanted to, to see the, uh, 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 um, the activity of grid cells in these animal because we already knew that the grid cells here uh, is feed forwarding spatial information. So this may this cell may be may have uh, some some deficit, and that was the case. So here's the, the grid cell activity in healthy animal. You see nice grid cell here, but we we didn't see any grid cell at all. Uh, in in 12 months old Alzheimer's disease mice. So so grid cells are all gone in 12 months of age. Okay. We only see like like a several, just several uh, grid cells. So MEC cells 
uh, there, there are no uh, grid cells, so we can't really call them grid cells anymore. The MEC cells cannot send special information to the hippocampus. Because of that, um, they lose the, uh, the, the, the function to remap. Uh, in, in healthy animal, uh, we, there's a report uh, showing that the, the grid cells also remap. They, it, it's, it's a shifting of the grid field. Uh, so, so some people call it realignment. Uh, and then that is supposed to, 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 to provide uh, uh, remapping uh, information to the, uh, the place cell. But because grid cells are like this in, in you know, they fire every, everywhere. Uh, so here's a, a, a grid cell, there's another grid cell, there's another grid cell. They can't really remap. Uh, this, in, in wild type animal, grid cell usually fire in, in multiple uh, uh, fields here and here, and then it shifts like this, shifts like here, and then go back in, in the place about in, in, in linear track A. And this is another firing, uh, it shifts, it shifts. But, but because grid cell in, in, in APP Nokimas, as I said, they fire everywhere because they, they already lost the, uh, the, the grid cell uh, um, property, they can't really remap. So uh, MEC cells cannot send remapping signal to the hippocampus. And then we wanted to, to see the activity of younger animal because younger animal didn't show a special memory impairment but, but we might see some something in younger animal. And as I said, there's no uh, spatial memory impairment. Uh, there is no uh, in, impairment for, for remapping. They do remap very well in, in younger animal. I mean, that's the, uh, the hippocampus place cells, but uh, the grid cell in the, the med media entron cortex, they already start to lose, uh, 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 so, so the MEC already start to lose the, uh, the grid cell activity. And then they they cannot really remap already. This is interesting uh, because you know animal still have uh, a good spatial memory, whereas, whereas grid cells start to, to lose its their activity, right? Uh, so so we think that that this is this is the the, the beginning of that pathogenesis. Uh, I mean the uh, the. Um, pathogenesis for for the uh, uh, neuronal activity. All right, in summary, hippocampus play cells showed impaired remapping for distinct environments. Uh, second, internal grid cell activity was lost and therefore cannot send remapping signals to the hippocampus. And third, grid cells started to be impaired in younger, younger age, uh, implying that the grid loss causes uh, remapping impairment. But this is just a speculation. We need to, to, to uh, prove that. So here's what we saw. Behavior was uh, behavior impairment start around 12 months of age. Uh, Aviator deposition start at, at three months of age. And um, this is uh, a remapping impairment of place cell. It, it, it matches with the spatial memory impairment, whereas the grid cell impairment starts already around three months of age. Okay. So we speculate. What, here's what we are speculating so far. Speculating so far, uh, we, we we speculate that the remapping impairment is is probably equivalent. I mean, the directly links to the spatial memory in in in, in mice, whereas uh, grid cell loss is 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 starting earlier. So so you know it starts gradually, and then, then once we reach to the, the to the level that is causing the remapping impairment, uh, then then th this this is uh, this is uh, causing uh, uh, the the spatial memory impairment. So, but but as I said, we we need direct causal experiment uh, like loss of function experiment or or gain of function experiment. All right. Uh, so what what our finding implies uh, imply for uh, uh, imply for for AD patient um, impairments of of circuit activity may start way earlier than memory impairment uh, at least in the entrainal cortex you know uh, this 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 stands for for grid cell activity here um, so that is that is gradually causing the the memory impairment so it may probably you know in 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 my grandma's 
brain, she she started to lose, she started to lose her, her grisel activity and then maybe remapping activity. Uh, and for, for the grisel activity, it, it, it was probably starting around the age of 60 or 70. Um, you know, so so if you go back to the uh, the the why why the uh, you know removal of, of a beta didn't work, you know, a beta uh, gradually accumulates, but it also gradually affected the, the brain activity, right? So and then we also know that the brain activity or brain circuit does not heal itself. So so when when this happens, it, it's already too late, and and there's no point in removing a beta. So from you know systems neuroscience view, uh, what, what, what I would think is that the, uh, we, we, we need to understand which brain circuit or brain activity get affected or get, get, uh, you know, get disrupted in, in, in AD. And, and we want to establish the therapeutic methods to, to protect these activity. That's, that's what we think and hopefully stop memory impairment. All right, uh, that's the the uh, the AD uh, recording. Uh, uh, and for future direction, uh, we want to to know uh, which cell type is causing grid cell impairment in the internal cortex because there are so many uh, cell types there. And then we want to to know if if the 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 protecting uh, protection of the grid cell it can protect uh, um, um, spatial memory. And we also want to know the mechanism associated memory impairments, because this is another uh, uh, division of memory impairment in AD patients. And because um, there's a little bit of time, you know, uh, place cell, I mean, grid cell is in the MEC, you know, uh, and then place cells here in C1, but there's another uh, portion of the, the internal cortex called, called lateral internal cortex or LAC. And, and we sh previously showed that, that the uh, LSC or lateral internal cortex is involved in associated memory. And we recently showed that, the, uh, that if we inhibit the activity, so this is the, the experiment in healthy animal, uh, okay? Um, it, it's, it's all done in healthy animal. Uh, if we inhibit the, the neuron activity of the LS, uh, lateral internal cortex, it affects the, uh, the associated memory. And, and we also know that, that there's a, a dopamine inputs in the internal cortex and dopamine inputs is helping the associated memory formation. So we, we want to test this, this type of activity uh, in AD mice as well. So here's a little bit of data we have so far. In the uh, internal cortex of, of uh, APP NOKI mice, a beta accumulation starts a little bit earlier than the MAC uh, at, at two months of age here. And we, we, we tested the animal with the associated memory and, and, and it, then and they, they couldn't really do the associated memory task already at, at five months of age. So, so we want to, to uh, look into this direction further. All right, thanks for attention. Uh, and, and, and I would like to thank, thank Takaomi for, for, for providing the, the APP Noki mice. And then we are looking for people. So, so if you're interested, please let me know. <clears throat> We're uh, <clears throat> delighted to be able to introduce um, Professor Andy Trevelyan of Newcastle University. Um, the, although the kind of title of uh, Neuroclin 2022 is dealing with dementia, um, the, the kind of uh, branding, if you like, of the concept of Neuroclin is to look at memory affecting uh, disorders. And of course that uh, includes uh, epilepsy. Um, so Professor Trevelyan started out actually a, as a medical doctor. So he's a clinically trained researcher and he's focused for many years on extending uh, our understanding of uh, epileptic activity. He was the first to visualize uh, a propagating ictal wave using um, calcium imaging um, and has published many papers on epileptic pathophysiology, including in uh, Nature Communications, Brain, uh, Journal of Neuroscience and Journal of Physiology, uh, among others. And his talk today is on Janus in the cortex, the two faces of cortical activity. So uh, over to you, Andy. Uh, hi, uh, so thank you ever so much for including me in this um, uh, very interesting uh, day's set of talks. Um, 
Uh, as uh, Colin just pointed out, I'm somewhat of an outlier, although I was very pleased to see that uh, uh, epilepsy patients are obviously the source of uh, intra, the only real source of intracranial unit recordings, and they popped up in a, a talk earlier. And the session is going to end later today with showing you how uh, epilepsy might impact on um, on spatial uh, um, representation, which is obviously a field that's much more closely to, uh, close to uh, Colin and uh, uh, Steve's heart. Um, I'm terribly conscious. I've just noticed that there's a clipping of, uh, of the slides. I hope that won't be a problem, but uh, we'll crack on. So, um, uh, yeah, I introduce, I, I want to start by sort of just introducing Janus, which is, uh, of course, uh, what uh, uh, the month January, the person, the god who January is named after, and he's the god of uh, beginnings and endings and transitions generally, and he's sort of represented uh, generally with um, uh, 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 as having two faces. And it seemed to me that uh, the particular interest I have is in brain state transitions and understanding how cortical activity is regulated. And, uh, and so what I wanted to try to do is um, sort of explain briefly how closely related epilepsy is to uh, normal physiological activity uh, to give you some sort of insights into why it is such a common condition. So uh, estimates uh, of around 75 million <clears throat> People worldwide have uh, active epilepsy, and that's actually probably something of an underestimate. And it uh, it is narrowly behind uh, dementia. But interestingly, we're now starting to find that some Alzheimer's um, uh, patients show uh, uh, activity patterns that are actually rather like uh, epileptic activity, and uh, and indeed. Uh, uh, certain dimension processes that uh, can uh, be a form of presentation for uh, certain kinds of epilepsy, or rather put that another way, um, uh, um, a focal um, cortical epilepsies uh, in uh, chronic uh, status epilepticus can present as a dementing process. Um, it's common, uh, about 600,000 people in the UK, and it can be a lifelong um, uh, condition. And it has significant comorbidity, including many issues surrounding memory and attention issues, uh, but also psychiatric comorbidity and uh, 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 many acute psychiatric events may indeed be epileptic uh, seizures. It's also uh, impactful because people do die of the condition. Um, but there's an awful lot we can actually learn about how the brain works from epilepsy. So it's a rather interesting uh, condition. But I thought I'd uh, also show in this sort of brief little primer about epilepsy for what I know is primarily a sort of uh, uh, a dementia's organ uh, audience is um, what it is we're, we're up against. So this is a video of a, uh, a woman. It'll come on in a minute. And she's having a very coherent talk with her carer at the start of this video. And then we see over the course of just a few seconds, a transformation into uh, this state, which, which um, actually looks completely terrible. Uh, if people have actually witnessed uh, seizures happening themselves, it's, it's an unpleasant thing to sit see, but the saving grace is that this uh, poor lady will have actually been unconscious for most of that time and will have no recollection at all of what's happened. Um, uh, and there are important sort of memory questions, obviously, uh, uh, related to that. But the key thing I really wanted to emphasize is the rapidity uh, from which she went from functioning normally 
to being in the grips of a seizure. And that, if you ask people with epilepsy, is the single biggest problem that they face. It's this kind of sword of Damocles that's hanging over them and the, the perpetual state that they just do not know when it's about to happen. So the um, issue of trying to predict seizures has really been something of a holy grail in the field for a very long time. And that's where we're going to go eventually with this talk. But the, the other thing I just wanted to flag up, uh, mainly as a sort of tempter, is that seizures can present in the most bizarre ways possible. And this, these are about the two most strange uh, case reports I, I found, where um, people have presented with unsolicited uh, orgasms that just happen spontaneously. Um, and uh, it, it sort of flags up that the symptoms actually reflect where the, the, the seizures start, typically. And that can often tell us uh, very interesting things about how the brain works. <clears throat> um, just bear in mind also that Epileptic seizures are about the most intense activation that ever occurs in the brain. And it, 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 the, the route by which they escape from that focus is, is obviously uh, of great um, uh, clinical re relevance, but it's also telling us something about how the brain functions. And I just sort of flag up this one um, uh, extract from this paper, that uh, the, the seizures, which are obviously being provoked by a form of oral uh, stimulation, have a, a preponderance uh, in uh, women. They're much more common in women than in men, which uh, the, the authors speculate might actually suggest that there's rather different uh, neural organizations between male and female uh, sexual functions in the brain. And I'll leave you to speculate about that. But really, just to kind of use these interesting examples to uh, illustrate how uh, epilepsy can still continue to give us insight into how the brain works. And so for the next little bit of the talk, I just wanted to uh, spend a bit of time uh, just sort of talking very briefly about what it is we know about how the cortical works. Because the cortex is very much where epilepsy uh, tends to be uh, centered. And the first point I wanted to make is that neural synchrony is absolutely fundamental. It's, it's both important and necessary uh, for cortical function. And if we contrast uh, the original paradigm of synaptic function, which is uh, described at the neuromuscular junction, where a single action potential produces a, a, an absolutely enormous postsynaptic event, with the state in cortical neurons where most synaptic events are of the order of a, a few hundred microvolts. So it, it's two orders of magnitude lower, lower than this almost. Um, we suddenly, we realize that you need many, many uh, neurons to be activated presynaptically, even to get activation of a postsynaptic cell. So you require synchronized activity, even to get activity flowing from one neuron to the next in cortical networks. Uh, the second uh, uh, relevant point to this is from this uh, well-known study from Wolf Singer's group, where they were able to identify in visual cortex um, pairs of cells. They, they went looking for pairs of cells which had partially overlapping receptive fields. And this allowed them to do an interesting experiment, which is to activate these two neurons at the same time, but by different means. So the first one is by a single bar which, activ which activates both receptor fields. And the second one is to use two different bars to activate the two fields separately, but at the same time. And when a single event, a single kind of uh, stimulus is activating both the neurons at the same time, they synchronize their activity. If the two neurons are activated to the same degree, but by two different stimuli, they don't synchronize their activity. And this has led to this idea that uh, the uh, um, uh, things, uh, when nerve cells are talking about the same things, they are bound together by co 
activation at uh, at, um, at millisecond level. So that was synchronization at uh, about 40 hertz. The third thing relevant to neural synchrony is that it is absolutely fundamental to associative learning. And we can see this both in, in whole animals uh, with the instance of Pavlov's dog, but also at single cell uh, level as well. And NMDA receptors are, are, are absolutely key to that, and that, that's going to crop up a bit later. Another feature of cortical activity is this tendency for neurons to go into a persistent state of activation, what's sometimes referred to as an up state. And this is thought to underlie short-term memory. And uh, finally, in this sort of mini synopsis of cortical function, one of the things that um, cortex does, and indeed our, our brains do remarkably well, is pattern completion. So we can see this triangle, even though Officially, it doesn't exist. There are no lines that draw that triangle. And furthermore, you can read this as you can uh, with all the misspelled texts that we get all the time, uh, that this is a talk about epilepsy. And there's some very interesting theoretical work that suggests that this form of pattern completion arises very neatly from the, the, the sort of typical arrangement of cortical networks, which is to be heavily recurrent. And what I mean by this is that neuron A activates neuron B, but then neuron B activates, sends a, a, an excitatory link back to neuron A and activates it. And this happens both at the neuronal level, but also at the network level. So you have primary visual cortex activating secondary visual cortex, but then secondary visual cortex activates uh, primary visual cortex as well. So if you start to put all this, uh, the, these different features, the, the fact that we've got synchronizing influence is, and, and synchronized activity is absolutely fundamental and neurons have this tendency for persistent activation and this is all embedded within a, a recurrently connected network, you start to realize that it's a very small step indeed for activity just to escalate out so that it, it, it uh, uh, incorporates all the neurons in the network, which is exactly what an epileptic seizure is. Uh, leading uh, me to sort of ask this question, whether epilepsy is the price we pay if we want our cortex to do the kind of functions that we want it to do. And I wrote about this uh, uh, in a, a, an article in TINS uh, about this. And uh, the work we've done since that I'm going to now go on to is going to sort of expand upon the, those ideas, uh, as, as you'll see. But just to sort of flag up that I'm not just sort of speculating here. This is a, a, a really remarkable, uh, if quite an old paper now from 1983, where uh, Richard Miles and Bob Wong had completely blocked all inhibition in a brain slice. And when they do that, they got these epileptic discharges that are occurring rhythmically every few seconds. And these involve every single neuron in the brain slice. And then they were recording from a single cell. And at a certain point, they started to stimulate this neuron uh, out of phase of the uh, of the rest of the network, and within three iterations of this, they have re-entrained the network to this single neuron, uh, which is a, a fascinating result in itself. But I want to sort of just belabor the key result, which is what is happening here now, is that the activation of one neuron is then escalating out to activate the entire network. And that is uh, uh, the, the sort of power of these recurrent networks. And that happens if you completely disinhibit the network. So it also flags up that inhibition is, is a, 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 a real controlling uh, uh, factor in all this. And if you read the literature, you won't read more than about two or three papers before coming across uh, this um, cheesy concept of the balance between inhibition and excitation. But in actual fact, that's not a brilliant metaphor because 
If any of you have actually tried to do anything like this, you will realize that actually maintaining yourself on a balance is extraordinarily uh, difficult. And a much better metaphor is actually uh, the metaphor of attractors, which have been borrowed from state physics. And uh, uh, illustrating this, just uh, uh, this concept will be familiar to many of you, but just in case it isn't, I, I wanted to sort of emphasize it with this little video where what we have is effectively a, an energy sink provided by gravity in this case, where the uh, cherry tomato ends up in the same point, whether or not you drop it here or here. So the systems converge to these uh, stable states from multiple sta starting points. Um, and this actually can achieve many, many different states within this, but with relatively little management, just a few kind of negative feedback uh, mechanisms, but you can get transitions into another uh, a, a attractor um, by pushing it over this energy divide. Um, and if any of you are sort of feeling uh, sort of remotely proud when your 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 latest paper gets a few citations, you could go back and usefully look at. Uh, uh, Hopfield's paper, which introduced these ideas from physics into uh, neurology, and just check on the latest citation. It was about 23,000 for this single paper alone the last time I looked. Just to now sort of put this in a neuronal context, um, the, the, the action potential is a sort of classic uh, example of an attractor where we have um, uh, uh, the resting state which is actually stabilized by lots of sort of uh, negative feedback uh, mechanisms. And this point here might be considered the balancing point, but it is the least stable point that you could actually hold a, a neuron. It is literally impossible to hold it at exactly this point because it either uh, drops back down to rest or it shoots back up to an action potential. And th these, this tipping point here is governed by the negative and positive feedback. And in this instance, the positive feedbacks are a depolarizing conductance that is activated by depolarization. Now, this is sort of neuroscience 101, but it's rarely described exactly like this. Sometimes it's termed regenerative uh, uh, conductances or active conductances, but this is at the heart of all action potentials. This is your positive feedback that it's depolarizing and it's activated by depolarization. And we'll come back to that in a bit. Networks are also governed by the same forces. And so it by kind of thinking about the network in a slightly different way in terms of tipping points rather than in terms of uh, uh, balances, it focuses our minds on what are the key forces and trying to identify these. And so dealing first with the negative uh, feedback, that is provided in large part by synaptic inhibition. And there are some rather interesting features of uh, the way synaptic and excitatory in uh, um, sorry uh, synaptic excitatory and inhibitory synapses are arranged in cortical networks which are very much balance in uh, uh, shifts the balance of power towards inhibition and this arises naturally from the these asymmetries so the first one is that uh, the excitatory uh, elements are uh, are projecting onto pyramidal cells onto the peripheral dendrites whereas they also have proximal inhibition but the interneurons are have a, a rather different pattern so there's also an asymmetry between interneurons and pyramidal cells and this arrangement tends to favor inhibitory activation over pyramidal activation if the network is hit very hard. And that happens just in front of the nictal wavefront. Another uh, asymmetry is that pyramidal cells tend to talk only to uh, cells. They talk predominantly to cells that are also interested in the same uh, uh, um, thing. So these are meant to represent uh, visual receptive fields. So pyramidal cells are operating in a kind of echo chamber, whereas interneurons tend to talk to everyone. And that uh, and these features tend to uh, allow in inhibition to escalate up very quickly when there is a sort of risk of the whole network getting out of hand. 
So the rest of the talk, I want to talk about uh, the transitions. And I will come back to this sort of idea of, uh, of control elements uh, right at the end and bring it all together. But the, the, the study I want to talk about uh, from here it started off as, as, as one study and ended up as something uh, rather different, but much, much more interesting. And the study was really to try to work out what is changing in the network in, in various acute models of epilepsy as it transitions from physiological activity into epileptic activity. And um, the key thing, you can induce this kind of activity in many, many different ways, in brain slices and in whole brains. Um, and the key feature is that the, the actual experimental induction tends to happen very quickly. The pharmacological effect, in this case with zero magnesium, uh, is happening within a, a minute or so. But the actual seizures start many tens of minutes later. And so the question was, what, uh, what is actually changing in the network at this moment? And the studies were started initially by uh, Neela and Riley. And what they did initially is that demonstrated that actually different cortical areas uh, progress at very different rates in different models. So this is a, a, a one induced by removing magnesium ions. But if you do it in a different way with using 4-aminopyridine, the hippocampal epileptic activity actually occurs ahead of the neocortical activity. So these two models uh, work in fundamentally different ways. And we set out to work out what uh, uh, things were changing using an optogenetic assay where we delivered a little stimulation. And when you do this, you can record the postsynaptic response, and it's very stable. So you can subtract the events from the baseline e event, and you, you, you are now just seeing the difference. And there is no difference for a le very long time until suddenly there is a complete transformation. And thereafter, it stays uh, um, at this transformed uh, postsynaptic effect. And that transformation happens just here. I've got a video uh, uh, that we've uh, made of this, and this is the amplitude and the area under the curve. And you see they're all identical until this moment here. Uh, and, uh, and so it goes on. And if I just sort of go back, so it, it just doesn't change and then suddenly bang. And that is when the seizure happens uh, a few seconds later. And you can uh, plot this in various ways and they all sort of coincide. There are a few events that are uh, much smaller, but these are all events that occur when the stimulation uh, happens during uh, an actual epileptic seizure. Furthermore, that transformation happens local to where the seizure starts. So it happens here in neocortex, and here in uh, hippocampus, even though the, the two tissues are exposed to exactly the same pharmacological manipulation. And so what we're seeing here is the time of the transformation and the time of the first seizure. And in every case, the transformation occurs above the line. This is the line of equality. And what this means is that it always occurs just ahead of the seizure. And this also occurs in various other models and also in vivo. So, uh, and finally, this is happening about 400 seconds ahead of when the, uh, the seizure uh, starts. So this is the line of best fit. It has a, a gradient of one and the, uh, 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 the distance above the, uh, the origin here represents how much warning this can give uh, uh, the person. And this is a usable length of time. This would be enough for somebody maybe to stop their car uh, uh, and uh, and do something proactive or get themselves in a safe I space. I think I just interrupt, can you like wind up in a couple of minutes? You're over time, I'm not sure if you realize. Oh, that. right, okay, sorry. So this all or nothing change basically told us immediately that it was um, an action potential, uh, and 
this is, a, a, um, and it, it suggested that we're taught dealing with the dendritic action potential, and we're able to show this with calcium imaging. But um, the dendritic action potentials also then are further amplified up by transforming the output of the cells, which then feed glutamate it back into uh, the, uh, the system. And then we've got two other positive feedback mechanisms. Just quickly, neuronal activity tends to raise extracellular potassium, which depolarizes the cell, which causes more neuronal activity. And that's a positive feedback mechanism. And you can plot out the same positive feedback influence for chloride as well. And these two are linked in an interesting way. And then these are the other two positive feedback mechanisms. So what we're dealing with here is a tipping point that has similarity with other transitions like the COVID thing. Uh, uh, that is a tipping point either side of this R value here. But this is a very gentle hill, whereas the epileptic transitions from one stable state to another state have to overcome a, a, a mountain that's a bit more like this Italian mountain, where there's a very, very steep side. And the steepness is because we've got multiple synergistic positive feedback mechanisms happening. And these are, uh, are, all, are all these, and these are all interacting together. And that creates the steepness of it, but it also explains why epileptic transitions occurred at an instant and with such sort of uh, precipitous nature. So just to sum up then, the transitions into epileptic brains are influenced strongly by these various positive and negative feedback mechanisms, and they give rise to these tipping points, and their precipitous nature occurs because there are multiple ones all tied together. And this stimulation is actually flagging up a change in dendritic excitability that is the network being in red alert. Uh, and these same mechanisms we think are almost certainly the same ones that are governing physiological um, attractors, which might be the kind of sudden aha moment when you suddenly get something. That's a kind of physiological attractor. And just to sort of flag up the people who've done this, Rob is really the person who has led this with Riley and Neela. Uh, Emily and Connie were also involved at different times. And this is the current lab with Faye, Darren, Connie, Laura. And, uh, and Rob. And the final thing is that we've, we're just about to advertise today, in fact, a set of post, uh, PhD places. There are six on offer and the deadline's uh, at the end of February. And do It's um, a great honor to introduce Paymangal Shani as our last speaker to close out New Recruit 2022. Um, professor Gal Shani is a professor of neurology at the John Maziotta Chair of Neurology at UCL. His work is focused on discovering how physiological and pathological plasticity drives neural dynamics during cognition. He has also developed new open source tools for miniaturized microscopy that are now in use for over 500 labs worldwide. Um, Professor Gal Shani has published many, many high impact papers, including Nature um, Methods, Recent Nature Neuroscience, Neuron, et cetera, et cetera. And without further ado, I'd love to hear you talk, Payman. Thank you so much. It's a great pleasure to uh, be here and to uh, present uh, to this great audience. Um, um, I am going to present some work on work we've done on uh, cognitive deficits in an epilepsy model. This is work done uh, mainly by Tristan Schumann in collaboration with Daniel Aroni, who built the miniaturized microscopes, uh, and Denise Kai, uh, who uh, was a major collaborator on the project. Um, uh, it was also a collaboration with my very good friends, Alcino Silva and Baljeet Kak, who together we've started this mi miniature microscopy open source project that this project benefited from. Um, so uh, temporal lobe epilepsy is one of the most frequent forms of epilepsy in adults. Uh, as uh, if you're I've seen people with temporal lobe epilepsy that can have both complex partial seizures, now I believe called focal discognitive seizures and generalized seizures. Um, 
the complex partial seizures, patients can simply stare, or they can have automatisms, they can uh, they can sort of wander around like a zombie, and these can they lose uh, consciousness. They usually don't have memory for the event, and then they, these can uh, evolve into sort of more classic generalized tonic-clonic seizures, grand mal seizures. Um, a significant proportion of these patients are refractory to medications. Uh, some are candidates for epilepsy surgery, but many, many uh, do not get it uh, who should um, and uh, who can, and can't get it. And what's, what's critical to understand is that it, this is not only a disorder of epilepsy, it's there's comorbidities, which are being increasingly recognized. One, one major comorbidity is cognitive disability, and that's the one we're going to focus on. Other comorbidities include depression. Um, so if you were to do a coronal MRI on a patient with, uh, with temporal lobe epilepsy, you may find uh, this uh, entity called hippocampal sclerosis. There, the hippocampus is shrunken and brighter on a T2 or a flare scan. Uh, and, and if you find that the seizures are really coming from that hippocampus or that temporal lobe, then chances of this patient benefiting from surgery are higher. Um, but what is happening within that shrunken hippocampus and not only there, but all the connected regions that are, are not really obvious by MRI, but are affected. Um, much work has found a great deal of reorganization. There's a great deal of interneuron death within the sclerotic hippocampus. Uh, uh, many somatostatin positive cells and PV positive cells, parvalvium positive cells die. Also, some excitatory cells die, including the mossy cells and the dentate gyrus, um, as well as other cell types. What's, what, what's more interesting to me is this, this cell death is accompanied by a great deal of network reorganization, meaning axonal sprouting. Uh, for example, the, mossy, uh, the dentate granule cells actually begin to innervate their neighbors, which they don't usually do, and this can give rise to these recurrent uh, circuits, which could be causing both cognitive deficits and seizures. Um, there's uh, a lot of work in the past um, that's tried to get at why these, these deficits exist. Uh, we tried to take a network approach to try to identify specific cell types and to follow their activity patterns in a temporal lobe epilepsy mouse. Uh, we, we started our work by looking at interneurons uh, and how they fire along with local field potential oscillations. I, I believe Kai, Kai talked about this in his um, uh, talk a bit, but uh, local field potential oscillations, you can think of them as synaptic input that cells are receiving. Uh, specific interneuron types phase locked to these oscillations. If you were to listen to them, for example, to the theta oscillation, where it's the most marked, you would you would hear these cells sort of chattering along to the theta oscillations. What's interesting, as many investigators have shown, is that different inner neurons will fire at different phases and with different magnitudes of phase locking. Um, we were interested how how temporal lobe epilepsy is altering this phase locking and how whether this altered interneuron activity could indirectly be affecting excitatory neuron firing patterns. Um, and finally, we uh, were interested in this sort of latent period. Uh, it's very well known that um, if there is a, an epileptogenic insult, sometimes weeks, months, even years can pass before cognitive deficits and epilepsy emerge. And we were interested in exploring some of our uh, findings in that kind of mindset. Uh, first, we wanted to, um, uh, we uh, confirmed some of the findings uh, that other people have made with this temporal lobe epilepsy model, the pilocarpine model. This is a muscarinic agonist that's injected into animals. The animals, this agonist will induce a status epilepticus or prolonged seizure which can, uh, which will last two hours or more. We stop the seizures with diazepam at two hours uh, and the animals will stop seizing, um, but eventually they start having spontaneous seizures, which 
uh, are brief, you know, much like the seizures in, in patients, but they can, they can last the lifetime of the animal. They, they, the mice can have seizures um, once, twice, even three times, uh, even within clusters. Um, but outside of the seizures, the, the mice show cognitive disability. And we showed this with the Morris water maze, which is a spatial memory task. And the, the mice actually did horribly on this, on the, you, you train animals to find a hidden platform and then you put them back in at different places on the maze. So they have to go and swim to the hidden platform. They do terribly. Um, uh, they basically just swim, swim at random uh, to, they don't know where the, it's sort of the equivalent of not being able to find your car in a parking lot after you park in a very, um, very crowded parking lot. Um, but if there's a if there's a visible platform, they find it just fine. So their vision's okay. It's just their spatial memory is poor. Uh, also, on acute alternation teammates tasks, they do uh, terribly as well. Um, uh, they they don't know which direction to turn to get the reward after a 15 second memory delay, which is both of these are hippocampal tasks. So it makes sense. Um, uh, we decided to look at inner neuron firing using a virtual reality apparatus. And uh, you may ask, well, why, why are we doing this? Um, it actually made recordings from the inner neurons much, much easier. Uh, so here animals are running down a virtual track, not a real track. Although later I will show you examples of recordings with the microscope made in animals moving along real tracks. But uh, for, for doing electrophysiological recordings, this made it quite easy that there's a very prominent theta and interneurons fire along with theta. When we did this with epileptic animals, we saw as other people and previously had seen that the magnitude of theta oscillations was, was greatly diminished, um, uh, especially as recorded in the Lacunosa molecular where it's maximal. Not only that, the coherence of the theta oscillation between it, its recording in the dentate gyrus and CA1 was greatly altered. This made us look to see how the different cell types within the dentate and CA1 fire along to theta oscillations. Uh, and so we recorded the theta oscillation within CA1, but we also recorded interneuron activity within the dentate or in CA1 and look to see how well these cells are phase locked. Now, the magnitude of oscillations of the CA1 interneurons was diminished. Uh, and as you may imagine, if, if the theta oscillations are themselves smaller in amplitude. But what was interesting was the data, the dentate gyrus interneuron phase lock firing, uh, even though uh, the magnitude of individual cells uh, phase locking to theta wasn't that much affected, these cells no longer fired on the sort of falling phase and trough of the oscillation that's recorded in CA1. They fired at all phases. So this sort of synchronization of interneuron firing across the hippocampus was, was disrupted. So um, uh, these are just sort of, uh, you know, there's many, many different types of interneurons and um, uh, maybe 20, 30 different types that are identified by their gene expression patterns and their action potential firing patterns, et cetera. It's, it's important to know that we didn't actually look at this, this distinction, uh, but we're just beginning to get at this and we haven't done it in epilepsy, but here we're using voltage indicators that are were made by Michael Lin's lab to look at interneurons and their firing uh, using optical methods. And here we're recording from PV positive cells in the hippocampus. And we can see their, not only their phase lock firing to intrinsic oscillations, but subthreshold activity patterns. So this is work to come in the future. Um, so how does this interneuron firing <clears throat> impact uh, the firing of excitatory cells? We decided to use uh, microscopy uh, one photon uh, miniature microscopy, or as it's now being referred to as a miniscope. Uh, over the last years, our lab has generated open source miniscopes that are now being used by, um, by over 500 labs. Uh, these are inexpensive. Uh, they uh, are quite powerful. You can record the activity patterns of cells, not only in head fixed animals, but in freely behaving animals. 
and uh, we've made multiple different types of these microscopes. You can actually, given that you, you get the lens close to the cells you're recording from, and with that you do some damage, uh, but you can record in multiple different brain regions uh, in freely behaving animals with calcium indicators. So this is a very powerful technique. Um, <clears throat> we decided to use this microscope in, um, in the temporal lobe epilepsy model, the pilocarpine model. So uh, we induced status epilepticus, waited six weeks. In this example, we video monitored the animals to make sure they have epilepsy and they all did. And then we implanted these cylindrical lenses over the hippocampus, uh, injected virus to express the calcium indicator and recorded the uh, recorded calcium activity in a large population of cells. And we can actually track the identity of each cell type across days. So we can actually say this, this particular cell that fired in this particular location, its firing has now remapped, et cetera. So it's a, it's a very powerful technique in that sense. You can't necessarily do that with electrophysiology that well. Another innovation that we introduced was the wire free or wireless scope. Uh, it's, it's advantageous not to have a wire. Um, it uh, allows you to be able to record in large environments without any restraint. Uh, these microscopes, which Daniel Aroni built and designed and tested. Um, by the way, Daniel is now uh, an assistant professor at UCLA. Tristan is an assistant professor at Mount Sinai and Denise as well. Um, the, wire, the wireless or wire free scope has a battery and it records the data onto a micro SD card on the head of the animal. We can do about 20 minutes of recording with these microscopes. Um, and the microscopes actually greatly allow us to uh, be able to record in freely behaving animals without problems, even in very large environments. So this, this is a 25 foot track, seven and a half meters for the metric, um, uh, in the metric system. And so you can see that we can record activity in large numbers of cells as the animals go back and forth. Uh, not only can we record activity, but uh, because of the spatially specific firing of these cells, we can track these activity patterns across days and then look, uh, use a decoder to determine, to sort of read the mind of the animal, look at the activity patterns. If the activity patterns of these cells are associated with specific places, then you should be able to figure out where the animal is by um, where these cells, uh, which cells are firing. And so this is a tool that can allow you to guess um, how much information is carried by the ensemble and how stable it is. And, and here you can see that the decoder does quite well knowing where this animal is. It jumps around a little bit, but it usually knows the direction and the location of the animal, it guesses it pretty well. I'll show you examples in the epileptic animal that this is not the case. So um, when we compared the pilocarpine animal and the control animal, we saw that uh, in the control animal, there were cells that um, fired in a specific direction and in a specific location. There were a lot of these cells. And just by looking at the activity of these very specific cells, you could, you could pretty much know where this animal is. In the pilocarpine animal, the epileptic animal, the cells that had um, spatially restricted firing rates, they're actually, they're, the firing was less stable. It was broader. And um, on some trials it fired, on some trials it didn't. Uh, there were fewer cells that you could actually call place cells. And now we, what we do is we measure the stability uh, of the firing of the cells by calculating a correlation coefficient across trials. We also measure um, an information content is basically how much information is there in the firing of a single cell as to where the animal is. And both these values are greatly diminished in the epileptic animal. Um, and if we use a criteria to separate place cells from non-place cells, there's far fewer place cells in the epileptic animal. Um, as demonstrated, these cells tile the entire um, track. Um, play, it's not obvious here, but the place cell firing in the epileptic animal is broader um, and there's fewer cells. Uh, if you then wanted to look at the stability of these cells over time, 
uh, and just took the same cells and recorded them again, 30 minutes, one hour, several hours, days. Uh, you could get an idea of how well these, these cells, how stable they are or how much they remap. In the control animals, you can clearly see that you you if you were to look at the representation and order the cells the same way they fired in the original time point, you if if the firing is 100% stable, you should see an identical um, identical graph. Now you don't see an identical graph, but you you can clearly see that they're the same spatial positions are represented, and you could probably guess where the animal was by looking at this activity 30 minutes later. In the epileptic animal, it's already much fuzzier, but as you go along to six hours, you can clearly see in the controls, you can see the, tr the trace, whereas in the epileptic, it's again gotten fuzzier and fuzzier. And as you go along to two days and then seven days, there's almost no, there's, there's really no evidence of where these cells are firing, whereas in the epileptic, whereas in the control animals, there's still a, a clear trace and, and you could probably decode where the animal was. And in fact, we did exactly that. Uh, we quantified the stability and it was much lower in the epileptic animal. And if we use decoders, uh, the decoders did quite worse in the epileptic animals to predict where the animal was. So the information is much less stable within specific days and also across days, as I will show later. You can see this is, jumping around when it's green, it's predicting the animal's running one direction. When it's red, it's another direction. So in the epileptic animal, it's switching colors a lot and it's not really tracing the, where the animal is. We can quantify this um, by quantifying the error of the decoders and the, deco the error is much higher in the epileptic animals. Now, one extremely interesting finding, which Tristan actually, Tristan, we submitted the paper, he accepted his faculty position, and then they asked us to do more experiments. So he did these in his own lab, and we put them in with the original paper, is that um, there's a dramatic difference between three and six weeks after epileptogenesis or the pilocarpine status epilepticus. At three weeks, the place cells are still stable, whereas at six weeks, the place cells have become highly unstable, and you can't really decode very well where the animal uh, is anymore. So there's something that happens between three and six weeks. We're trying to study that using uh, transcriptomics actually. And I don't have solid data to show, but just, just to tell you that that's what we're doing, comparing the trans transcripts across three and six weeks to try to see what, if anything specifically changes between those time points. Uh, a lot of things change. So we're trying to focus on specific cell types and specific changes. Uh, but one last thing is that we wanted to get at, well, what is causing this, um, this uh, place cell instability in the epileptic animal? We reached out to our colleagues, Yota Poirazi and Spiridon Chavlis, and they built a model. So one hypothesis is that this is all because of interneuron loss. We know there's interneuron loss in epilepsy. Uh, there, it's not a huge number of cells that are lost, but, uh, you know, maybe 25, 30%. Um, and uh, when they when they modeled this in a CA1 network where they they can actually look at specific cell types and decrease specific cell types, uh, reducing the number of somatostatin or PV cells in their model didn't really affect the information content or the stability. Um, uh, but desynchronizing the inputs, like I showed initially, greatly greatly diminished um, uh, both the information content and stability. Uh, in fact, you have to really reduce uh, the number of PV cells to almost 75 or 100 percent to get a loss of information content. But even this doesn't really impact the stability that, that you see. So it doesn't really make sense that this is all because of interneuron loss. Uh, we tried to model this with dreads by, um, by inhibiting PV or somatostatin cell uh, firing in vivo and then looking at the place cells, we didn't really get a change in stability or information content when we did that, even though we did see changes in the firing. So the dreads were working and we, we actually tested them in slices, they were working. So and it seems like there's more to it than just loss or dysfunction of interneurons. It's possible that there's other inputs that are coming in that are being desynchronized, for example, inputs from the entorhinal cortex that are critical for this. 
So I'll stop here. Um, I'll just conclude. There's far fewer place cells. There far the place cells are uh, place fields are much less stable. The decoding of locations degraded. Um, a loss of inhibition doesn't explain the change, but desynchronization of inputs may explain it. And these could all be markers for uh, the poor spatial cognition in these animals and maybe in humans. Um, and interventions to regain synchronization as Tristan is exploring in his own lab may actually be a way of uh, improving cognition. It's just, uh, this is our lab. Um, before the pandemic, life in LA is good. Uh, it's always sunny and beautiful. So come, come to Los Angeles and visit us. Um, I wanted to, uh, again, acknowledge all the postdoctoral fellows and students uh, who did the work and, uh, and uh, acknowledge my funding sources as well. The Brain Initiative has been very important for our developing of new technologies. Thank you so much. So our next speaker is Constance Sal Battencourt. She's a senior research fellow at UCL Queen Square Institute of Neurology. Um, she's currently funded by Alzheimer's Research UK and MSA Trust, which has given her that independence to set up her own lab. Before joining UCL, she Sal worked as a postdoc across laboratories in Portugal, Spain, and the Netherlands. She's interested in a deeper understanding of the epigenetic factors underlying neurodegenerative diseases including frontotemporal dementia, and she's going to discuss that now. So, Sal, thank you, and away we go. Hi, everyone. Uh, and first of all, I would like to thank uh, Stephen and, and Colin for the, the opportunity to present our work here. And uh, I will be um, talking about our work on epigenetics of frontotemporal dementia. I hope you can all see and hear me properly. Yeah, great. Great, thank you. So I'll start by um, briefly introducing the importance of epigenetics. As you all know, we have roughly the same DNA sequence in every cell of our body. Uh, however, there are different parts and different fates uh, through uh, dynamic gene expression. And this leads, for example, for... Um, leads to differentiation into very specialized cell types, such as uh, the cell types we find in the blood or in the brain, uh, in the case of the brain with neurons, uh, astrocytes, microglia, oligodendrocytes, and so on. So something is influencing this DNA sequence um, and um, allowing dynamic uh, gene expression. So here enters uh, epigenetics. So epigenetic factors under the influence of external factors, which could be um, the environment in which an individual is exposed to, or it could be the microenvironment of, uh, of a cell, will, um, will give additional instructions to this DNA sequence and uh, allow um, um, gene expression, uh, dynamic gene expression in a very regulated way. In terms of epigenetic factors, there are, for example, stone modifications, uh, such as stone methylation, stone acetylation, uh, or, or phosphorylation. There are DNA modifications, such as DNA methylation and DNA hydroxymethylation. And in a broader definition of epigenetics, we can also include here uh, non-coding uh, regulatory RNAs, such as long non-coding RNAs, or the little ones, the micro RNAs. But my talk will be focusing mostly, um, or will be talk, uh, focusing on uh, DNA methylation. So DNA methylation consists on um, a chemical, the addition of a chemical tag to the DNA without altering the sequence of the DNA. And this consists of the addition of a methyl group uh, to a, a citizen uh, in the DNA. Usually this happens in the context of a, a CG uh, uh, sequence uh, in the genome. 
And this will uh, lead to um, regulation of how genes are turned on and off and how much of these genes are expressed. The location of DNA methylation throughout the genome uh, matters. Um, there's still a lot that we don't know, but in a very simplistic way with what we know at the moment is that in general or uh, often when uh, the promoter of genes, promoter regions of genes are unmethylated, genes are active, are transcribed. When the promoter of genes is uh, fully methylated, then uh, genes are silenced. But of course, there can be intermediate uh, states uh, of methylation at the promoter regions or uh, methylation throughout uh, the gene bodies and in other more distant regulatory regions that will influence the way genes are expressed. So DNA methylation is a dynamic process and in terms of its relevance uh, to a disease, by understanding um, how changes in DNA methylation occur associated with disease, this can help us understanding the disease pathophysiology itself. Um, it can also be used as possible uh, biomarkers of disease or uh, disease progression, for example, or even has disease classifiers. Um, as an example, there are um, disease classifiers for brain tumors that are based on DNA methylation data. But because DNA methylation is a dynamic process and possibly uh, reversible, it makes it an attractive therapeutic target. So we need to do more to understand where DNA methylation changes are um, in relation to, um, to neurodegenerative diseases and, and dementia. Studies, um, Looking at DNA methylation in neurodegeneration and, and dementia are still at, at their infancy, but there has been an increasing number of studies showing that DNA methylation is playing a role in these diseases. However, very little is still known for frontal temporal lower degeneration or FTLD for short. Uh, and this is what I'll be talking about. As you probably know, uh, frontal temporal lower degeneration is, um, is the term describing the neuropathology of frontal temporal dementia, which is the second most common form of early onset uh, dementia. And FTLD is characterized by a very heterogeneous group of disorders. They are heterogeneous clinically, as we can see the clinical syndromes uh, here at the top of, um, of this uh, figure, uh, from behavioral variant frontal temporal dementia to frontal temporal dementia with uh, motor neuron disease, or even progressive supranuclear palsy. But pathologically, uh, FTLD is also heterogeneous and characterized by the accumulation of, uh, of different proteins in the brain, including uh, FTLD tau with the accumulation of tau. And we have heard uh, in previous talks about uh, tau and tauopathies. And uh, other proteins can also accumulate, such as TDP43 or FAS, for example. Genetically, they are also um, heterogeneous um, and several genes have been associated with uh, familial forms of FTLD, including uh, the MACT gene that encodes for tau or the C9 North 72, uh, a repeat expansion associated with FTLD TDP. I forgot to mention that even within um, the pathological subgroups, there are different subtypes. So this increases even more the heterogeneity uh, observed in these diseases. So I will divide my talk into parts. First, I'll be um, presenting our results on an epi 
genome-wide analysis um, of FTLD-associated DNA methylation changes in postmortem brain. And on the second part, I'll be talking about the analysis of DNA methylation age acceleration in FTLD as a, a possible candidate um, biomarker for um, disease subgroups. So for the first part of my talk, we have then conducted an epigenome-wide association study looking into FTLD TDP cases, um, including uh, type A, and in this case, carriers of the C9 or 72 repeat expansion, uh, but also cases of type C, and these were all sporadic, so no um, family history uh, or any known genetic factors associated with uh, these cases. And we have compared to um, uh, healthy controls. So we have looked into postmortem frontal cortex um, tissue and generated DNA methylation uh, profiles by using the Illumina EPIC arrays. These arrays will uh, cover over 850,000 methylation sites across the genome. We have then conducted um, a bioinformatics data analysis to identify differences between cases and controls. And, uh, and to make sense of the uh, list of genes that we obtained through these analyses. We have also compared our DNA methylation data with um, um, transcriptomics data and proteomics data available for uh, overlapping uh, cases. And I'll be presenting just preliminary results. So, from our epigenome-wide association study, although no um, methylation site reached uh, genome-wide uh, significance, it was very interesting to note that a gene, uh, the ARH-GAP35, that um, appeared in the top 10 most differentially methylated positions in FTLD. And this gene had been previously associated with the clinical subtypes of frontal temporal dementia in terms of um, genetic variants. Because some of the cases that we have included in this study were carriers of the C9 North repeat expansion, we wanted to look in particular to this uh, locus. And this figure uh, on the right is, is depicting the position of the, the repeat expansion in this intronic region of the gene. So um, here are represented all the DNA methylation positions um, that we have analyzed in the C972 locus and depicting here the position of the repeat expansion as it is here. And what we found was an increase in DNA methylation uh, up just upstream of the repeat expansion. So hypermethylation of this CPG island uh, next to the repeat expansion. And this hypermethylation in this locus was only observed in the carriers of the mutations, so the type A, but not the type C. So in the type C, we would, we would see everything flat uh, here in this plot. We have uh, looked into a second data set of carriers and non-carriers of the C9 of repeat expansion, and the same pattern uh, is observed. When we looked into the RNA-seq data, we found that, uh, that the subgroup that presented this hypermethylation had um, a lower expression of this gene. And this happened in the carriers of the mutation, but not in the non-carriers. So it seems that methylation at this site is uh, influencing uh, significantly um, the expression of the gene itself, and it may be influencing um, the expression of, of specific transcripts. 
we then went to um, perform a more powerful analysis. So instead of looking uh, at a gene at a time, we looked into comatillation networks to identify uh, signatures uh, associated with disease traits, including uh, FTLD, uh, TDP onset and disease duration. And we indeed found uh, a DNA methylation signature inversely associated with the disease onset. So this means that higher levels of methylation in the, in the sites that uh, compose the signature um, are associated with an earlier appearance of the disease. This same signature was also associated with the risk of the disease uh, itself at a nominal um, level. We looked into um, the genes that compose that signature and performed an enrichment analysis to identify molecular pathways uh, that are overrepresented in the signature. And we found important uh, brain-related um, pathways, including axon guidance, nervous system development, and uh, RNA metabolism, for example. We found another signature inversely correlated with the disease duration uh, meaning that uh, higher levels of methylation in this signature were associated with a shorter survival time. And in this signature, we found an enrichment for pathways, uh, in infection related pathways, as well as uh, gene expression transcription related pathways. When we overlaid the signatures with genes that had been previously associated with the, uh, with the risk of uh, diseases under the umbrella of FTLD, we found several genes uh, included in these signatures. And when we overlaid with the proteomics data, some of these genes uh, were found to uh, show changes at the protein level when comparing FTLD cases with controls. For the sake of time, I will not detail too much uh, here, but we found additional overlaps with uh, changes at uh, the RNA level as well. So for the second part of um, my talk, I will be um, mentioning uh, our work on DNA methylation uh, clocks uh, in FTLD. Although everyone uh, will age in the same way chronologically, um, there are several factors, including uh, different exposures uh, that an individual um, is exposed to uh, during their lifetime that will alter our biological age. Um, and this can be distorted in multiple ways, right? Um, and we can use DNA methylation as uh, a surrogate of of alterations in this biological age. And so several epigenetic clocks have been uh, developed, including the Horvath epigenetic clock. And so this one is a clock uh, designed for multiple tissues. So we have looked at uh, data sets, uh, FTLD uh, related data sets from whole uh, blood as well as uh, post-mortem brain tissue. And we have run uh, multiple uh, of these epigenetic clocks. The Horvath clock that I mentioned before, that was designed for multiple tissues, including blood uh, and brain. Uh, the Hanum clock is a, a blood specific clock. And then in the brain, we have used, in addition, the cortical clock, which is specific uh, to cortical uh, brain regions. For the whole blood, we have used a data set uh, composed of, um, of FTD, uh, PSP, a few AD uh, and control cases. And then uh, for the postmortem brain tissue, we have used a data set of PSP and controls and another one on FTLD, TDP and controls. Uh, actually the one I presented in the first part of this talk. And we have estimated the age acceleration has the, the difference between um, the DNA methylation age estimates uh, and uh, the chronological age itself, or by accounting for possible confounders. And I hope this becomes more clear uh, in the next couple of slides. So as expected, uh, 
we observed a um, very strong and significant correlation between the estimates for the DNA methylation age and the chronological age. However, this is not perfect, and this correlation is not perfect, and it is reflecting that distortion that um, I just mentioned um, previously. So in the blood data set, what we saw was um, a DNA methylation age acceleration difference uh, in PSP, so age acceleration in PSP, that, has, that was significantly different from uh, the controls and the FTD uh, cases. Even when we adjusted for possible confounders, such as um, different uh, cell composition in the blood or the chronological age itself, um, this difference was maintained. So more acceleration, age acceleration in PSP compared to all the other groups. We then decided to look into the brain uh, and into a PSP um, prefrontal cortex data set. Again, uh, a very strong correlation between DNA methylation age and chronological age. And we saw the same type of uh, significant differences between uh, PSP and controls. So, age acceleration in PSP compared to controls. When we adjusted for possible uh, confounders such as uh, neuronal proportions and um, the chronological age, although we lost the, the statistical significance, uh, the effect still goes in the same direction. And I'm presenting here in this case, just uh, the results for the cortical clock, but the Horvath clock uh, shows a similar results. For the FTLD-TDP uh, data sets, again, a very strong correlation between the ADM methylation age and chronological age. However, we found no significant differences uh, between the FTLD cases and controls. So just to summarize, um, we found DNA methylation changes in FTLD-associated uh, loci, including the C9R72 uh, locus, and, and the hypermethylation of the CPPG island just upstream of the repeat had been previously um, um, reported, and we have replicated that here. The importance of this finding is that if this influences um, gene expression in, in a transcript-specific way, this, this could be uh, important um, to, to uh, regulate transcripts that would be more toxic, for example. We found DNA comatulation signatures associated with disease traits, including onset and duration. And um, these shed light into biological processes that are altered in FTLD TDP. Regarding the second part of my talk, uh, we found in blood uh, DNA methylation age acceleration in PSP, but not in FTD. And in brain tissue, we found a trend for age acceleration in PSP um, in the same direction, uh, although with much smaller uh, effects in the brain compared to the blood. So these preliminary results um, suggest that DNA methylation age acceleration might be useful to distinguish between FTLD subgroups uh, using samples from a peripheral tissue such as uh, the blood. Uh, much more needs to be done in this front, but uh, these are exciting results. And overall, um, I hope I have shown you that uh, this data is in support of a role for DNA methylation in FTLD and is telling us uh, something about uh, the disease pathogenesis and might be uh, useful in multiple ways. Just to finish, I would like to thank uh, all my collaborators, uh, all the brain donors and their families as well as my funders, and I'm happy to take any questions. It's a great um, honour to have <clears throat> Professor Dame Louise Robinson. She's an academic GP 
and Professor of Primary Care and Aging at Newcastle University. He was actually the first GP to be awarded a prestigious NIHR professorship. And Professor Robinson also holds the first UK Regis Professorship in Aging. She leads a research program focused on improving quality of life in various stages of dementia. Um, and the title of Professor Robinson's talk will be Post-Diagnostic Dementia Care Could Do Better. Um, and with that, if you could share your slides, please, Louise. Uh, can you see that now, Steve, or not? Um, it, no, I think you need to maybe swap the screen. You can just, that's it. Yeah, perfect. Can you see it now? Yeah. That's good. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank yeah, you. I was about to say, now for something completely different. Yeah, absolutely. Can I just <laughs> say, um, any audience members that would like to raise the hand and actually come and ask their own question, by all means, do that at the end of Louise's talk. And we run over a little bit into the break. But that's not a problem. Okay, thanks, Louise. Okay, thank you. I'll see if I can pick up a bit of time for you. Uh, many of you will have seen this screen, I'm sure, many times at various Alzheimer's and dementia conferences um, taken from the World Alzheimer's Report several years back now. Um, but I think it's interesting to note um, that, uh, you know, the numbers of people predicted with dementia are still pretty much on track. Uh, and there was a paper in Lancet Public Health just the other week showing uh, that um, they're predicted to, to triple worldwide in, in the next 30 years. And interestingly for me, um, I, I think it's interesting to note that the biggest impact will actually be seen in, in lower middle income countries, where the majority of people with dementia live, and countries that actually uh, perhaps don't have health services as well structured or, or as equipped as ours. Uh, to deal uh, with caring for older people and especially those with dementia. I, I start on an international and a global level, even though what I'm going to tell you about is some work that's occurred in the UK, uh, because I'm, I'm being very interested to watch the trends, if you like, in, in, in shifting sands in, in dementia care over the last 15 or 20 years. Um, in, in our country, obviously, our first uh, national dementia care guidance uh, guidelines were introduced in, in 2006 by NICE, uh, and I was uh, privileged to be part of the NICE guidelines group that updated those uh, and, and subsequently released in, in 2018. <coughs> uh, and the shift is very different because way, way back uh, when, my, when our national dementia strategy was introduced uh, over a decade ago, I remember seeing headlines that said, you know, we needed a memory clinic in every town. If we had a memory clinic in every town, that would be dementia care sorted. Um, and yet, just a few years after that, in the World Alzheimer's Report of 2011, they were already beginning to share international concerns at how we were going to manage the rising number of people with dementia. And they commented on the role of primary care and how we should be starting to think about shifting dementia care into, into community and primary care, just as other illnesses, long-term illnesses like diabetes uh, and mental health disorders were being shifted. And then five years later in 2016, they actually came one step further and actually said the current specialist-led model that was uh, the norm, in, certainly in high-income countries, was unsustainable. Uh, and certainly would not be feasible or economically viable to be maintained with the rising numbers. Uh, and they were especially concerned at how lower middle income countries would cope. So it would be interesting to see uh, what the next, what this year's World Alzheimer's Report, which is uh, currently titled Post-Diagnostic Care, uh, what recommendations they make for how we should be taking this forward. But what I want to tell you about today is uh, some, a program of mine I've been leading uh, over the last four years, which really started um, when I read the Alzheimer's Society uh, annual report in 2015, looking at uh, dementia care in the UK. And I was concerned, well, more than concerned, to see that a survey they did showed that 40% of people with dementia uh, in the UK felt they didn't have access to uh, local services to help them cope uh, with living with their illness. Uh, and for me, six or seven years after a national dementia strategy had been released in England, that was particularly worrisome. So 
I took this as an opportunity to start doing some research. And it just so happened that it coincided uh, with an Alzheimer's Society call uh, for research into dementia care. The Alzheimer's Society were responding uh, to uh, or trying to respond to the call to increase uh, care to research into dementia. And the, and the UKRI had just funded their National Dementia Research Centre with something like 200 million that had been put into that. And Alzheimer's Society felt they wanted to mirror that and try and fund research into dementia care as opposed to the National Centre on looking for cause and magic treatments. So I was very fortunate to win one of these first centres uh, and uh, the programme grant that we, we started was on this very, on that very topic of how can healthcare systems actually shift, task shift, and task share dementia care in, into primary and community care models and how can they do it in, in the most efficient and integrated uh, and sustainable ways to maintain and meet the demands of, uh, of increasing numbers of people living with dementia. The four-year programme uh, followed a typical medical research council, uh, a guidance for developing and testing complex interventions. And we were starting off by uh, trying to synthesise all of the evidence, all of the international evidence uh, as, as to uh, what was happening on post-diagnostic dementia care, especially uh, models led or coordinated from a primary care perspective. We were then going to do some uh, very com complex qualitative work, looking at what, what how current care was delivered in England and Wales, uh, and trying to actually find out, uh, if you like, particularly look for models of good practice that we could learn lessons from. From those two uh, findings, from those two work streams, we were then going to try and develop our best practice model test it out in real world settings and with our colleagues from the London School of Economics, also do some health economics uh, evaluations and try uh, and work with the Alzheimer's Society to get our findings uh, moved into policy and practice. As with any Alzheimer's Society grant, uh, they very much wanted strong patient public involvement. Uh, and we came up with the novel idea of, uh, of actually not just having patient public involvement in this program, but having another important group that was service providers as well as service users in our, in our stakeholder group. And so we uh, incorporated something called the Dementia Care Community, uh, which we set up at the beginning of the program. Uh, and that incorporates uh, people with dementia, their family uh, carers, but also service providers, health and social care professionals, third sector service providers, who we've pulled together into um, a very, very pleasurable and efficient uh, PPI group. Uh, and uh, we may managed to maintain between about 75 and 80 participants in the dementia care community. And they have worked with us uh, and informed the development and delivery of the research uh, right from the first few months of, of the programme. So in theory, what is meant to be happening in post-diagnostic dementia care in England and Wales? Well, we started before the NICE guidance came out, but obviously it was very, very helpful to get the updated guidance in 2018, and I'll come to that in a minute. The NHS has guidance, various uh, documents on a dementia care pathway, telling service providers and commissioners uh, what we should be doing. In, within primary care, we have had for over a decade now dementia as one of our quality outcomes framework payment uh, areas. And we are meant to have a dementia register, maintain it and offer all our patients with dementia an annual review. There's not a huge amount of detail about how we do that, although within the last year or two, it has been requested that we do that face to face. But in terms of what we do and the content of that, there is no guidance. In terms of specialist care, uh, well, certainly in, in my area where I work in Newcastle, there's very, a very mixed package of responsibility. I can refer people to our old age psychiatry memory clinic uh, for diagnosis and subsequent follow up. I can also refer uh, very frail people with, with comorbidities to my geriatric cognitive assessment clinic, and they will do a much more holistic assessment of a person's physical and cognitive needs. 
but also any young onset dementias our neurology department will take. So there's a wide range of responsibility in terms of getting support from specialist services. In terms of uh, memory services, uh, there is uh, the Memory Services National Accreditation Programme, which outlines good practice as to what memory clinics should do, but this is not compulsory, uh, and certainly memory clinics are not meant to have it. In terms of NICE guidelines, the 2018 guidelines, uh, actually the committee spent over two years developing these because there was so much evidence to actually review, uh, and we were certainly uh, used uh, remarkably well from the one-year commitment we originally signed up, signed up to. This is just a summary of uh, some of the key areas that the NICE guidelines say that once a person has been given a diagnosis with dementia, these are some of the things that they should be given based on the current evidence. I highlight things like a named lead professional for them to access from the point of diagnosis, uh, drug interventions, uh, which are now we are now able to um, initiate and prescribe in primary care for formal diagnosis has been made in secondary care. Non-drug interventions, those that have a strong evidence base, like cognitive stimulation therapy and reminiscence, but also uh, moving on through the length of the uh, dementia care trajectory to ensuring good quality care at end of life, and also supporting family carers and ensuring that they receive support and education. However, the NHS Dementia Pathway, the various documents, um, really don't go into this level of detail. Uh, and certainly the ones that we've looked at tend to stop short of saying much more than ensuring that a care plan is put in place uh, every year after diagnosis. Memory Services Accreditation Programme has updated its guidelines, uh, and certainly they give very uh, give some information about what they think memory services should be provided. Uh, but again, there's not a huge amount of detail in that document. So that's in theory what should be happening uh, in England and Wales. So what did, we, what did we find? Well, my colleagues at University College London led the um, evidence synthesis packages, and we ended up doing three systematic reviews. The first was a traditional systematic review looking for uh, effectiveness and cost effectiveness data on uh, primary care coordinated or led models of post-diagnostic dementia care. We included 23 papers with five RCTs. Uh, there were no papers included from the UK. And we uh, were able to categorize the, uh, the interventions into four types of primary care uh, models. Those that were actually led from primary care, that those that, if you like, co-led uh, in collaboration with specialist care, those that were classed as case management, where there was uh, usually a specialist, usually a nurse specialist, uh, acting as an expert uh, in between primary and secondary care and facilitating shared care management, and uh, primary care-led and based memory clinics, which had secondary care specialist involvement. And from an effectiveness and cost effectiveness view, we found that the case management model was the most promising in terms of impact on outcomes, uh, not just for the person with dementia, but also for family carers and potentially for care costs. Although there was limited uh, evidence, I have to say, on cost effectiveness. The two other reviews we did, the uh, second one was a qualitative review, looking at factors that were facilitatory or inhibitory to implementing the dementia care in primary care settings. And we found that some of the key factors that were helpful were having dementia expertise actually based in primary care, so that uh, primary care teams, community care teams had more ready direct access to dementia expertise having strong networks and collaboration between all the key stakeholders, uh, that's primary and community and voluntary and specialist, and having leadership uh, from, if you like, from key providers. The third review uh, was a bit more complicated than I think we thought it, we intended it to be, and we wondered if we could learn lessons from other similar long-term conditions like Parkinson's uh, uh, and frailty in terms of managing uh, conditions in primary and community care. And one of the key things that we found from that was having uh, 
formal structured collaborations between the key stakeholders, for example, a shared care pathway or care plans that were regularly updated and, and, and informed by all stakeholders but was actually very relevant. So moving on, um, in terms of what was actually happening in, in England and Wales, we started off by undertaking an e-survey. We weren't expecting a huge response rates, um, uh, maybe around 40%. Uh, they were even lower than we thought. But what we did get actually is um, a very good geographical spread uh, of responders from around England and Wales even though I suspect the people who responded were probably those who were very positive uh, and very keen about dementia care. What we found from the survey was that there was a huge variation in, in what was provided around nationally, that the information services were largely focused on providing information, such as dementia navigators or dementia advisors, links to voluntary services, uh, and often these services were um, focused in the first year, first one to two years after diagnosis uh, and tended to, to, to peter out after that. There was also limited provision for uh, minority groups, such as young onset dementia and ethnic minorities. So we found uh, considerable inequality and instability uh, in the people who responded to our survey. At the same time, we uh, tried to seek interviews with service commissioners and providers, uh, even if they hadn't responded to the questionnaire. And we had more success with our qualitative work, uh, managing to have in-depth interviews with 61 commissioners and service providers uh, around the country. Uh, and again, found very similar, um, very similar findings with the considerable inequity uh, in provision. Um, so people in, in one area might get considerable access to services like CST, specialist nurses, and then five, 10 kilometres down the road, there was very little. Um, in addition to that, we found uh, fragmentation and fragility and service uh, funding sources for services were often maybe just for two years. Uh, and many um, responders were saying they were going to have to recommission or look at finding money for their resources once this current service had ended. From the primary care side, there was considerable concern that people felt they didn't have the knowledge or the expertise to be providing post-diagnostic dementia uh, care. And also, and this was pre-COVID, remember, concerns that whether, whether they actually had the capacity to do this and whether they would be supported by their specialist colleagues if they took on such services. From that qualitative study, we tried specifically to identify what we called good practice sites. So sites where either primary care was leading in providing a post-diagnostic dementia care or was heavily involved in the provision of post-diagnostic dementia care in that area. And these, uh, these, service, these services had been actually up and running for more than a couple of years. So they were sustainable. Uh, and, and seemed to be, uh, if you like, um, and seemed to be working well in terms of, of service users and providers. So we took six of these sites, uh, they were spread around the country again. One was an admiral nurse, a specialist nurse based in GP settings. Uh, second was GPs who trained uh, to have GP with specialist interest in dementia care, working in a, CG, a CCG to provide post-diagnostic dementia support. The third was an Alzheimer's Society led memory support worker service uh, working between secondary and primary care. And the other three uh, services were actually secondary care led, uh, but had very high involvement and integration with primary care and, and much more of a shared care pathway and clear lines of responsibility about who was doing what between primary and secondary care. We uh, interviewed uh, service managers, providers again, uh, patients uh, and carers, uh, and found that actually within these six models, there was no one perfect model that we could just, if you like, take and replicate in our feasibility and implementation studies. Uh, we mapped out all of the different components 
uh, of the pathways that they had for their, their post-diagnostic dementia care pathways, uh, who was involved, who did what, and what services were given. Uh, and then struggled a bit because we obviously had to create our own model. Uh, but actually, then things became clearer in that we found that there were, if you like, some there were core components of service provision that uh, many of these good practice models provided. None of them provided all of them, but uh, some of them actually provided, if you like, the bulk of these. And, and we could actually link up and map these uh, across, and there was quite considerable consistency in these core components. And these weren't just uh, nice recommended interventions like information provision uh, and providing uh, pharmacological and non-pharmacological interventions, there were things like uh, ensuring regular review and monitoring, uh, ensuring care planning, ensuring uh, integration between services. So very processed focused outcomes that obviously uh, nice guidelines don't tend to make recommendations on and there often is evidence for. We then mapped our, our core components that we found from our qualitative studies with NICE guidelines and came up uh, with the final core components. Uh, and this paper ho hopefully um, should be coming out. If, not, if, if it's out this week, then it should be coming out soon. We then had obviously uh, our systematic review findings. We had our qualitative uh, studies findings and we had to bring these together into an intervention. Uh, somewhat uh, miffed that we didn't have a ready-made intervention we could just uh, roll out but then we took our, our theory of our theory of change that we decided to use as our way of developing the intervention and together with our dementia care community and our core findings came up with the intervention that we are now testing out in practice. So the first thing to say is that it's not rocket science and for somebody who's worked in general practice for many decades now and has seen uh, shared care of many long-term illnesses like diabetes, like hypertension, like uh, depression and mental illness and cancer be shared and spread across primary care, the model that we've come up with is not that very different. But the one thing is, it's very much grounded in the evidence that we found. So. We will be taking our evidence from our systematic reviews, such as having a dementia clinical expert, highly likely to be a specialist nurse, and putting them in a case management role in primary care. We'll be working with primary care networks and trying to implement this, if you like, shared care pathway, which incorporates whatever nice recommendations are, but also our core components. And what we think is trying to deliver not just a task shifted model, but a task shared model that joins a primary and specialist care at once a diagnosis of dementia has been made. And our model is not just about ensuring that people with dementia and family carers get the necessary evidence-based care they require, but developing the formal systems, such as a shared care pathway, such as formal care planning, and trying to mentor and train generalists, the primary care teams, the GPs and nurses in the community, and support them with our dementia care expert to actually build up their levels of knowledge so that in the future, the majority of people with dementia will, the majority of the time, like in diabetic care, be cared for by primary care. I think I'm gonna skip these. But um, this just basically shows, if you like, this is the detail about, about what we're going to do. So in terms of developing systems, obviously to develop a shared care pathway, our clinical dementia expert with our primary care teams are going to map what current services are, are being delivered. Um, and they're going to try and set up their own dementia care pathway uh, and see if they can identify if like a named lead for each dementia care. So these next slides are really just showing some of the detail that the intervention uh, that we're now about to start delivering uh, will be doing, if you like, in terms of putting it into practice. Building capacity, a key area for us is to actually just do what has happened in, in primary care 
uh, in many areas, and that's develop, if you like, a lead GP or a, a practice dementia team. So we do so much now in primary care. We, we care for so many people and so many different illnesses because of the shift into community. That in many practices, GPs have, had, have developed, if you like, specialist interests. So part of the intervention would be trying to identify a lead GP or nurse, preferably a small team, within the practice to work directly with the dementia expert uh, in the community and try to deliver this model. So this is where we're currently up to. Uh, we've got ethics approval for our uh, feasibility and implementation studies back in September. Um, we're hoping to start next month. Uh, we had a few other, if you imagine, difficulties, including trying to recruit a dementia care expert into the intervention posts and trying to get support costs to deliver this. But this is where we're currently up to. We have recruited four PCNs, two in the northeast of England and two in London in the southeast. Uh, and we'll be starting, as I say, fairly soon. Our primary outcome measure uh, is very much service focused. Uh, and we had issues over this, and it might be interesting to see what people think, but we went with the completion of a care plan, a, a, a jointly developed and created care plan that the person with dementia uh, has, has uh, access to, uh, and then some more standard measures uh, in terms of uh, validated outcomes as our secondary measures. We've already worked very closely with the Alzheimer's Society, uh, and, and some of our findings were actually incorporated into their last policy document, uh, which was released in autumn last year. So where do we go to next? We're also currently working with um, Alistair Burns uh, and the NHS uh, dementia team at NHS England to see if we can incorporate our findings into the NHS England dementia care pathway documents. I'm particularly keen uh, working in general practice and seeing some of the uh, challenges that my commissioning colleagues have in terms of getting access or often no access to evidence to inform the services they commission to actually work in, in improving the commissioning guidance that's currently out there from the Department of Health and Social Care and getting our, our evidence and information into that. Um, when I, as a GP, looked at their last commissioning guidance, I found it, I have to say, the most baffling, confusing document I've ever read. And that's somebody who sat on a nice guidelines panel and is quite used to reviewing uh, very data heavy uh, and evidence based documents. It had over 40 hyperlinks to unique websites. Um, it was confusing and overwhelming. And the good practice guidelines it included, uh, if you like, examples of good practice were certainly not. Um, clearly outlined as to why they'd been chosen and there was little evidence base linked to them. So I'm hoping we can help influence that. I'm also hoping that we may uh, get some of our findings into the uh, World Alzheimer's Report this year, which is on post-diagnostic care. Uh, uh, and uh, as I say, as well as hope in influencing UK policy and practice, uh, I'm hoping that we can have a more international uh, reach as well. Uh, I'm told that there is going to be perhaps an updated national dementia strategy either this year or next. So it would be helpful if we could get our findings into that. But I think the key thing for me is that our programme has found that actually there are unacceptable inequalities in post-diagnostic dementia care in this country uh, an unacceptable postcode lottery, which I think has probably widened as a result of COVID. And we shouldn't be just looking at task shifting into primary and community care, but this is everyone's responsibility. And we should be looking at a task shared model where we have clearly allocated roles uh, that are appropriate to our skill needs. In terms of future research, we were lucky to get uh, midway through a Pride End programme. We were lucky to get additional funding in an international project funded by JPND, which is led by Australia, which was looking at post diagnostic care in five countries internationally Canada, Netherlands, Australia, uh, Poland, and the UK. Uh, and we've used our findings to influence that uh, and uh, development of a product, a uh, care planning tool called Forward with Dementia, which is uh, just about to be launched. 
do we need a randomized controlled trial? Uh, I suppose nice guidelines would tell us we do. Um, I have to say, as a GP who's seen the concept of social prescribing being rolled out in primary care over the last two years, and there's very little evidence for the effectiveness of social prescribing, but huge amounts of money have been put into primary care to roll this out as a service. Um, I'm a bit of a cynic when it comes to RCTs. Uh, and interesting, when I did a similar presentation to our dementia care community uh, up there, if you like their Christmas meeting just before Christmas, I was interested to hear one of the family carers say to me, RCT, we don't need an RCT, we need a revolution in dementia care, because it's totally unacceptable what we're currently living with, especially when people with cancer uh, get uh, access to sort of two week waits and very specialist treatment. So I leave you on that point uh, because I had to look up. I was then intrigued by the concept of a, a revolution and the French Revolution. And if you look at the, um, the, the, the phrase for a French Revolution, it was about liberty, equality and fraternity, which I think is very much what people with dementia in this country certainly need. Thank you. So we're delighted to have Professor Dawn Brooker, MBE, who is the director of the Association for Dementia Studies at the University of Worcester um, in the UK. She's internationally recognised a scholarship in practice development of person-centred care for people with dementia and in innovative therapeutic interventions. Her work on meeting centres won the outstanding contribution to the local community at the Times Higher Education Awards in 2019. She's been named among the top 100 lifesavers in working in UK universities, and she was awarded her MBE in 2021 for service, services to supporting those affected by dementia through research, education and policy advocacy. So it's really appropriate to talk today. And um, over to you, uh, Dawn. Thanks, Colin. And <clears throat> thanks, Louise and Steve, for inviting me today. Now, can you see my screen? Are we, is everything looking tickety boo? Yes, it's tickety looking great. That's, that's great. Okay. So I'm going to be talking about meeting centres uh, for people and families and communities affected by dementia. And it's very complimentary, I think, to um, the talk that Louise has just given. Um, this is very much about local communities coming together to try and address their local needs around people who are living with dementia at home. Um, so I'm going to give you an overview of uh, the research that we've done to date and give you a, a good idea, hopefully, about understanding what a meeting centre is. OK, so just to um, uh, sort of focus us down on what a meeting centre is generally, um, I've put this slide up, but I will be talking in more detail about some of the aspects on this slide shortly. So meeting centres um, started in the Netherlands um, way back in the early 2000s. And it, they came about as um, a survey that was carried out in Amsterdam with primary care, social workers, uh, people living with dementia and their families to say, what would you need in order to help you live longer at home with a reasonable quality of life in your community? So they started very much from that sort of community um, basis of, of, of trying to address people's, uh, what people themselves were saying that they would need. So in a nutshell, a meeting centre um, provides locally community-driven, ongoing, flexible, post-diagnostic person-centred support for people living with, their, living with dementia and their care partners. So we break that down a, a, a bit. When we say local, what the Dutch have discovered is a typical meeting centre would be able to look at, uh, would be able to support around 12,000 over the age of 65. So that's the sort of um, population basis to have a viable meeting centre. So think small market town. You know, that, that's, you wouldn't want a meeting centre covering any more than that. 
In Amsterdam, they have 11 meeting centres. In Milan, they have uh, 15. So you've got, um, if you're thinking big city, you're thinking areas within big cities, or you're thinking about a cluster of a rural community or a small market town. They are provided by the community themselves, and there is a very sort of clear structure for how you get community engagement and how um, uh, you, in, you, you bring people on board. So they're not provided by the NHS, they're not provided by social services, they're not provided by Age UK or Alzheimer's Society, or they could be provided by any of those, but in conjunction with other key players in that community. And I'll come back to that later. They're ongoing. So you go to a meeting centre for as long as you need to. It's not a time limited offer. Um, what you see in the uh, what you'd see in a meeting centre is typically a small club that meets three days a week in a local community building. Um, size wise, you're generally looking about 15 to 20 people. Um, so again, quite small. They are delivered in normal community buildings, rugby clubs, sports facilities, um, community halls, not in, never in care homes or hospitals or clinics. And they focus both on the needs of the person living with dementia and their care partner, uh, that usually spouse, partner or adult, uh, adult child. The Meeting Centre Club itself is provided by a small permanent team of staff. So typically you'd be looking at three members of staff, one centre manager who deals with the sort of in-reach and outreach, liaises with, with uh, local uh, providers and, and uh, movers and shakers, and two members of staff who primarily work with um, the, the people with dementia and family carers in the club and volunteers grows over time. And all of the focus of your meeting centre club is to try to address and help people and families cope with the challenges that having a, a diagnosis of dementia brings. Yeah. Okay. So, and as I said, there is a, a structured community planning phase that the Dutch have developed and that we've modified in the UK uh, to try and get those local um, movers and shakers engaged in supporting people living with dementia. So I'll come back to some of those points in, in a later slide, but just to give you an overview of uh, our timeline with meeting centres. And I think internationally, sort of when we're looking at care research, like any research, I guess, there's often a slow burn over time of different teams and different uh, people around the world adding more into that evidence base. Um, but as I said, I suppose my timeline was I was aware of this work going on in the Netherlands and thought it was a very interesting uh, community development. And what I particularly liked was that they described it as this combined approach. So it wasn't just something that was looking at the needs of people living with dementia or just something that was looking at the needs of family carers. It was, it was very much saying, you know, the diagnosis usually happens within the context of, of family. And I'm using that in its broadest term. And for both the person who's got the diagnosis and that person who's going to be doing long term support, both of them have needs. And they also have needs in their ongoing relationship and how they're going to uh, work together over time uh, to get best outcomes for both parties. And then in 2014, um, we got some JPND European funding to do the Meeting Den project. And that looked at taking this long evidence base from the Netherlands and seeing whether we could use that to implement meeting centres in the UK, in Italy and Poland. So it's like translational research from one care sector, one care country, 
uh, to three very different European countries. And as part of that meeting Zen project, we did a controlled trial of people um, experiencing meeting centres that we'd set up in those three countries compared to care as usual to see whether we could see the same results for people attending meeting centres in the different countries um, as they demonstrated in the Netherlands in their original uh, controlled trial research. Um, and also, of course, because we were taking that original Dutch material, we did a lot of um, looking at how that could work in the UK and how it could work in Italy and Poland, which are three very different um, care, uh, care cultures. So the, the upshot of that was, and I'll speak in a bit more detail about that later, I've got time. Basically, we replicated the findings. So compared to usual care, People attend, people like meeting centres. They're pretty straightforward to, to get going um, uh, in some respects. And uh, they improve quality of life, decrease carer burden and decrease the uh, amount of negative, those negative symptoms like agitation and, 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 and uh, difficult behaviours. And following the... Um, the end of the Meeting Den project, we developed two pilot meeting centres essentially to do our research in, um, in Droitwich Spa and Lempster, which are near my university. And we sustained through charitable funding those two, uh, two meeting centres. So it moved from being research funded into us developing a community interest company for each or, or each meeting centre so that they could raise their own funds. In 2018, we got funding from the National Lottery to try and develop an infrastructure for supporting meeting centre development across the UK. And this is trying to replicate what they've done in the Netherlands, where they have a fairly sort of light touch help desk, training, a uh, bit of community and learning and practice guidelines, um, but essentially to give that materials to communities to help them get going with it, with the thought that if we could get, if we could move beyond our two and maybe get 20 across the country, then you've got more hope of these replicating in other communities. And on the side of that, we've also got three other projects. Um, we've got a, a, an NIHR funded project, which is looking at how how you get these places to, to sustain longer term. So it's not just about getting them going, but what stops them closing after 12 months. We've also got a nice PhD studentship looking at social return on investment for communities for these sorts of projects. And Worcestershire County Council have put some funding in across the local authority area to, so it's half a million pounds over three years to give small startup grants to get a network of nine meeting centres across the county. Because remember, I'm saying meeting centres themselves are quite small, but if you've got a whole county network, you might have some economies of scale there. So those last three projects are, are ongoing. So small map now, this is where we were at the end of um, 2021. The red dots, are um, our potentials. The blue dots are demonstrated sites. So you'll see what, um, in terms of our blue dots, I don't know actually see whether you can see that on there, is a lot smaller. Um, but what I would say by next year, despite COVID and try doing meeting centre research during COVID, despite COVID, we think we're probably going to have around 50 meeting centres across the, the UK opening over the next 12 months. So we have managed to have a, a good snowball effect and know that, that this is a viable um, way of providing this community support. And also globally, because, you know, started in the Netherlands, the Dutch are great travellers. This, this is, so we've got meeting centre projects now going on in, in lots of different parts uh, of the world and particularly Italy and Poland, along with us, have uh, and, and Spain have uh, uh, developed their meeting centres. 
and there is a um, a European network which is quite active. So if you if you Google Meeting Den EU, you should get onto the sort of international site. And we've developed guidelines and videos and materials galore. And we also run um, a, a now an online um, training program for people that want to operate um, meeting centres within their local communities. So again, if you follow the links on our website, there is no shortage of hopefully reasonably accessible materials uh, around the different aspects of running uh, a meeting centre. So just to um, recap on, on what they are, just to make sure I've got most of my points, which I think I have. So we're mainly, look, this is mainly something in that post-diagnostic phase for people with mild to moderate dementia living at home. They're very inclusive and friendly, focused both on the person living with dementia and the family carer. Um, and that, that ethos of, um, you know, I remember the, the originator of Meeting Centre programme, Rosemary Drew, says, you know, if you get somebody referred to the Meeting Centre, your question is always, well, what do you bring? You know, what are your skills and talents? What can you contribute? And that question is the same, whether you're a, a member of staff, whether you're a person living with dementia or a family carer. So it's very much trying to develop that sort of mutual uh, support and reciprocity. It's underpinned by this um, model called an adaptation and coping model, which I'll talk about in a couple of slides. Usually social club, three days a week, um, regular and ongoing. And COVID has certainly taught us more about how to keep members socially connected, but physically distanced. In those places where you have a strong meeting centre, it was quite straightforward to go to um, to that sort of more remote uh, support. Um, because they're so local, often you'll, you'll get those sort of natural friendships and peer support groups happening anyway, because people find out that they their kids used to go to the same school or they used to work in the same place. So you get those naturally forming friendships that we know are often so challenging for people when they're living with dementia. You know, it's usually the social isolation uh, that, uh, that is so difficult for people. So very local, very accessible, no us and them, no lanyards, no um, no uniforms, you know, no food for them, no food for the, you know, and very much in that sort of um, very much sharing your refreshments, your food and uh, in an ordinary life setting. Supporting 60, 16 to 20 people per day. And of course, over the year, you've got many more supported, but at, at a day, that's how many you get. Some people would come three days a week. Some people might come once a month, depending on what their needs are. And you've got this model of ongoing collaboration between your local and community stakeholders, both in the planning and in the implementation stages. The activities that you do at the meeting centres are very much determined by the needs and aspirations, what people want to do, and everybody contributes in, in, in that way. I've talked about the staffing. You've also got that ability, you've got this as a vehicle for outreach into your local community. So if we're thinking about having, you know, your primary care specialist, they would be very much networked into what was going on at, at the meeting centre. And certainly Admiral Nurses, where they uh, uh, occur, have been very useful in that respect. And you've got a, a decent evidence base for the fact that they work. Adaptation and coping model. This is quite an old model um, based on work of, of Moose and Tao going back to the 1970s, um, looking at how people adjust to change or how they adapt and cope um, in any long term care condition. And what we've done in the meetings, what they've done in the meeting centres research is to develop what they think the adaptive tasks are at that post-diagnostic phase for both the person living with dementia and the family carer. 
And those fit into, you know, practical adjustment, understanding what dementia is and what it uh, what it will bring in the future and developing those relationships with care professionals and staff that are going to see you through that. What is often now a very long trajectory with your dementia, you know, 10, 15 years, maybe, because given that we've we are now diagnosing people a lot earlier. And then those emotional adjustments helping build people's confidence again, getting people back on an even keel emotionally, maintaining that and developing that positive self-image, learning to like yourself again with dementia, learning to like your husband or wife again with dementia, and also that whole dealing with an uncertain future, because although we know a lot more about what that trajectory with dementia might bring on a population basis, it's still very difficult to say to an individual that's newly diagnosed whether this is going to be fast or slow, what next year is going to look like, what three years is going to look like. And in fact, none of us know what the future is going to look like. You know, it's all an illusion that we uh, that we that we uh, carry around with ourselves, to keep ourselves sane. So I think one of the things that uh, that we learn very much from working with people living with dementia is you live in, you live now, you know, you do what's important right now uh, and have a good time now, you know? So it's, it's very much that ethos of, um, of that adjusting emotionally. And in order to adjust emotionally, um, having that strong social network and friends alongside you is, is important. And we know in dementia, That's often one of the things that starts to tail off when people have um, uh, start to have dementia, which um, is interfering with their everyday communication. And also socially recognising that most dementias are progressive and you're going to have to get used to talking about personal things that you never, ever thought you'd have to talk to anybody about. You know, so there is that sort of part of that social adjustment is about adjusting to talking about continence or finance or intimacy uh, to people who who might be able to to help. So evidence-based, as I said, the controlled trial replicated the the research results. People with dementia show an improved quality of life, particularly around self-esteem, happiness and feelings of belonging. Um, And this correlation between higher levels of attendance and the bigger decrease in neuropsychiatric symptoms within the meeting centre group as opposed to uh, treatment as usual. Um, And that level of satisfaction increases significantly over time. The longer people go, the more happy they become about going. And also for family caregivers, you know, you've got to 83% 83% there reporting they feel less burdened after three months of attending, but that increases further after the six months. So, again, it's this embedding in of those social networks that we think um, enables people to feel happier about what life is, is throwing at them. Um, ten minutes. Sorry, was that 10 minutes? Five minutes. Five minutes. I'm nearly there. Good focus group, uh, you know, linking that uh, to the um, uh, to the the, uh, the adaptation and coping model. We tried to do some uh, cost benefit analysis, and we had the um, uh, certainly the LSE were involved in that. But the trial, because it was across three countries, and because treatment as usual for this group is pretty low cost. Uh, was was the paper's now published, but I'm not sure it's it's absolutely the 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 best cost analysis that we could have done. I think we were giving our LSE colleagues a very uh, tough thing to to actually look at. But we have got, as I said, ongoing research, particularly looking at social return on investment of these sorts of groups and how that might play out at a local level. The local community planning, as I said, we've got a lot of information that um, that can guide you through this. So if you're thinking, oh, we could do one of these in our town, you know, download our guidebook (laughs) because that will 
help you get your community planning going, who your services aim at, aimed at, what your inclusion and exclusion criteria are, what the program consists of, where you're going to hold it, who you employ, how you manage that, how you fund it, um, and how you get cooperation between different stakeholders, and then how you get people to use the meeting centre. Our current knowledge is that once you get people through the door at a meeting centre, they love it. But Brits are very um, standoffish about joining any club, you know. So how you actually help people uh, get there is, is an important factor. And just to some related research here, we've actually done a nice paper that's just been published in BMJ Open looking at how we, what are the, it's a realist review of how you sustain community-based interventions of people affected by dementia. Um, and you've got the uh, reference there. And we've also, if you don't like reading academic papers, but you're into more user-friendly stuff, we've got uh, three very nice booklets there for people de developing community interventions, people with dementia and for family carers and for those involved in policy and commissioning. You've got a nice long list of references, which you'd need a magnifying glass to actually have a look at, but it will be there um, on the slides. Plenty of acknowledgements, particular thanks to Rosemary Drews, who was the Dutch researcher um, who led has, has led this work in the Netherlands and, and continues to uh, do internationally as well. And then you've got some links there to our website. If you Google meeting centres Worcester University or Worcester University Dementia, you'll get to us. Don't go through the university website because it will treat you like an 18-year-old undergraduate and you'll never find our research centre. But if you... If you Google what you're looking for in the research, you'll get there much more quickly. So that's me. Thank you. So next up, we've got Professor Claudia Cooper from University College London. Um, she's a professor of older people psychiatry at UC UCL Division of Psychiatry and is an honorary consultant or old age psychiatrist in Camden and Islington NHS Foundation Trust Memory Services. Professor Cooper leads the UCL Alzheimer's Society Centre of Excellence for Independence at Home and the NIHR ESRC Apple Tree Programme, investigating how lifestyle and behavioural change can prevent dementia. And indeed, that's what she's going to talk about during this um, COVID-19 pandemic. So over to you and welcome, Claudia. Hi, thank you so much. I'm just sending my husband a WhatsApp to say, please shut them up because I'm giving a talk because we've got a play date for eight children downstairs. <laughs> so hopefully the background noise will be decreasing shortly. Excellent. Um, so it's lovely to come and share this work in progress. Um, this has been really quite one of the most interesting things I think I've done in research. This is a programme um, that we started to look at how we could take people with mild cognitive impairment and subjective cognitive decline and do something related to lifestyle and well-being in order to reduce their risk of dementia. And I don't think it would have been nearly so interesting if it hadn't been for the arrival of the pandemic just as we were about to kick off. And the whole process of working with our PPI group to try and put this work into a group video call um, so that we could continue has, has really made it very interesting and something that we probably wouldn't have dared to do before the pandemic. So let me start by just, I, I think this is probably well known to this audience, but just to give you an idea of the sort of background to why we're doing this work. And it really comes from the increasing evidence from big data. The Lancet Commission put this together in terms of risk factors, and we've done various studies in big databases, making it quite clear that there are certain risk factors that predict dementia risk. 
Um, and these constellate really. You've got your metabolic risk factors around your cardiovascular risk, um, with obviously diabetes and diet and obesity and everything interlinked. And then there is this constellation of risk factors around um, well being, physical activity, and mental distress, hearing loss. Um, and then there's the clear evidence related to your cognitive reserve that actually, if you have more cognitive stimulating activity going on throughout your life, that also seems to be protective. And one of the values that we've really had to bear in mind in this research, however, is how you balance that positive message that there's something that you as an individual can do, that we can all do to change where we're at in our dementia risk, with avoiding a sense of sort of personal blame or responsibility or worry that you're sort of on a you know, collision course with dementia, which actually increases anxiety, which ironically could even increase your risk, couldn't it? Um, and it's important to consider that whilst there are individual risk factors, there are also societal risk factors. And actually, a lot of these things are related to the, the deprivation, um, the ethnicity, disadvantage, um, and things that generally across whole populations um, increase risk. And certainly a lot of the PPI feedback that we've had involved is how you work with people in a way that doesn't say to them, it's your fault that your risk of dementia is increased because you do these things and you need to stop doing them and something that really values um, strengths. So I started this work quite a long time um, ago. This is a picture when I worked for, well, I still work for Camden Memory Service, but there was a, a social worker working there, Anna Betts, pictured in the middle of the camera, who was very passionately interested in diet. And there was certainly a feeling, you know, every now and again, you work for an organization where there's a real desire for change, isn't there? And there's a passion for change. And this was a very strongly minded group who felt that we needed to do something differently. This was when we were really getting underway with the um, messages to um, diagnose early um, and consequently we were diagnosing dementia early and a knock-on effect of that of course is that you diagnose more mild cognitive impairment and subjective cognitive decline because the way that you're diagnosing early is you want people to seek help early and there was a feeling that we were giving the people these diagnoses of MCI and the like um, and saying come back if it gets worse and there was a real sense in the team that we were perhaps doing things in a way that was causing some harm, which really struck me to the core of the Hippocratic Oath of first do no harm. And I, I felt that I, I identified with that as well. So we set up these brain food groups to get everybody together and we made some manuals and we looked at all the things like meditation and Mediterranean diet and the like that had um, been found to increase, um, decrease your dementia risk. And this was sort of in a way became, as is often the way I find, you didn't really think of it as a pilot at the time, but it really became a pilot for the apple tree intervention, which is a large um, £5 million programme funded by the ESRC and NIHR, in which we're looking to develop and test this secondary intervention. Um, and this is us in our PPI co-production group. And what we did was we took, um, we did a big systematic review we talked to lots of stakeholders and did some qualitative work. And then we brought that together with the lived experience of clinicians and um, people with memory concerns to make our intervention, which we then um, piloted. Um, and the results of our systematic review, the thing about systematic reviews, and I think this was particularly true in this area, is that when it's about interventions, you are limited by the studies people have done. And we were very struck that the evidence coming out of this needed to be synthesized a little bit. Um, because otherwise, if you took it very literally, you could say something like, well, Tai Chi worked and dumbbell training worked and creative arts worked. But actually, what was very clear was that things worked in a certain culture at a particular time. Um, and so we tried to sort of look beyond the specifics and said, what is the form and the format of what seems to be helping people to maintain their cognition. 
Um, and it seemed pretty clear to us that really anything that was for less than four to six months, anything very brief, wasn't having a longer term impact on cognition. And that actually the things that were most effective, and this is sort of some, a message that's across the literature, is things that were multimodal. Um, that actually it was where you had some aerobic exercise, but you also had something creative. So you were getting the brain working in different ways. And that was a fairly clear message, um, which I think fits with the um, basis that dementia is a disorder with lots of different causes. It's complex. And the way that people respond to activities and lifestyle advice is very different. So you, in order to have an effect, it's always better to be working across different domains. So we put that evidence synthesis together with um, the results of our qualitative interviews, um, which did, in a way, it, it was very interesting to see in writing perhaps something that I'd sort of absorbed from various conversations over, over 10 years in a memory service, but there was definitely a feeling among patients that while some people found the diagnosis of mild cognitive impairment or subjective cognitive decline helpful, a far more common message was that it left them more confused. They came asking if they had dementia and they got they hadn't got dementia, but then they were sent away with this message that they would had got this other thing, which seemed to them to be a diagnosis, and yet it had no treatment. And people were very unclear whether it was a diagnosis or not. Um, and they weren't necessarily sure that there was anything much wrong with them. And they were told to come back if it gets worse. And, you know, there was a feeling that what is worse? Um, and I thought it was quite a helpful thing to sort of put in writing, actually. And it got quite good responses at the time um, from, from people that read it and, and shared that, that feeling. And so we put this together with lived experience to make our um, intervention, which is this is probably not the most user friendly um, slide, but this is how we conceptualized our intervention. Um, one of the things that, that the PPI were very clear about, which um, wasn't my starting point, actually, but was, was the finishing point, was that we don't have the word dementia anywhere in the intervention. That actually this isn't labeled dementia prevention, um, because it's actually very unclear on an individual basis what you can do for one person to personally decrease their dementia risk. So it felt more honest to talk about it as a cognitive well-being course, which is which is what we did. And we did most of our co-production before the pandemic, which is the top line. And we thought, well, we'll get everybody together in town halls in groups of about 10 to 12 people. And, you know, a bit like brain food, they can have some chats about um, different things that help to um, reduce dementia risk and then there'll be a nice tea break when they can get together and they can set some goals and the facilitators can circulate um, and then we'll share some food because that went really well in brain food and then we'll meet every every two weeks for that with two facilitators. So then the pandemic hit and we all came together as a group to talk what should we do now and the feeling was mixed about whether or not it would be okay to do it on Zoom as a video call. Um, the PPI group were more keen on this. I have to say the clinicians and the academics were a bit more wary, but we thought we had nothing to lose. So we thought we would do our pilot on Zoom. And so we changed it together. We said, okay, we're only going to have up to seven people in a video call Zoom group. We will have a third helper there to help people who haven't got online before to get online. And each of our sessions that was going to be two hours with a tea break, we will divide into two, one, two sessions, one which will be interactive, but it will have most of the information in. And then every other week, we'll have a tea break, which will be much more informal and people can make healthy snacks and drinks and bring them to the computer. And so we will still have that tea break. And rather than um, goal setting where people came the, the facilitators circulate and the facilitators will personally ring each person every two weeks to discuss their goals and instead of sharing food obviously people can make their own food but we'll give a, we'll do a one-off food delivery at the beginning with some healthy foods that are reflected in the diets and we instead of the cookery demonstrations we were going to do we have some very short um, zoom um, videos um, and so everybody now gets a manual. This is just a few pages from the manual. It's all sort of very interactive and attractively done. 
Um, they get a manual and a goal setting booklet delivered to their home. They get help to um, access the Zoom. If they don't have a computer, then we deliver a um, tablet, which is Wi-Fi enabled, so they don't have to have um, Wi-Fi access. Um, these are our the <laughs> these are my kids. Actually, they're the ones that have been making noise downstairs. Um, so we were going to do professionally produced videos of um, people making things, but it was hopeless in lockdown. And um, one day I thought, I'll just see how it works if I use the fact that my children are not at school because um, there's no school and we do them. And everybody thought they were quite entertaining. So I thought, well, they'll do for now. Anyway, a year later, and they're still being used because they're quite, I have to say, they're, the, the children walk across the table, put too much pepper in, but they make people laugh. Um, so we have these. We also have a, an alcohol about advice video that an expert did for us. And this is Michaela Popper, our program manager, who also joined in the um, Zoom videos. So people, they watch one of those only about three minutes each week. I did say to my son, oh, look, I got 163 views for the hummus video, but he did explain to me that that is not impressive. Apparently, he's got a thousand hits on a video of the loudest noise he could make. But there you go. We don't advertise them too widely because they're part of our intervention. Um, the um, participants also have access to a website, which is enjoyed by a minority. I have to say that on the, the average, 30, only 30% 30 in our pilot group had ever used Zoom before. So they aren't very technologically um, keen group in that front, front, but a minority used the um, website. And as part of the program, we had a hackathon where we got groups of UCL engineering students in to create an app to see if they could support people to um, keep this behavior change going through the use of an app. And they came up with all sorts of exotic things like people could get together, um, be paired up on the app and with somebody else, they could um, share some goals and they could aim to um, get a tree in their virtual orchard if they achieved their goals and so forth. I have to say the first, this isn't perhaps the crowning glory of this um, study. I think only a, a handful of people use this app, so they, they have relaunched it. But it, this was very much meant to be a sort of tentative part of it. So we had our pilot group in um, July to September 2020, um, and it was quite well attended. Um, so we sort of decided a priori that we would rate our attendance as the people, whether people come to the main groups that we have every two weeks, whether the key information is imparted. If people don't come, we also have facility for one of the facilitators for, to phone and do a bit of catch up with them as well. Um, and so we included, we reported the proportion of people that either came to the session or had a catch up. The tea breaks were attended by two thirds, but not quite as, as many. Um, and we didn't really do the, we did the pilot to see how it would run and whether people would find it acceptable and come. We didn't really look at specifically at our outcomes. Obviously, that's in the main trial, but the Mediterranean diet scores did change a bit. One of the participants um, did an interview with the Daily Express saying um, that the intervention had changed her life, which was extremely helpful for recruitment. Um, I have to say she was an absolute movement shaker before the intervention. So I'm not sure we can take the credit, but thank you very much for the interview. Um, and um, it did, I think we've got about 40 people um, join the intervention after reading that. Um, so that was very promising, our pilot. And um, we moved on to do the main trial, very much keeping the um, video call delivery, actually. We haven't done any face-to-face -face, um, groups. We have been able to introduce face-to-face -face baseline um, re research assessments, which has been really helpful in helping people that aren't um, savvy with computers to, to be set up online, to deliver the tablet and set it up so that they just have to press on. Um, and so that's been really helpful in, in our digital inclusion. But we have kept everybody on the video call because we had such good reports, really, of, of, of attendance and how it enabled people to um, come, for example, who have more mobility problems. So we're currently in the middle of recruiting for this trial and we recruit people who are aged above 60, who have some subjective cognitive impairment or objective cognitive impairment, but don't have dementia. Um, I can go over the inclusion details a little bit 
um, if you like. But in the interests of time, we basically do that as a baseline. And then it's 50-50 to the intervention and control. Um, and then they have interviews at one and two years. Um, we They do home blood testing kits and um, they measure their pulse and heart um, pulse with um, and steps with a Fitbit that we send out. And that's been going really well, actually, and almost everybody has been able to do a um, home blood sample and to give us that um, data. So we don't have results of the trial yet. We haven't even finished recruiting our baseline. Um, but this is just some um, pictures that people um, sent in who've been taking part in the intervention. Um, and for our uh, trial steering group, I asked the researchers to um you know, for their examples of what's gone well and for challenges, just to give the trial steering committee a bit of a flavour. Um, and I won't read them all out, but generally most of the things that people remarked upon were either to do with diet um, or to do with um, exercise. Um, the sending in of photos and sharing of things on screen became such a popular part that we actually are apply for some more money to do a visual ethnography of all the photos that people are sending in and to do some um, photo elicitation interviews and also some workshops with a professional photographer with some of our participants to develop some work. And we're going to have an exhibition um, of some of their work in, in September, really intended as a celebration of um, all the wonderful um, photos people have been sending in and their experiences of, of living with memory problems. And perhaps, um, you know, it's up to them what they do for that. It's a co-produced um, exhibition. But I think it's really what we want is, is a space for people living with memory problems to say what it means to them because it feels like a lot has been said about dementia prevention, about you need to correct your modifiable risk factors and it will go away. There's also some sociological papers written about how actually diagnosing memory impairments can make them like an illness in themselves. And I have sympathy with, with both of those positions um, as a old age psychiatrist in a memory clinic who also is interested in, in, in this research. But this is really meant as a, as, a, as a place to sort of ask the participants what their messages are. So this is where we are at. I think at time of writing, we're on, we're on about 325. So we're nearly halfway there with our recruitment. And we plan to finish by the end of this year, which means that the main study with two year follow up will finish by the end of 2024. The photos along the way, by the way, are all things that have been sent in by participants and donated to the study archive um, we have in, as part of our ethics people um, give permission for the photos to be um, displayed and they, they specify how they're happy for that to be done um, so this is just some very early data just about who's in the study um, um, which we um, looked at just to see whether we were meeting another one of our targets which is to recruit inclusively um, and certainly we're doing quite well at recruiting an ethnically diverse mix of people. We really thought about our strategy. I can say a bit more about that if you're interested in, in the questions, but I don't want to go on too long. But we've, we've really tried to be inclusive in our recruitment. Um, we're doing a little bit less well, I think, socio-demographically. You'll see that um, nearly three quarters of our population own their own homes, which isn't representative of the underlying um, population. And this is who's having our intervention so far. So the intervention is delivered by one researcher from UCL and one researcher from a third sector organisation with the idea that that will help us roll this out and see how it could actually be implemented cost effectively if it's, if it's effective. And so these are the various um, charities and organisations we've been working with. Um, so the sessions that I described are over the first six months. And as you can see, attendance is very good. It's 86 percent overall. And then after the main intervention, we invite people to come for monthly catch up groups if they like sort of tea breaks and reunions. Um, and we're doing uh, we're increasing in our performance on getting people to come to those, um, partly because of the research of feedback that actually we, we made it sound so voluntary to start with that people, I think, were thinking, oh, well, I won't, you know, I won't bother. We have, you know, I, I don't need that. And so we've sort of tried to change it to say that it actually is as important as the main intervention on the basis that obviously it's all voluntary. Um, but, you know, we hope that the, the catch up sessions will be an important part of maintaining change. Mm -hmm. 
this was just to remind me to mention the exhibition and the photo um, project. Um, and here are our publications. Um, and that's the team, actually, who've done all the work. Um, so I just definitely say thank you to them as well. So hopefully that's roughly in the time zone I was given, but um, all questions welcome. I'm delighted to introduce our next um, speaker, uh, Professor Anida Miyoshi from the University of East Anglia. Um, <clears throat> as she comments herself, um, Professor Miyoshi actually began as a uh, occupational therapist by background. Um, and then she did a PhD in applied cognitive psychology uh, where she worked um, with um, John Hodges and others, including on the Admirate Cognitive Examination. And she's done a lot of really fantastic world leading work on frontotemporal uh, dementia. Um, her research program in investigates the interactions of brain changes, disability and family context in dementia and motor neuron disease. Um, and uh, we're very delighted to um, have her talk to us today. Okay, so I'm going to be addressing as my background suggests functional disability. And that by that I mean really the loss of independence as which is inevitable for dementia, really. So first of all, just reminding ourselves why we need to address disability. And this is what the James Lind Alliance, and if you talk to any family, this is one of the key things that worries them most, that the people should stay at home for as long as possible. And one way to address that is by looking at activities of daily living. So we normally would have um, standardized measures to see how people are managing instrumental activities, so more community-based and complex activities of daily living, but also basic activities such as the ability to feed themselves independently, shower, et cetera. But why do we focus then? What's the idea of looking at uh, intrinsic and extrinsic? And that's because we, well, there's a very good body of research already, you know, and all the groups leading into understanding the neuropsychology of activities of daily living, for example, looking at the influence of executive dysfunction or memory or visual spatial function, etc. What we know less is what is else around the person. So, for example, by that I mean external factors not you know, inherent to the dementia process in the brain. So if you think of neuropsychological factors or behavior changes, those I inherit to dementia and hopefully one day we'll have enough drugs to treat. But if you think of extrinsic factors, then I'm referring here to the environment physically speaking, but also those around the person. So cognitive and behavior variables will be looking at the carer as well and the home itself. So by having the combination of intrinsic and extrinsic in the same piece of research, I hope we're going to be able to understand you know, the different um, levels of impact from different factors. And I'll explain that in a moment better. I'm going to present three studies, um, just the key messages of three studies. And this is quite fresh. It's a study that we finished recruiting for baseline in 2019 in the east of England, funded by the Alzheimer's Society. And we did a follow-up as well. So I'm going to be presenting the data of approximately 366 participants, but all of them are pairs. So it's always a person with dementia and a family member, uh, usually a family member. Sometimes it was a very close friend who was the um, carer. 62% came from Norfolk. So you can see it's a very east of England. This is because uh, the data collection was really done uh, at home. So our team traveled to everybody's homes. Most of the time they had to do two visits. It was quite an intense protocol. And we collected the data over these three years. Loads of trips, as you can imagine, to be able to see 183 families. The whole proposal that I have, the project itself, would be four work packages. But today I'm going to present the baseline, some of the analysis we've done, and also the follow-up. So I'm going to do work package one and three. There were hundreds of teacups, as you can imagine. The team has traveled a lot. So first of all, I'll give you a quick idea of the group demographics. So this is the 183 pairs. So most of the people with dementia had it were actually male, average age, as you expected, 79 years old, and they not very dissimilar between males and females in terms of age. The majority had Alzheimer's disease, and that was 
yeah, on purpose, we were trying to have a really the greatest proportion of Alzheimer's. I wish we had even a greater number, but as you know, it's real a recruitment. It, it's really hard getting around the whole region and being extra selective. So we end up also recruiting some other conditions, other diagnosis. The informal carers, the majority were female, as you'd imagine, um, as expected, internationally speaking, age-wise, very similar uh, in terms of males and females. And the majority were spouses, 85%. So this is very much in line with what you would find in other dementia studies. So first of all, we are going to look at the impact of the physical environment on activities of daily living. And this is not completely novel, but we wanted to explore in more detail the role of clutter. So this is work done by Julieta Camino. She's a PhD student finishing the work in, her, in my team now. And she's for this study, she assessed very thoroughly 65 pairs of those 183. And she had to limit the number because she was doing additional home visits and she was assessing everybody at home and in the research lab. And she was utilizing the UMPS, which is a very extensive standardized assessment of activities of daily living. So she did assess people during the activity as it occurred in a standardized manner. And to that, as you can imagine, she found that the clutter score between the home and the research lab was different, significantly different and much worse at home. Having said that, it wasn't marked. We just selected you know, a picture of one house, which was a little bit more cluttered than others. But to give an idea, there was no clutter in the research lab. We have a, a mini home here, which is um, an artificial home where we use for assessing and for training, etc. So the kitchen is very bland. You know, there's nothing to confuse. It's very straightforward. And the ability to perform ADLs, though, was also different between the two settings, but people did better at home, not in the lab, despite being uncluttered and very easy to find, everything is accessible, um, performance was still better. Better, but it's important to bear in mind that people still perform below you know, what was expected for their age because they have dementia, but between you know, settings, people were performing better at home. How about the main stage there? So we decided to look at this group because we did expect something with the clutter would make a difference. The environment should make a difference, clinically speaking. So that's why we wanted to then look if there's anything to do with this stage, perhaps. So then what Julieta did here, she broke down the group in between mild, modern, severe stage. I'm not going to present the mild because the group was very small, the majority of patients, participants, apologies, they were in the moderate and severe stages. So the moderate stage was performing better at home, significantly better. And in the severe stage, there was really no difference between the two settings. So this is already telling us, well, suggesting that the environment really didn't make a difference for the performance of those in the severe stage. But interestingly enough, the moderate people in the modern stage did still better at home. So there was something else going on with the environment that is not to do with the clutter. So then we decided to change gear and look at the combination of intrinsic and extrinsic factors in the same equation. And for these, we are going to change the ADL assessment. And first of all, I need to tell you a bit about care management styles. So what we decided to add from the carer's perspective here was the way that approach activities of daily living and management of dementia in general. So, for example, how they uh, address dementia problems, how they deal with anything related to dementia. So their questions are divided in a questionnaire. And you have three different styles. Uh, you can identify if the carer has more of a criticism approach an encouragement approach or an active management approach. And what we assess in that is that the criticism, the carers questions are such as, they may try to rationalize with the person and try to explain things to the person and try to correct them as they manage daily issues in dementia. The encouragement approach, as you can imagine, the person, the carer is always encouraging the person with dementia to do things by themselves. So it is a much more uh, perhaps enabling. They, they, they wait for the person or they encourage them to do it. They don't want to, to do for them. And the activity management, the active management is more of a mixed because they're trying to preempt issues. So they may, for example, divert if there's a crisis coming, they notice so they change, they adapt very quickly and they try to overcome things before they happen. 
So in this case now, because we change activities of daily living assessment, because for these, uh, for the power of the analysis, we went for the other activities of daily living, which is called uh, DAD, the disability assessment for dementia. You may be familiar. Many drug trials these days use. Um, it's still, again, measuring ADLs as instrumental and basic. But for that, we had a greater number of participants for this analysis. So in this study, Julieta Camino was putting together both intrinsic and extrinsic factors. So the care encouragement styles, so with the different ways of dealing with dementia problems, but also a score of apathy and global cognition via the ACE. So what she found in this regression was that the only factors to explain the variance on the DAD, the ADL performance, uh, were encouragement of the carer, criticism of the carer, apathy and global cognition. So active management did not enter the model. And the important message here is that for every point the person had on the ACE, that improved the ADL score by 4%. And for every point on the encouragement for the, from the carer perspective, also improved the ADL by 4%. So the cognition and the encouragement style were contributing the same proportion of improvement for the ADL function. So how about 12 months later? So what we want to do was then try to understand the, the same factors looking at a 12-month follow-up. So in this work, Vizak was then looking at a starting point of 141 carers who had all the variables, um, all the data collected. But as you can imagine, as most of our participants were in the moderate and severe stages, the, the attrition rate was quite high. So we lost about 50% of the carers, a bit more than 50%. So we had uh, in total 60 who really could stay for the whole analysis. So in this case, now Vizak looked at the change in the DAD between base and baseline and follow-up and the same variables. In addition, we also want to add comorbidity simply because this population you know, was average 79. Um, they were a bit older for some of them. The average, average of follow-up was 12 months, but also there were delays due to the pandemic, as you can imagine. So we try to use then these factors and look whether that would explain the change in ADL score and no variable could predict the decline. So we couldn't look at any other proxy factor for ADL change. And then we thought this is a bit odd, isn't it? Because something should be explaining the decline. And then we thought, well, how about focusing on the variables who ch which changed? Because not all variables necessarily change. So Vizak went back to the same variables and looked if they change from baseline and follow up. And just a few of them changed, which was interesting. So um, criticism changed, increased over time, but the other two types of care engagement, such as encouragement and activity, active engagement did not change, they were quite stable. So then he ran the same analysis again, just focusing using the changing score of these variables and the change of the DAD. So the only variable that explains some of 20%, which is very low, of the change of ADL scores cognition. So reflecting on that, on the cross-sectional study, which I presented a few minutes ago, and this, we were thinking, what is happening here? And one of the potential um, explanations is that the care management style is sufficient to support ADL function. If you look at the present moment, how is the care managing that? ADL function of the patient, the participant, how much support they're giving, which type of support they're giving. But if you look at a decline where you know, the disease is progressing, that is not you know, going to play a role in doing any, uh, well, cannot stop really the progression or contribute to the necessarily at least at 12 months. So the summary of the three studies, just the key messages of these three studies, of course, it's a bit longer than that, but just to give you the highlights, the idea of removing clutter from an environment may not necessarily explain um, the participation activity. So what we are thinking is that if you want to support people with the environment to ensure that they engage in activities safely, we need to make sure the cues are much more salient. I think we're just removing clutter or traditionally many professionals will label things, for example, try to make them visible, they may, that may not be sufficient, at least for the severe stages. For the mild stages, we didn't have enough power to look at, at that. So we are not very sure yet how to best address because we didn't have enough participants to look into that carefully. In relation to uh, the role of care encouragement and global cognition decline, both contributing to ADL function, 
I think for me, the main key message and the most exciting finding so far from this project is that, you know, a carer can do the, as much to support a person with dementia as much as one point in the score of a cognitive assessment that we, you know, commonly use in many clinics, in many research studies. And if you think of, you know, targeting therapies in most of the drug trials, target improvement in global cognition, and I, it makes me wonder you know, if you would have the same type of investment of, you know, getting carers to be fully equipped and skilled at supporting somebody with dementia, how much would get out of this? But we're not at that level of investment yet. The changes in the ADL scores over 12 months, not surprisingly, not very exciting, was driven really by declining cognition, but it was very low explanation, really. The, the variance was very low, only 20%. So it makes us think, which other factors should be really thinking? Or is it because we use a global measure of cognition, perhaps that's too you know, insensitive, but it's really thinking, you know, clinically speaking, which other factors could we consider and better uh, investigate the decline over 12 months? Now, the whole uh, purpose of this study is really for task is understanding the baseline, the follow-up changes, and we have another work package, which I'm not presenting today in relation to more uh, in-depth understand of assessments. But the, what we're really aiming for is combining the findings that all of those studies at the moment, or the work package one, two, and three, to contribute to the content of auto, which is a novel intervention that we are developing at the moment. And it's going to be a hybrid uh, non-pharmacological psychoeducational intervention to support people with dementia living at home, targeting both the pair, the person with dementia and the carer. And it's going to be hybrid in the sense that it will be uh, several online modules. We're trying to make it lockdown and pandemic proof. And that's it. Just to thank everybody for all the support and all the teams that have supported this. Apologies again for the tech issues. Brilliant. Thanks, Anita. Thanks for coming back to finish it off.